Summer nights in Powell County were once the spice of life to me. The impenetrable woods upon the hills are rustled by soft breezes. The humid heat of the throttling sun dies away behind distant ridges, and lightning bugs waft like living glitter above lonely fields and meadows. Peaceful as the region is in the light of the day, sunset and the moon which follows lended a mystique and tranquility that I'd wager most outsiders would believe possible only in the verses of poets and the brushstrokes of surrealists. It's just such a night now, as I set these words down to clear my thoughts. The whippoorwills call in the valley which sprawls behind my house, and the distant yipping of coyotes is borne aloft on the midnight breeze. And yet, I cannot make myself climb in the car and drive the back roads watching the fireflies upon empty pastures, or carry a drink to the pond which glimmers at my woodline and sit in peace beneath the stars. Clear as the crystalline sky might be, and wholesome as the wind upon the leaves might sound, I am troubled by something which happened a few short years ago on a night exactly like this one. That something has robbed me of the small joys of this season, and indeed of any season in these hills where the trees grow close together, and the ridges cluster like conspirators to blot out the views of visitors in the veils. That is, in part, why I'm about to tell the things I'm about to tell. I cannot impart them to anyone else. No soul would do much save laugh me off if I did, and people who wouldn't are generally a few stones short of a chimney in my experience. Thus, I'll take solace in relating them to myself, the one man in whom I can confide. It's my hope that, in time, the repetition of what I believe I saw a few years back will dull the fear lurking in my memory, and I'll once again recapture the love and fascination I once held for my homeland in the hills. I lived all my life here up till then with a native's ease and comfort, and I have no desire to let shadow and ghoulish imagination steal that comfort away from me. Several summers ago, I was contacted by Jake Stetter, the owner of a large tract of nearly a thousand acres in the remote northeastern corner of Powell County. He runs a small bed-and-breakfast-style resort on the land, marketing to vacationers visiting Red River Gorge and Natural Bridge a few minutes away on the eastern edge of the county. Along with his cabins and home-style restaurant, Jake allows hunting and riding along the trails he's cut around the edges of his property, offering a small haven for visitors who wish to pursue activities they can't in the parks themselves. The core of his land is steep, rocky, and rugged, and while he hasn't ever forbidden his guests from traipsing up there, he'd never, until recently, troubled himself with cutting pads and carving deer blinds out from the ancient woods up there. Desiring to give his resort a bit of extra pull by establishing a private fishing spot amidst the scenic low-slung mountains there, Jake planned to dam a steady mountain stream which bubbled up from a spring in the heights. This would flood the lowest reaches of a single valley and establish a large, deep pond which he could fill with catfish and other local fauna. This, in turn, would draw more visitors to his resort with fishing lines in tow ready to unwind on the sheltered banks with beers in hand, far away from the prying eyes of rangers or wardens. Apparently, while scouting out the location, he had stumbled upon a cluster of a dozen or so old stone foundations in the brush. Knowing me as a friend of a friend, and being aware of my interest in the region's history, Jake reached out to offer me a chance at looking the site over and digging around a bit while the place was still above water. Jake, like anyone of a certain age in the area, was familiar with the half-remembered legend of Hatfield, a tiny hamlet which supposedly predated the county seat of Stanton by nearly a century, and speculated that he might have found its lost ruins. Hatfield had, as the legends go, been abandoned under strange circumstances in the late 1800s, People had gone missing, crops had failed, livestock had been killed, 
the usual hocus-pocus of ghost town legendry. With yields poor and the population nervous, the few families in Hatfield had supposedly up and left, leaving nothing behind save dark stories and half-maintained dirt roads, which were fast swallowed up by blackberry vines and sprawling new trees. Centuries passed, memories faded, and in the end, the lost little squatter's colony became the backdrop for any spook tale an imaginative local teenager could dream up. Jason Voorhees-esque murderer in the woods around town? Surely he dwelt in Hatfield, where he couldn't be found. Strange lights on the hills at night? Surely it was the spirits of long-dead Hatfield, warding off unwanted visitors. Monster or ghost walking the tree-choked slopes under cover of darkness? Surely it was the thing responsible for Hatfield's demise, and lurked there still, waiting to rise again and trouble the residents of sleepy little Powell County. I had little interest in the modern campfire tales about the place, but I knew from Stanton's city records that such a hamlet as Hatfield had existed. Its name was on the ledgers of several local businesses up into 1872, when the name ceased to be mentioned on any commercial or official documents, after a long and steady decline. I had tried questioning several of the bigger landowners in the region about settlement remains left over on their properties for years in pursuit of the old legend. So, when Jake offered me the chance to look at an unnamed ruin in the hills above town, I jumped at the chance to go. With any luck, I told myself I'd find relatively untouched remainders of early Appalachian settlement, and a few relics for both my private collection and regional museums. I packed as if I were headed out on a camping trip, for that's effectively what it was. The only addition was a tried and tested metal detector, which I carried slung over one shoulder like a rifle. With a full pack and a couple days of food, I drove up to the Stetter Resort early one lovely June morning with nothing on my mind save naive hope and swollen expectations, the dew glistening on roadside grass and the rays glittering through overhanging boughs taken entirely for granted. I wish now that I'd slowed down, that I'd savored that lazy weekend drive for I can hardly recall it now through the haze of what happened afterward. It was the last time I'd see my homeland with such innocent eyes. Jake offered me a cabin to stay in, but I was eager to get to work at the ruin, and figured I'd camp up among the foundations if he'd let me. He wasn't opposed, and gave me directions as to just how I could wind my way up to the place through the woods. It was, he said, quite difficult to get to, but so long as I could hang close to the stream once I located it, I'd find myself in the ruins within a couple hours. As with any directions through relatively untouched wilderness, this was easier said than done. The stream itself bottomed out into a creek at the floor of a steep and muddy valley, and though it was strong and steady enough that I could trace it by the noise it made, the banks were so overgrown that one had to almost step in the water to see it. Creeping brush and dense thorns made tracing those banks hard, and it wasn't long before I hit a series of several small waterfalls over treacherous and jagged cliffs. These required me to sweep out away from the creek and climb barely passable switchbacks, and I always seemed to find another cliff to scale after surmounting the lower rungs. Thus, the tangled mire of living mazes kept me bogged down until early afternoon, and I hadn't reached the upper valley the ruins occupied until twelve had come and gone. Sweating with forearms scraped raw by spined blackberry vines on the ridges, I sat down for a much-needed rest as soon as the ground leveled out. I figured I must be close. I'd covered perhaps two grueling miles if measured solely along the creek and though the trees overhead choked out the afternoon sun and the scrub limited my vision, I could see the highland holler up here was bowl-shaped and steep. This, I reasoned, had to be the future location of Jake's pond, for the description matched it perfectly. He'd need to do a hell of a lot of cutting and digging to clean out trails for driving up here, though. 
It was there, perched on a moss-chewed fallen log which straddled the stream, that I noticed the first of many odd landmarks I'd come to be familiar with during my night in the valley. Just across the creek, about eye-level with me up the opposite bank, there stood what I first took to be a fallen tree branch. It was too evenly proportioned, however. Symmetry like that doesn't exist in trees around here. No, this was four arrow-straight trunks, stripped of bark and limbs. Each was an even twenty or so feet in length, and they had been leaned together like teepee struts amidst the branches and brush over there. Lashings fashioned from some sort of rough-spun rope held the top of the structure together, and atop that pinnacle had been laid a dirty old doe skull, its hollow sockets peeking down from the zenith as if observing my spot across the way. I got up after a moment and crossed the water to take a look. I grappled at first with the thought that Jake must have put the thing up as some sort of a place marker, but that notion fast faded away. Firstly, he'd have mentioned it in giving me directions, I reasoned. But secondly, and most importantly, the thing was simply too old. Jake had only ever been up in this inaccessible section of his sprawling property a couple times, and both had been within the past few months. Standing under the macabre lean-to of aging wood, I found it was sodden and eaten through with rot and age, at least a decade old and likely much older. The lashing around the tops of the trunks which had once held them firm beneath the skull had almost entirely moldered away, and now the weight and malformed moisture of mounded moss and fungus did the work for it. Jake couldn't have put it up. He also didn't spot it, something this odd would have taken center stage in any description of the place. The more I looked, the less that surprised me. The foliage was so dense around it that it was only visible from one direction at a distance, which happened to be exactly the angle I'd viewed it at from across the creek. From most vantage points, it was little more than an odd shape amidst a forested valley of bent branches and twisted trunks. It would hardly raise suspicions if one didn't know where and how to look for it. Old as it was, though, it certainly wasn't centuries old which meant it had come to stand there overlooking that lonely creek in the vale long after the former residence I'd come to find had left seeking greener pastures. Strange as it was, there was a lot of woodland out here, and it was easy to imagine a wandering group of campers or teenagers erecting the weird watcher with an old doe skull they'd found or stripped. Perhaps they'd even been patrons of Jake's resort, wandering the property off trail and looking for ways to entertain themselves likely with a bit of alcohol involved. The fact that it looked eerie would likely have been a bonus to its builders, I reckoned. It was only when I got right under the thing that I noticed it had been built over an eight or so foot pillar of stone. This was certainly older, carved as a totem, with a deer-like head and a string of runes or sigils or native symbols cluttering the length of the thing. Whatever the reason for the wooden lean-to structure, this predated it by ages. It reeked of age, and the weathered stone was as grim as the lopsided little head carved into the top. I couldn't shake the feeling that I shouldn't have seen it, that I'd somehow made a mistake by looking at it. Uncomfortable as it made me, I did my best to shake that feeling off. Having caught my breath, I moved on upstream poking off into the brush here and there to make sure I wasn't missing anything in the undergrowth. So dense was the forest that it greedily drank up all the light slinking down from above the canopy, and the wind was but a distant hush behind the green wall of leaves. I needn't have worried, though, for I rounded a sharp and steep bend in the creek bank to be faced with a crumbling stone foundation eaten over by moss right next to the broad stream. The water wasn't powerful enough to have warranted a water wheel in a place this remote, so I guessed the creek had eaten its way over to the stone over the course of long decades burbling in the shadow of the valley. Whatever the case, my probing into the woods revealed yet more ruins, 
and soon I was happily clearing away a century and more's gnawing growth and creeping vines to better observe my find. I was in the middle of seven foundations, six of stone and one of packed earth and buried wooden beams that were little more than soggy splinters in the wet earth, which I supposed must have been a barn or outbuilding. Of the six sturdier structures, I took four to be homes, as they all had either a chimney or the base of one built into the collapsed walls, meaning they had once been heated. The remaining pair were likely work buildings of some kind, though I wouldn't know anything until I broke ground and saw what the residents had left behind. Excited and convinced I'd just stumbled upon a local legend, I proceeded to do just that. I scanned, as I usually would, walking the metal detector around the edges of the foundations and through the gaps between buildings. Some things I didn't need to dig for. The remnants of old iron cookware were only half buried in the corner of one house, and a weather-worn piece of Virginia colony coinage rested jammed between two fireplace stones. Other things, from sewing implements to door hinges, I did need to dig for carving through roots which had invaded the streets of the little town. The strangest finds were not metal, however. There were no fewer than three log structures, just like the one I'd spotted along the creek bank on the way in. These were equally eaten by foliage and equally difficult to spot. All were topped by deer skulls of varying ages, with one sporting a sorry set of antlers which had been blackened and bent by time. Each of these three had been built over equally ancient-looking stone totems topped with malformed little deer heads mined in the unforgiving rock. They all looked in from a distance at the center of the community, being set up on small hills above the hamlet. Still stranger was the scattered plastic refuse I found amidst the bushes and scrub between the buildings. It took me a long while to figure out what exactly I'd found, for the remains were twisted and stripped of their reflective sheen by the march of years, but after picking up a few strands of the trash, I realized they were discarded zip ties. There were quite a lot, perhaps twenty or thirty, though they were usually in pieces, distributed throughout the town. Those, like the standing skulls, were certainly not original, but they, like the standing skulls, seemed quite old. I catalogued the zip ties away as yet another oddity I'd need to ask Jake about, and stashed the remnants of one in a pocket as testament to the find. Then it was back to serious work. It didn't take long for me to turn something up, either. The largest of the foundations sported a wider fireplace than any of the others, and its sturdy construction meant a fair portion of the chimney was still tottering unsteadily in the air overhead. I shimmied up into the gap looking for loose stones and spaces in the chimney's interior. It had been common practice during long stints of history to keep salt, herbs, and other things one needed to keep dry and free of moisture stowed away in the chimney chute, which tended to be one of the only areas in older homes kept free of moisture. There were sometimes mementos and keepsakes stored there, private letters wrapped in cheesecloth, for example and I wished to see if there was anything remaining that might identify this forgotten community as the abandoned settlement of Hatfield. While I found no storage cubby in the chimney proper, I jostled loose a large chunk of soot-stained rock at the base of the fireplace climbing back out. Shifting it aside, I uncovered a small compartment hidden in the floor just in front of the firebox, set into the hearth. It was masterfully made, for the little aperture within was bone-dry and unmarred by over a hundred years of rain and wind. Within, yellowed and brittle but otherwise in prime condition, was a loose-bound homemade book of rough-edged paper, battered by frequent use and etched through with old writing in a rushed and cramped hand. Though I hadn't read much, I glimpsed enough delicately leafing through the first few pages to spot the name Hatfield laid out in harsh characters more than a few times. The cover might have been plain home-dried leather, and the handwriting might have been brutal on the eyes, 
but I was enthralled by the find. I had never found something so intact and rife with potential glimpses into the past as that fragile old book, and have yet to match the find since, though I suppose that's not an impressive measure, since that night put me off historical treasure hunting for good. Regardless, I felt I had to peruse the book, and with the afternoon growing ever more hot and humid, I resolved to set up the tent I'd dragged up for the night. There wasn't much sunlight left by that time. Its strangled rays struggled to slip through the canopy above. Nor was there any forecast of rain, but I wasn't going to take chances with my new find. It was already faded and worn by years, and I had no wish to see this last remnant of a derelict town fall to dust because of my mistreatment. I only went back to the cubby in the hearth and removed the thing when I had a dark, gaudy tent roof overhead. Then, perched in the mouth of my cheap little refuge for the night, I bent down and began to read, flipping pages with all the tenderness my tired hands could muster. It'll be difficult now, sitting here in the comfort of my home with the buzzing chorus of the night birds and bugs assailing the windows, to convey my mood those years back, poring over the dire words scrawled by the patriarch of long-dead Hatfield. I can, as I relate what I read to you, only say that the noises of the wood around me and the deepening darkness of late afternoon gave a sinister ambience to my reading. Given what was written in that awful tome, I'd imagine I'd have felt disturbed reading it just about anywhere. But the valley around Hatfield's ruins was special. The birds and squirrels tread carefully, as if to avoid drawing attention to themselves, and the creek pattered and gurgled like a sick visitor rather than a wholesome mountain stream. Above it all loomed those turgid, decadent log totems or monuments with the deer skulls atop them, leering down through branch and leaf with empty sockets upon the wanderer who had bumbled into their silent domain. The journal, for that's what the relic proved to be, was written by one Robert Hatfield. This Hatfield, it must be said, was of no relation to the famed borderland feudists of the same name, for I've dug for such connections since long before finding the town of Hatfield itself. He was, however, a descendant of the founding Hatfield family which had put down roots in this upland valley centuries ago. Indeed, if the journal is to be believed, the Hatfields came as squatters in the early 18th century, long before settlement west of the Appalachian ridges was legally opened up to the Thirteen Colonies. This would have made them some of the first settlers of the territory which would one day become Kentucky, and their presence in these hills almost certainly predated the founding of nearby Stanton near the banks of the Red River by well over a hundred years. The Hatfield clan and several intermarried families had built homes in this vale to capitalize on good pasture meadows for a small swine herd, and to potentially make money selling off the cherry wood in the area once the land was inevitably incorporated into the expanding eastern colonies. The journal chronicled in its first few pages how those early years had been fraught with tension, with the American Indians of the area raiding the farm twice and carrying off one of the Hatfield daughters as a war bride to a local chieftain. Though losses were harsh and conditions cruel in those first few frightful years, the passage of time brought more settlers, and the Hatfields fought in many of the Indian wars which drove the most warlike tribes away from the Appalachian Mountains into the lowlands further west. By the time independence had been won and the 19th century had dawned, the blossoming community of Hatfield had become a prosperous little hamlet, and its founding family had grown rich on the sale of surrounding land to newcomers in the hills. The early decades of the 1800s passed silently, for the most part. The poorer branches of the family tree engaged in a little illicit tax-free liquor production on the wooded slopes, but little else of consequence was mentioned by Robert Hatfield in his recollections on the century. The Civil War drew in most of the residents of Hatfield on the side of the Union, ironically, as it turned out, given they opposed the presence of Africans in the New World. Like many mountain folk, they seemed to return home after the culmination of the war in emancipation, 
feeling they'd fought a fight which wasn't their own, and settled uneasily back into modest lives in the wilds of eastern Kentucky. It was during the late 1860s that what Robert called the strangeness began, and it was this which had driven the man to record the book through which I read. The first happenings were explicable, missing livestock and misplaced household items, mostly. Such things had long been a part of life in the Upland Valley, but the residents of Hatfield always had things to pin the losses on, wildlife and native raiders for the materialists among them, and old fey legendry for the more mystic among their number. These losses were different, though, and Robert went to great lengths to make certain anyone reading his text didn't dismiss the accounts as the ramblings of a frightened rustic. In the summer of 1868, the primary household of the Hatfield family in town, the very same structure from which the journal was taken, I gathered, had lost every ounce of iron in the home over the course of one night. The pots, pans, and tools of the building were all nowhere to be found come morning. The strangest loss was that of the iron barrel and firing mechanism off the old blunderbuss Robert kept in a corner, which seemed to have been cleanly and quietly detached from the firearm and spirited away to parts unknown. The only exceptions to this disappearance were the few nails which anchored the roof, and even these seemed to have been pried at and fussed with. Over the following week, the houses of Hatfield lost their iron one at a time, with first Robert's son-in-law, and then his nephew coming forth to report missing metal. After that third strange heist, watches were set around town, and locks were fitted to the doors, but to no avail. The remainder of the buildings, barn and all, were stripped clean of iron by the week's end leaving Robert and his kin to marvel at what could have moved so stealthily and stolen so gracefully as to avoid notice seven nights in a row. The next week, Robert's granddaughter came sprinting into town with a story of something she'd glimpsed on the road up from trading in Stanton around dusk. Something big, she said. It was thought the flighty adolescent had merely imagined a gigantic shape amongst the wind-bent trees, but over the next few days, more and more people around Hatfield proffered similar reports. One, a minister visiting from Stanton, was so inconsolable after his trek up into the hills that Robert was forced to escort him back down out of the mountains on horseback. The trees in the woodland walked, he said, and there was no force on earth which could compel the man of the cloth to make the return trek alone. Perhaps his terror had been warranted, for not a few days later, a man visiting Hatfield to collect pelts for sale down in Stanton disappeared walking the steep dirt road up to the hamlet. Searches, such as there were, revealed nothing, and the dour woods brooded silent and shady beneath canopies which grew thicker that summer than in any year in living memory. No trace was ever found and much the same fate awaited two young women with a neighboring Pentecostal congregation who climbed the Hatfield Road to proselytize the remote community. Again the community was called in to help, and again they left empty-handed, save, that is, for a few tales about half-glimpsed walking trees, which the more timid among the searchers carried home to stand and with them. It was not long before Robert's own son-in-law and grandson went missing themselves, lost hunting down a coyote they'd shot near one of their pig pens. A storm rolled in and made the forest into a howling swamp, and it was not until the next day that the family managed to mount a search effort. By that time, the town of Stanton had ceased to travel into remote and standoffish Hatfield for business or for aid, as it was said the woods were unwholesome around the old hamlet. Thus, the Hatfields and their neighbors searched alone, and, aside from flooded creek bottoms and unnaturally thick blackberry brambles, they too returned empty-handed. The storm that heralded the loss of Robert's family members was the first of a long string of freakish, malignant weather which settled in like a pox upon the mountains. Indeed, the storms seemed only to strike the valley around Hatfield, for I recall that the annals of Stanton make frequent mention of clouds over Hatfield, 
and the deadly flash floods which swept down the mountains after days of constant rain up there in the hoary hills. Robert claimed the wind was so loud in the trees and against the roofs of the Hatfield homes that a man couldn't hear over the constant wail. He also swore that there were other sounds out there in the torrent, screeches which sounded almost like torn steel in the clatter and clamor of the cataclysmic storms. The pigs disappeared, a few at a time. Some speculated they had run into the woods in fear of the weather, while others, Robert among them, insisted they had been taken. The Hatfield horses would not tolerate the place, and at length were all seen to flee and abandon their old meadows in the valley. Even the couple dogs in town gave up their homes and were soon to be found wandering the streets of Stanton rather than haunting the firesides of their masters in tempestuous and thunder-crazed Hatfield. It was after a particularly harsh gale that Robert and his shaken wife emerged to find two of the other Hatfield homes had had their roofs hoven in overnight. There were no fallen limbs or toppled trees, nor were there signs of outsiders walking the sodden mud around town. The trees loomed large and close to the hamlet, however, so close, in fact, that Robert believed they had moved. The houses were empty, and their residents, Robert's daughter and granddaughter in the one case, and a family which worked the woods for the aging Hatfield in the other, were nowhere to be found. The interiors of the houses were destroyed by the wind and the rain, and the onset of yet more storms drove Robert and his wife back inside with the remaining residents of Hatfield. They all crammed into the main residence, armed to the teeth, a precaution against a foe none of them knew or understood. That afternoon, during a break in the growling thunder which roared its discontent overhead, a knock sounded upon the door. When Robert, guns bristling at his sides, flung wide the door, he was met by a single, unassuming old man with his features veiled behind a rough-spun hat. The brief exchange which ensued was so potent to Robert Hatfield that he would abandon the land his forebears had conquered and flee with family in tow to Stanton, haunted, I can only assume, by all which had befallen him till he took his dying breath. It was at this moment in the reading that, as I sat there huddled in the shadows of the tent beneath the throttling clutches of the canopy overhead, I heard the first rumble of thunder in the distance. I looked up from the old book to find the windless valley dark with the onset of both the dusk and what had to be a coming storm. The forecast had, of course, been clear, but the weather was frequently unpredictable in these parts, and I didn't think much of it at the time. Ignorant of what the growling storm heralded and absorbed by the story told by the journal, I sequestered myself safely in the tent and pressed on, ignorant of the world around me. Hatfield told, at length, how the stranger had introduced himself as an emissary of the mountain, though what exactly the old man meant by this he would not say. He explained only that the land had belonged to his order, whatever that meant, since long before Hatfield's family and their compatriots had set up shop in the Upland Valley. They had been content, he said, to let matters be for a long, long while and had conducted their business in the Vale under a shroud of secrecy. Now, the stranger's order required the land back, and theirs was not a buyer's offer. Either the residents of Hatfield uprooted and left on the spot, or this mountain would crush them. I was amazed the narrative didn't end with Hatfield shooting the pugnacious stranger, but something about the wizened ancient bent and glaring on his doorstep cowed the willful man and his huddled family besides. The gathered Hatfields and other hangers-on in the community tried to reason with him, to ask what they'd done to bring about so furious a response, but the stranger would not barter. Rather, he gave them an ultimatum. Be gone by midnight, or be removed. Then he turned and went on his way, hobbling like a drunk into the wilds about them. They realized as he went that there were others out there, hunched and leaning and hiding in the branches, mere outlines to their eyes, and yet all too real as the storms lashed overhead and the wind rocked the trees of the valley. 
Only when the wind kicked up to a thrumming howl and the ground beneath the sturdy old Hatfield home began to shake as with the tread of massive boots did the debates within its battered walls begin to turn towards fleeing the town. It was not the titan footsteps or yowling gale that finally sent them scurrying into the dark and away from their homes with all they could carry on foot, though. Rather, it was a series of long and ear-splitting screeches, as of metal being torn or scraped, which cracked old windows and vibrated in the chests of the huddled Hatfield survivors. So vast was the noise, Hatfield wrote, that he would not have been surprised to learn the mountains beneath their feet had made it themselves, groaning in pain at the unnatural excesses being conjured up on their slopes. Their departure was only the beginning of their torment. The woods had grown strange indeed, stranger and thicker and older than even the storm-fed forests of the past few weeks had been. Indeed, despite the fact that the vague outline of the town road remained to guide them, it was easy in the howling dark which devoured them to imagine they were in a different forest entirely. The bark of trees thrummed with vibrations as if the things breathed, and the boughs seemed ever to twitch and pluck at the heads of the fleeing townsfolk as they stumbled and surged in the blackness. It was not merely malign trees that tormented them, however, for though the figures they had glimpsed earlier in that horrid old man were nowhere to be seen on the outskirts of town, they would not be alone for long. Hatfield recorded that after they took to the woods in a single group hauling lanterns and flinching at every cracked branch and shifting tree in the storm, they could hear what they took to be heavy footfalls crunching the undergrowth off to the sides of the path, driving them on without ever bothering to chase. Animals which he would only describe as unwholesome, swollen, or disproportionate were wont to slink out of view along the roadside and all the while that rending screech continued to pour down from higher in the hills, preventing them from resting easy, from second-guessing their flight to the lowlands. When at last the road rejoined the main routes towards Stanton, Robert said they first ceased to feel the rain drip down through the leaves, then realized the pursuers in the wood had given up their chase. The woods seemed less wicked, and along the winding route into the larger town they saw no awful fauna. Nor were they accosted by moving flora, for the trees hung lazy and wholesome down here on the valley floors. The screeching still sounded, though, and it continued to vibrate through the Powell County woods long after the party of shaken men and women who had been driven from Hatfield found solace in the homes of friends and relatives in Stanton. Only the dawn could dispel the awful noise, and with it, the distant storm which had centered solely on the slopes around Hatfield. Things went back to normal in the region, so much as they could. The odd weather ceased, and the former residents of Hatfield set up homesteads and houses in the town proper. A few who could afford to do so fled west, for the sight of the ancient mountains amidst which they dwelt was no longer a salve to them. The town of Hatfield itself ceased to be discussed in polite company around Stanton, for it was held to be a rotten place, and bringing its name to mind could dredge up only pain and the memory of stranger, fouler days. As for Robert, he was troubled greatly for the rest of his days by what had befallen them up there. He dreamed of horrible woodland wilds like the one through which he'd fled his home place years prior and was incapable of hunting or strolling the woods without care anymore. This was not helped by the fact that he frequently saw men walking the woodline of his new property in Stanton, watching him, he was certain, for signs he might return. It was this which had spurred him to record his thoughts in the book I held, and which drove him to hike the path back up to Hatfield's ruins nearly a decade later with a few of his friends in tow. Robert Hatfield would go only in the broad light of a cloudless day and aim to stow the book there amongst the stones of his old fireplace, a symbolic burial of the past within the past, he wrote, which he hoped might serve two purposes. The first was to give him closure. The second was to warn off any who found it from putting down roots in Hatfield. There were things best left to rot and rust with the ages, as he put it, and Hatfield was one of them.
Once again, thunder rolled over the not-so-sturdy shelter of my tent, and I was jerked from my dark reverie of ages past into a present which was suddenly threatening to me. I was suddenly aware of how dark it seemed past the confines of the tent, and how shrill the wind had grown above the trees overhead. I was sitting in the midst of the ruins of Hatfield after reading an eerie tale about the settlement's abandonment, so I thought it only natural I'd be unnerved by the unexpected onset of the storm, especially one timed so perfectly with the onset of night. I reminded myself that I was only a few scant miles from Jake's little resort, though, and the mundane nature of my homeland kept me a bit more at ease while I tucked into a sandwich and unzipped the flap so I could watch the onset of dusk while I ate. I had just begun to regain a bit of my easy excitement at the find and my surroundings when I glimpsed a shape at the cusp of the Hatfield ruins, something which forced me up onto my feet so I could better see it in the gathering shadow. There was a shape in the trees, I thought, just beneath one of the old skulls which thrust up from the undergrowth. Seeing those dire constructs again in light of the account I'd just read was bad enough, but the more I looked, the less certain I was the shape beneath it was just an errant branch or log poking through the leaves. It was too familiar, too rounded. The longer I stood staring, the more my eyes forged that shadow standing against the deep greens and browns of the valley, into the outline of a man. The longer I mused on what someone would be doing out here, looking down into the forgotten little town, the more convinced I became that whoever was up there was watching me. I'm not usually that easily shaken. There were, after all, many reasons for someone to be wandering the property. If I had desperately wished to dismiss what I was seeing, I would have been able to rationalize it away. But in the dark of that strange valley, with the thunder growling down through the trees, and the words of Robert Hatfield tumbling around in my skull, the figure could not be rationalized. I began to approach, calling out a shaky hello, trying all the while to remember where I'd stowed the knife I carried. Simultaneously, I was overwhelmed by the hopeless conviction a knife could do nothing to help me. My words did nothing to budge my guest in the tree line, nor did another call elicit any response. When I crossed perhaps half the distance between my tent and the edge of the ruins, where the silhouette awaited me, I froze. So absorbed in the appearance of that one figure had I been that I'd neglected to scan the rest of the woodland. Exposed and isolated, I now saw there were many such figures in the brush or behind crumbling foundation walls, all a fair distance from me, watching, all silent as the wind whipped the trees into a roaring frenzy. They were men, darkly clothed and hooded, though not in comically officious robes or the trappings of movie magicians. They wore windbreakers and ragged hoodies, rain pants and haggard boots, had it not been for their uniform blackness and that devastating statuesque silence, I could have been convinced they'd merely been out for a hike in the woods. There, in that moment, I knew they had come for me, and I was not equipped to struggle. Stock still they remained, even as I lost my composure and screamed at them that I was about to leave, and they should make way for me. They didn't budge as I snatched up my bag and stowed the book within. Abandoning my tent, I made for the creek's bank and began to retrace the ascent I'd made earlier in the day in the gathering gloom, desperate enough for escape that I would risk the nocturnal forest rather than cling to Hatfield another moment beneath the eyes of my watchers in the woods. Those watchers moved at last, though, shifting slowly to block my route downstream towards the mouth of the valley. I could hear others, out of my sight, shifting closer through brambles and leaves in the dark, tightening the noose. I pressed on toward them, talking all the while, asking them to just let me pass so I could leave them be. There were no other options then. There were dozens of them, and they encircled the overgrown town. I was at their mercy, and if they had any to offer, I meant to take it. I had nearly bumped into the two nearest the water when one held out a hand and demanded the book. As he did so, something strange happened. 
something I've long tried to blame on an errant gust of wind from the incoming storm. The intertwined tree limbs which hung heavy from the twisted trunks around Hatfield bent low overhead, in unison, as if the canopy itself was leaning in to listen for my response. Bark buckled and groaned, and branches bristled and cracked. The woods were swollen in that moment with the noises of rustling leaves and upturned earth, and I was overwhelmed by the odor of damp soil and wilderland decay. Lights not unlike the lilting luminescence of fireflies flared into life in the deepest reaches of the veil, still as stone and brighter than any wholesome insect could hope to produce. In the distance, so faint as to be nearly imperceptible above the din, came a sound not unlike thunder, but different. It was a metallic sound, like the grating squeal of an old oil well or rusting piston. Again, I had no choice. I handed the book over after fumbling in my pack a moment, shaking so violently I nearly dropped the thing into the creek as we exchanged it. Only after he had the tome in hand did the speaker step aside, as did his comrade. The canopy withdrew, and all the forest seemed to exhale after a tense and dreadful moment on the brink of things unthinkable. I trotted at first through those unseen ranks of men in the leaves, but after I'd clambered in the near blackness down the rocky slopes just beneath the stream's dip from the valley, I turned on my light and ran. I fell here and there, sure, but that was small price to pay, for the thunder still clapped overhead, and in its presence the trees seemed to breathe and buckle, their trunks swelling and rippling in the dark as I moved. The thought of escape made every sprain and bruise and gash worthwhile. The rain came but died away as I descended the hills, and by the time midnight saw me stumble gasping into the gravel parking lot of Jake's resort and pile into the truck like a bolting rodent, the sky overhead seemed clear and calm. The night through which I drove for home was placid, and yet it held nothing but terror for me. The moonlit trees seemed menacing and reaching when grazed by the stark gleam of my headlights, and the fireflies above distant fields seemed to taunt rather than soothe. When I wound up the two-mile gravel road to my home on a lonely mountain ridge, my solitude felt, for the first time, like an unspoken threat waiting to be acted upon. I sat up through the remainder of the night, replaying the events of the day in my head, and marveling that I had not yet awakened from what should have been merely an awful dream. Dawn saw me call Jake and warn him that there was something odd about the upland valley. I was vague. I had to be, of course, for who would have believed what I had seen, but I tried to use the skull totems and weird signs of human wanderings to turn him away from his plans to develop the area. Better to let the place lie, I said. And yet, Jake shrugged off the skulls just as I had done, and laughed off my suggestion that nothing good could come from the place. Who could blame him? Jake Stedder's hurried development halted some months later when, as related by our mutual friend, he disappeared from his home. His wife, along with several guests at the small resort, went with him. Cars abandoned and dogs left wandering the home like lost children. This came after a spate of strange calls to the Powell County Sheriff's Office, in which Jake complained of strangers lurking in the woods near his home. The county, and then the state, were abuzz with the strangeness of the event, and yet nothing was ever uncovered. I kept waiting for the authorities to reveal they'd found some gruesome remnants in a secluded upland vale on the property but such reports never came, and by the time the new year had dawned, few talked about old Jake's shuttered resort anymore. The large property was put up for sale not long after, perhaps by family, and it was snapped up by out-of-town buyers few in Stanton have seen. They've done nothing to revive the place. Indeed, they've felled several trees over the gravel path up to the old resort building, and removed any signage that might tell a seasonal visitor the place was ever there. Perhaps that was the plan all along. 
All this brings me to the second reason I've recorded this account. Coming clean and reflecting on what's happened gets me only so far. It's what's happening now that chills my blood and makes me doubt whether I'll ever get the chance to recapture the glory of the mountains. For several weeks, my dog has barked at the woods around the house. He was never wont to bark at nothing, and the local deer have always steered clear of the yard. Thinking there must be a nosy black bear nearby, I took to bringing a flashlight and my shotgun out to scan the trees when he'd start up a racket. That's when I noticed a figure in the woodline, buried back amongst the branches, watching. I've seen them multiple times since then. They are likely out there now even as I write this, gazing up at the lights through the window, waiting for God knows what to drive them into action. I've called the police, of course, but like with the Stetter Resort, there's only so much they can do. Even a few acres of mountainous woodland is all but impenetrable at night, and the watchers are always gone by the time help arrives. I'm on my own, I fear, and I can't know what they plan to do out there. Why I was allowed to live even this long is a mystery to me. Why would they allow me to leave Hatfield's husk if they meant to follow me here, all these months later? Surely that awful veil in the hills would have made a less conspicuous place to take me than my own home across the county. They certainly didn't hesitate to grab Jake from the resort at the foot of the hills, and not an ounce of effort in the ensuing search had revealed anything nefarious about the upland valley over which they held sway. And yet, there is little else I can think they'd aim to do skulking out there amidst trees which writhe and seethe and plot without a single gust of wind to move them. The thunder is growling in a clear sky now. I can't help but think they'll come soon. I feel certain of it. They won't be coming to return my tent, either. I mean to kill them when they come for me. I cannot believe they'd be so bold as they are if they were afraid of that prospect, but hey, shotgun is a shotgun, and I mean to use mine. If anyone beyond those watchers in the woods reads this, then leave well enough alone and steer clear of the mountains above the old Stetter Resort. Don't dig too deep for answers or memories or bodies, because you're not likely to find any. Leave this account behind and get out of the area if you can. I couldn't. Even now, I'm too interwoven with the region to flee. But perhaps you're not as sentimental as I am. If it's the Watchers reading this, though, I hope whatever you've done to me was worth the hollow point slugs I'm going to fill you with. I'll die here before I run again. I'm done running. Randall Cornett June 18th, 1994. To call the taming of an animal its improvement is in our ears almost a joke. Whoever knows what goes on in menageries is doubtful whether the beasts in them are improved. They are weakened. They are made less harmful. They become sickly beasts through the depressive emotion of fear, through pain, through injury, through hunger. It is no different with the tamed human being. Nietzsche, Twilight of the Idols. Awakening. One. Stormfront. 
Aurum slid aside the papers, tired eyes watering and twitchy hands made sluggish by days without proper sleep. He'd read through the old Hatfield account four times that day alone. The maps his father had left him depicting distant Powell County were sprawled before him, and he'd been digging through everything he'd been able to drag off the internet about the area over the past few years like a fevered fanatic. Recent events had only inflamed the obsession. Still, despite all his delving, he remained uncertain and that was not a feeling to which he was accustomed. Aurum stood and swayed, lightheaded after so long bent over the cramped basement card table over which he'd labored. He shook it off, aided in the motion by the muted roll of distant thunder somewhere far away. Turning for the stairs, he weaved through cheap, leaning bookcases and piled boxes to climb from the dim cellar into the house above. The old stairs creaked in protest beneath him, aged and buckling, but he kept his feet near the edges, and the moldering structure held firm. When he pushed out into the light of the tottering house's decaying kitchen, his eyes reeled. Only the ambient light spilling through the far window lit the room, and yet even this was a shock to him after so many hours in the dark. Squinting, he shrugged on his tattered coat and wound through the front room, almost reaching the door before a voice halted him on the mat. Where to? It was an uncertain question, though less practiced ears than Aram's would have taken the words to be hard as iron. He turned to face the ratty old sofa, where a broad, unusually tall younger man watched his going with the nervous trepidation of a cat wondering where its next meal will come from. The arch, Aram answered, zipping up the coat and turning back for the door. The storm will be here soon. Keep an eye on the place, and call me if our Eastern Brotherhood radio in. Let anyone else who's asking know where I've gone, won't you? The big man nodded, holding aloft his phone as if to signal he'd registered. Thank you, Soraya. Don't hesitate to get some sleep if you can. You've earned that much. The name was still new to the younger man. Soraya had only been inducted a month prior, and he was still settling into his role, name included. Aram could see every ounce of the initiate's exhaustion hanging heavy in his eyes. Though he knew Soraya didn't mean it, Aram nodded his approval when the nervous initiate assured him he'd try. Shoving out of his dilapidated home onto pockmarked and desiccated Thomas Street, Aram found the sun had risen in a cloudless sky, perhaps, he thought, the last this city would ever see. It was hot as midday edged closer, and aging St. Louis seemed all but deserted, leaving him to wind down onto the uneven sidewalk and stalk off east down the road in silent isolation. Not that the silence on his stretch of Thomas Street was all too strange. Half the buildings had been abandoned for over a decade, and the few which weren't were occupied by ancient stragglers who seldom left the modest safety of their crumbling homes. It was the absence of horns, sirens, and distant voices that chilled him, for even the dogs of the city seemed hushed and tense, as if awaiting a blow they knew must soon fall. Usually, the silence would have been delightful to Aram. He was prone to taking late-night strolls for just that reason. The teeming hordes which buzzed like locusts about the old city didn't chafe quite as much after dark, when they returned to their hives to rest up for the next day's labor. Now, an hour before noon, the hum of the city had been replaced by the hush of an open-air tomb, and the only sound which occasionally pressed in on his racing thoughts was the thundering passage of military helicopters overhead always eastward, towards a horizon Aurum could not yet see. He saw only one soul on Thomas Street, a shadow beneath a porch overhang which bustled out to watch him in wordless tension as he trotted past. Aurum did his best not to look, and was rewarded by the stranger's silence. No matter how disgusting he found the condition of modern man, no matter how decadent the urban sprawl in which he lived became. 
It never ceased to turn his stomach how soft the people amongst whom he lived had become. The storm approached, and rather than thunder forth to fight the unknown in the open, or revel and struggle and riot in the agitated anger of uncertainty, the people of St. Louis hid and hoped. They clung to their fleeting electricity and clean water while it lasted, and locked doors as if wood and iron could stop what was now swooping down upon them. Aram imagined the silent observer was scouring his brain for answers. What kind of madman would walk the street at a time like this? Doesn't he know it's dangerous out there? My television told me to hide indoors, the last time it worked, anyway. Hasn't he heard? Doesn't he know he might be hurt? To the aimless wretches humankind had become, comfort and plenty were the sweetest fruits of life. The attainment and protection of these fruits was life's purpose, and the notion that someone would gladly seek hardship, would willingly throw themselves into the jaws of extreme experiences purely for the sake of overcoming the ensuing struggle, was as alien to the people of St. Louis as the clouds they knew must be sliding west towards their city. Even the dregs and outcasts of society, arm included, had been privy to placid comforts and small joys that no earlier century could have provided them. To act, to struggle, would be to break the seductive spell of security and pleasure they'd known all their lives. Far better to hide, they thought, to draw into their modest, urbane fortresses and hope the dwindling military could finally do something to stop whatever was happening out there. So it must have been for all the cities on the continent, already behind the wall of the storm, Aram told himself. So it would be for all the wider world if someone didn't do something. As he rounded the bend onto Martin Luther King Drive, he grappled for the hundredth time with the fact that he might well be the man required to do that something. After an arduous life of striving, straining, and succeeding, he might well be the only person left in the new world who knew how it could be stopped. All he could do now was wait, just as the frightened husks hiding indoors were doing, and anticipate contact from the Eastern Brotherhood. Much as he hated the waiting and the wondering, he found some solace, small as it was, in the fact that he would not spend his time cowering. He would read, plan, plot, prepare. Again and again, Aram mulled over the words of the Hatfield account in his keen mind, projected the topography of distant Powell County, and recalled the many warnings handed down by his father about the coming storm. All his life, all his trials had been preparation for this moment. Every long, terrifying yarn he'd heard as a child, every harrowing test through which he'd been put by the organization, every friend and fellow caller he'd lost along the way, each hardship a new thread of scar tissue meant to strengthen his hide and shore up his courage for the cataclysm to come. Aram didn't mean to let any piece of it go to waste. He passed the police station, shuttered and encircled with sandbags after the fleeting riots which had rocked the city weeks prior. The chaos had been quick. The masses, as was ever the case in the post-industrial world, burned and maimed only so long as their phones and feeds couldn't keep them fat and happy. The soothing opium of state-provided food rations and resurrected phone service had tamed them, and now... The few police left within this outpost of law and order were packing to flee farther west, as had any with the money and pull to purchase egregious gasoline at twenty dollars a gallon. A woman scolded a child from an apartment balcony overhead, pulling him back into lackluster safety behind sliding glass doors. A man fixed a layer of sheet metal over the boarded front windows of his pizza joint on the cusp of the city center as if this might preserve his livelihood from what was to come. A family who couldn't afford the soaring prices at the few operational markets left in town scuttled away from a military checkpoint with government rations in hand, as if what they expected was a tornado or petty civil unrest. Aram supposed he couldn't blame them. 
Whatever figureheads clung to the fast-falling rungs of power in the country had aggressively controlled the narrative of what exactly awaited behind the wall of the storm. The favored old horse's misinformation and conspiracy had been trotted out by the established media to quell the wildest of the claims, and even then, the regions beneath the clouds lost contact faster than reports could spread. Those wildest claims were modest by comparison to what Aram's studies told him was coming, and the only ones aside from him who seemed to grasp the gravity of the situation were the scattered soldiers stationed in town. There were only a few army personnel on the streets, growing only to a couple on every other street corner once he neared the riverfront. Aram wasn't questioned or jostled, despite being the sole wanderer on the streets, regardless of how disheveled and restless he must look. His progress went uninterrupted, and the uniformed reservists, for that is what he fast realized they were, murmured and muttered in muddy tones amongst themselves, ever eyeing the east. They were children to Aram, either lanky or fat or shaky on their feet, far too wide-eyed, timid, and youthful to have seen bloodshed or heard shots fired in anger. They were the breed of pale-faced soldier which enlisted solely to reap the rewards of the G.I. Bill. The real fighters were likely long gone, dead in the eastern hills and in whatever ruins of New York or Washington still stood behind the wall of the storm. Any who remained would be out on the brink, the few modern souls with the will to struggle in the face of their impending demise. The fact that whatever survivors fought on out there struggled in vain didn't dull the small measure of respect Aram extended them. Indeed, he'd rather be out there fighting a hopeless struggle with violence rather than pondering the skulking, slinking struggle of subversion and stealth which he was ever more certain awaited him. The convention centers... Shopping outlets and expensive hotels downtown yawned dark and empty, and the deserted streets were only occasionally host to the rumbling engine of an armored personnel carrier or police cruiser. The emptiness again dragged Aram to the point of near thankfulness. Not for the first time, he marveled at how, if this death blow to the all-corrupting urban sprawl had merely been brought about by his order, he might now be celebrating its coming reveling at the screeching halt to which the decadent entropy of cosmopolitan excess had been brought. And yet, on he walked, unable to truly enjoy the quiet. As ever, the relief of silence in which to think was counterbalanced by disappointment. The people of St. Louis, from the highest roller to the lowliest beggar, had been stripped of their duties by the unknowable death knell which tightened like rope about them. Their security had been forcibly stripped from them, and uncertainty was their only certainty. A few had fired shots on the military food distribution checkpoints when rationing had been harsh, or raided dying supermarkets when scarcity was dire, yes. But few was the operative word there. The rest huddled and moaned and hoped. He was crossing to the arch now. It stood in the midst of a pathetic little outcrop of manicured greenery at the muddy river's bank. Gateway Arch National Park, it was called, a comedy even he was not cynical enough to enjoy. A monument to the conquest of a continent built to stand amidst a teeming horde of disconnected, rootless urbanites who didn't remember the first thing about conquest. As Aram came into the thing's shadow and the roiling darkness upon the eastern horizon across the Mississippi came into view, he figured they'd learned soon enough. If the coming storm wasn't the face of the enemy, if it was any other army or disaster or disruption, Aram would have cheered it on. Winding along the little paths through the mowed park lawn to the riverside, Aram leaned low over the rail and finally allowed himself a view of the horizon. It was dark out there, darker even than images he'd seen of rolling hurricanes approaching southern coasts, or tornado weather upon the flatlands west of Missouri. Normal storm clouds were shades of darkened gray, shadowed as they might be by the fierceness of the threat they posed. They were never truly black. 
This continent-wide westward cloud wall was black, and it brooded so darkly as to seem like a hole in the sky torn straight through to the void beyond. Its lightless depths rumbled with low and distant thunder, but that thunder felt too low, a grumbling protest which shook the ground almost imperceptibly and raised the hairs on Aram's arms. The lightning, barely visible in the gloom of the front, was almost illusory, flashing into strangled life for but a second before all traces of its gleam were lost to the abyss within the clouds. The ominous cloud bank overhead bulged and shifted awkwardly in the sky. Aram imagined such motion had been constant, but with the storm closing in upon a cowering urban center, the things it held at bay had become restless and eager, and their thrashing had become impossible to ignore. Great tendrils of gray vapor trailed up from the bulk of the storm front to grasp at the open sky, before wriggling shapeless back into the depths. Like the many limbs of a searching squid, those half-solid appendages seemed almost to drag the clouds along as the rain ate up the last few miles between the unknown and the city. Even though Aurum knew this was not the case, even though he knew it was the storm itself that held the enemy's creations at bay, he couldn't deny that the scene looked hopelessly apocalyptic. None who looked upon it could possibly deny there was something wrong within that storm. There were no birds overhead. None troubled the banks of the river, and none scanned the rolling land out east for perches or meals. The stray dogs and cats of the city had been absent for days, and Aram assumed the birds had gone much the same way, fleeing west before the arrival of certain doom, as had so many of the skittish men and women of St. Louis, all eager to cling to life for another day, another week, another month. At least the animals were aware of hardship, Aram thought, for the human chattel of the cities which fled with them knew nothing of the privation and desperation which would find them in their flight across the continent. Whether man or beast, though, they'd all run out of land soon. When the inevitable march heralded by that continent-wide storm pinned them against the west coast, and they reeled at the thought of fleeing into the sea, then what? They were only a scattered handful at the riverside with him, watching the storm approach, and yet each seemed to have come alone. After the initial fright of newcomers seeing the animate, malevolent force which approached them, the scene was shockingly calm. None spoke among themselves, as far as Aram could see, and no single soul sought the reassurance of words with another. He knew none of them, but he supposed they might be similar spirits. Even if they could not know the details of what the storm held back behind its veil of rain and fog, they knew in broad terms what it meant. They had walked in morbid fascination out to the riverfront to watch the coming of the end. Small a thing as it was, there was something admirable in that, the willingness to look death in the eye. And yet, there were still so very few of them. Aram had a moment to lament that he was in St. Louis as he waited for the clouds to roll in. This mighty old continent so paradoxically termed the new world, was on its last leg, doomed to be altered beyond recognition by the forces skulking behind those tenebrous throngs of thunderous clouds. And yet, here he was, stuck in the city in which he'd been raised, blind to the savage beauty that was about to be blotted out beneath that rain. The jagged spine of the Rockies, the oceanic expanses of the open plain, the canyon lands of the sun-scorched southwest. All of it was on the chopping block. Never again would those harsh, stunning landscapes be what they were meant to be. Never again would they be free from the influence of the dreamer, which sought to mold them in its image. All Aram could expect to see of the uncorrupted land in the path of the vast storm was the manicured lawn beneath the gateway arch 
and the shrubs and sad trees clinging to wretched life and planters and wilting yards across this gilded concrete cage of ease and plenty in which he dwelt. This city had once been a source of strength to him. His stranding in the thrum of urban decadence and weakness had been the pool from which his order drew disaffected recruits. Bored by the merchant's maze of jobs and rent and gaudy delights, it was here, among the easy aimlessness of modernity, that the souls most prone to throw aside their boundaries and embrace hedonistic extremism were to be found, ready to risk everything just to feel alive again amidst their slavery to the clock, the rent, and the law. The effect had been much the same upon Aram, for every trial or tribulation put forth by his work for the organization had been exhilarating and challenging by comparison to the humdrum monotonous comfort of the gateway city and its decaying inhabitants. He had often felt like some ancient conqueror or awakened sorcerer passing among the ranks of zombies and golems which walked, but never thought or acted, and this had kept him warm in the coldest and cruelest conditions. Now, with the jaws of the enemy seeming to snap shut in slow motion all across the new world, it felt like the weight of the sleeping masses which cowered behind him was a bind upon his limbs, against which every struggle might well be pointless. It was a human fear, he realized, to balk when faced by the annihilation promised by the otherworldly things which skulked and grasped behind masking clouds. That didn't make it any easier to shrug off the despondence that swept low over him as the distant fields and suburbs surrounding St. Louis fell beneath the shawl of the dreamer and were lost to the natural world outside the storm. Rather, the humanity of his hopelessness made it more difficult to deny. Perhaps the dreamer was right about humankind, Aram thought. Perhaps they were always weak, civilized or not, Perhaps they had never been strong. Perhaps all the feckless complacency Aram pinned on post-industrial modernity had always ruled human consciousness. Perhaps the plentiful, placid security of modernity merely made it more noticeable. These thoughts and more he shook from his head as he watched the darkening sky and listened to the rumbling approach of the enemy. Perhaps, he corrected himself, these thoughts were poison breathed into his mind by the enemy beyond the horizon. The dreamer was, after all, quite adept at bending the minds of a sensitive and powerful few to his will. Aram had struggled too far in this world to lay down and die now, with the trial of his life before him. Not half an hour had passed in contemplation before Aram's phone vibrated against his leg. He turned from the rail and made for home the way he had come, the day growing darker overhead and the streets ever more silent as time ticked out. The sun, in its slow journey westward across the sky, seemed almost to be fleeing from the advance of the storm, a fitting picture of what was to come, he thought. Aram didn't need to check his messages. He didn't need to question. He knew why it was he'd been called. He felt certain he knew exactly what the Eastern Brotherhood was calling to report, and it would not be victory. The clouds and the slow march of the enemy's progress told him as much. All he could do now was brood and shore himself up for the trials to come.
2. Flight and Failure Luther had not come to St. Louis by the paths most traveled, the military revenants clinging on to the hope that lead or explosives could solve the problem posed by the storm meant the roads west across the big river were guarded. People who fled from the depths of the storm were not quite right, it was said, something Luther had seen plenty of evidence for during his flight from the leading edge of the downpour. Perhaps, then, the military were justified in turning back or shooting those who fled into their perimeter around the storm front. That justification didn't change the fact that Luther had needed to slip past them, and that need had forced him to entertain desperation he wouldn't have guessed himself capable of a few months prior. Before the storm, he supposed he wouldn't have been capable of it. Now everything was different. Desperate was now the default state of man. Thus, he had fled the outskirts of Chicago a week ago in a car which he'd had to abandon ahead of the first military checkpoint. He'd hiked an eight-mile loop through farmland in the dead of night to get into the territory beyond the cordons unnoticed, a shaky expedition fraught with near failures. He'd then stolen an old car from a derelict farmhouse to cover the rest of the distance between him and the Gateway City. It hadn't been as simple as driving, of course. Gas was too expensive to buy, and even then it was nigh impossible to find it being sold. He'd had to siphon gas from cars he found along the way, in lots or driveways or along the roadside, often being run off in the midst of his theft by equally desperate owners, looking to protect what little they had. Large spans of stalled cars and traffic backups made backroads a necessity, and these posed their own dangers as locals made frantic by the closing clouds tried to deter untrustworthy outsiders and commandeer working vehicles for escape. Police had largely ceased their operations, but that was small consolation, as for every bit of brazen courage it granted Luther, it also saddled him with an equal measure of paranoia. He'd had to ditch his first lifted car after spotting a roadblock by unmarked vehicles ahead of him down a country lane, and after being chased through a forest into a neighborhood in which he'd stolen a bicycle, he'd only narrowly escaped capture. He was unarmed save for a pathetically small revolver he had lifted from the glove compartment of his stolen wheels, and there would be no authorities to come to his aid if he was captured on the road. For the first time in his life, shaky as he was, Luther had to make it solely by his own power in an environment where a failure might well mean death. It was by his own power that he'd held a couple at gunpoint for their idling SUV on an interstate on-ramp and by his own power that he'd driven that sturdy chariot over dirt lanes and winding old asphalt to the edge of the Mississippi, about twelve miles north of St. Louis. There, seen by none save the waning moon, he'd abandoned it and swam the width of the river. Only after he'd shaken himself dry and hiked a few miles toward the distant lights of the city had he found a bike astride a rusting chain-link fence and picked up the pace once again. All of it had felt unnatural, like a film viewed through a foggy glass. Not things that the Luther of before would have done. Not things that he could have done. Now dawn had broken, and afternoon had seen him cycling breathless around the aging quarters of the old city in search of his childhood home. It had been nearly two decades since Luther had seen it, for he had not left on good terms with his strange and frigid father. His brother was almost more alien than their father had been, equally devoted to long-dead ideas and even more fanatical in his distaste for the world around them. Still, after a year's failures and social explosions, they were all he had. The divorce, the drinking, the fallout with his employer, the splitting of the friends he'd gathered there, all of that ensured he was alone before the coming of the long dark promised by the storm. For whatever reason, his estranged family weighed heavily on his mind as of late. Though it was surely desperation that drove him, Luther meant to find them before the storm closed in on the silent city. The vacant shells lining Thomas Street were almost unrecognizable to him. 
The better part of twenty years had been cold and cruel to the residents of this quarter of the city, it seemed, for there were empty lots and overgrown yards flecked here and there down the way like teeth knocked from a tired grin. But the ragged old townhouse was there, the exhausted roof of its front porch hanging at an awkward angle, and the sparse pavement of its driveway so eaten through with weeds it could have been mistaken for gravel. The used Nissan his father had picked up for less than a thousand and ninety-nine was still there, Luther saw, missing a rearview mirror and most of its paint. He'd be amazed if the thing still ran. Several other cars, all new to him, were lined up in the driveway behind it. Another sat parked along the roadside in front of the property. A couple looked fairly new, far too expensive and flashy to belong to his family. He'd just begun to think the place might have changed hands when, as he climbed the walk to the front door, it swung open and a huge stranger stepped out to meet him. Who are you? The man in the doorway was broad and towering, wreathed in a jacket too heavy for the season and jingling with pendants and jewelry that made him look like a shady medieval merchant. He was shabby, bearded, his face dour amidst a forest of wild red hair. He was unfamiliar to Luther, but at the same time, he was exactly the sort of company he'd expect his family to keep. I'm Enoch's son, Luther answered, drawing back down to the walk as the man stepped out onto the porch and looked him over. Grew up here. There's no Enoch here, the man said, eyes narrowed. Well, maybe he's gone, Luther replied, raising his hands almost as if in surrender trying to sweep away a bit of the tension. The old car is still over there in the driveway, though. I grew up here. Been a good few years since I came back. Well, there's no Enoch here, the big man repeated. Get off the walk. Now's not a time to be knocking doors. Enoch? This voice was different, shaky with the hoarse strain of a lifetime smoking, rasping with the onset of old age. Luther would have expected someone ancient, but the figure who pushed out past the looming guardian on the porch was perhaps fifty-five. He didn't hobble. His posture was almost regal. Despite being a slight and slender figure, his bearing lent him a gravitas that his awkward dress and unkempt, dark hair couldn't diminish. You said Enoch, yes? I did, Luther replied, nodding. My father. Enoch is dead, the older man told him, for about twelve years now. You must be Luther. I didn't recognize you. It's been a long, long time. I am, Luther said. Do I know you? Perhaps, came the rasp in reply. I was among your father's brotherhood. I seldom spent time around the house, though. That's a recent development. The storm seen to that. Luther watched as the older man looked off towards the eastern sky. There wasn't much visible save the clustered skyline of the riverfront. Still, the shade which ate the sky beyond loomed black between the buildings, yawning wide like a mouth seeking meals. They all turned that way a moment, silent and still. For nearly half a minute, seconds slid on by like that each man privately reckoning how much time lay between them and the storm. It was footsteps climbing the walk to the porch that broke the silence. Luther had only a moment to turn around and see the newcomer before they spoke. What are you doing here? The figure he saw behind him was so tall and lean that Luther recognized him immediately. Had it not been for his stature, it would have proven difficult. The man's eyes were sunken and sleepless, his pupils wide with an almost manic energy. He was pale beyond even their family's trademark pallor, with long and matted hair which swathed most of his face as it rustled in the threatening wind. The suspicious glare he gave Luther was enough to make him second-guess his decision to come at all. I had to leave Chicago, Luther said after a long and uncomfortable pause. I didn't know where else to go. The response seemed weak in the face of the three men staring him down. Luther hadn't known what else to say, though, lost in the insanity of the situation. 
He'd never have believed it was possible that he'd be here ever again. Yet here he stood. Aram's eyes shifted up and down, grim and distant, drinking in the details of his brother's shaken appearance. For once, Luther thought, he probably looked more unkempt than Aram. Should I search him? The question came from the huge man on the porch at Luther's back, but Aram was shaking his head before the man finished the question. No, Sariah, Aram said. The dreamer only twists powerful, ambitious minds. Minds with a need for heightened experiences and sensations. The ones with the spark of the primal still hot in their chests. Men who would have been conquerors or raiders or corsairs or explorers in brighter ages when the shackles of civilization weren't quite so heavy. My brother here worked 50-hour weeks as a paralegal in Chicago for a decade sifting emails and papers. He'll never hear the dreamer's call. The older guardian on the porch actually snickered at this, a noise which was more a wheeze than a laugh. Aram hadn't even meant it as a challenge or jibe, though. Luther saw he'd delivered the blunt pronouncement almost the way a doctor would deliver news about infertility. He was so wrapped up in the dispassionate disinterest of the words that it took him a long moment to even question what the dreamer's call meant. But by then the conversation was moving on, leaving him to wander in silence on his own. Aram's attention turned fully to the porch as he asked, We've been contacted, I assume. Yes and no, the looming Soraya answered. There was some noise over the radio, an attempt to get through, but I couldn't make anything out. I figured you'd want to be here if any message came in. Aram nodded. He sighed, his eyes flitting a final time towards the darkening sky across town. Luther shifted from foot to foot, nervous yet glad the piercing eyes of his estranged sibling were no longer fixed on him. All right, Soraya. Get back in and keep tabs on the radio, Aram finally ordered. Turning to the older man, he added, Morgan, I want you back on the maps. I don't care how many routes you've picked or roads you've considered. Add more to the list. Plot every possibility. We have no way of knowing what we'll run into out there, and we must prepare for every eventuality. Both of them nodded, gestures so deep they might well have passed as bows and strode back through the open door. Odd and off-putting as the pair had been, Luther almost lamented their departure, for it left him alone with Aram. He turned back toward his brother, sheepish, not wishing to look him in the eye again. Though Luther was the older of the pair, though he liked to tell himself that Aram had been swept up in their father's lunatic pursuits and wasted his life, Luther had never felt like the elder brother. The sharp, perceptive intensity in Aram had only been matched by that of their father. Much as it had comforted Luther at a distance to tell himself he'd come out on top in life after his escape from the strange house in whose shadow they now stood, he couldn't believe that any more, especially not after the jolting flight from all he knew and owned. It was Aram who had a small host of loyal men at his call, mad as they all might be. There was certainty in them, even if Luther could never share it. What did he have save wasted years and shadowed memories of better times? Besides, money tallied up his digits in a banking system which would probably never work again. Nothing. You've got a revolver in your pocket there, Aram said, his voice almost making Luther jump. You're lucky Soraya didn't see it. He's still jumpy. He might have shot you if he'd spotted it. I do, Luther acknowledged, awkwardly patting the oblong outline in his muddied khakis. Though it was Aram, a grown man garbed in gaudy blacks and studs like an edgy teenager about to shoot up a school, who stood opposite him, Luther felt naked by comparison. He was wearing a mangled collared shirt and moderately dressy shoes which had seen better days, like his arduous flight had begun in the middle of a family brunch. In the unpredictable world which was fast taking shape around them, Aram was almost well put together by comparison. You must have been pretty desperate to even take that, Aram continued. You're not the sort to have owned one before all this started. 
I was, Luther acknowledged. People have gone wild out there. Me included, I guess. If only, Aurum said. Give it over. I'm sure it was a useful prop on the road, but you and I both know you won't use that. Luther almost protested, but again there was no mockery in Aram's words. His eyes had ceased to glare, and his expression was softened. Not quite a smile, but as close to one as Luther had seen since they were boys. As long as you're with us, you won't need it. Probably. Luther did as he'd been told, holding the little weapon like a used tissue. Aram was right, of course. It had always felt heavy and unnatural in his hand. Even if he'd been truly accosted on the long way to St. Louis, he doubted he'd have been able to make himself pull the trigger. Now, come inside, Aram said as he tucked the thing away. We'll be leaving soon. If you're to come with us, you'll probably want to rest for what little time we can spare before heading out. You're exhausted. That much I can see. Luther followed his brother up the stairway, leaving his commandeered bike to fall into the dry grass as he asked, You're headed west? Not quite. They pushed into the low-ceilinged front room, Aram crossing to a table against the wall that hosted ham radio equipment, over which the big man he'd called Soraya leaned and listened. Luther saw that the old couch and the ancient television which had graced the room in his day were still here and went to sit on the ratty piece of furniture after closing the squealing door behind him. Untidy as their father had been, Aram remained. The corners were caked with dust, and the wallpaper sheeted from the walls in several places. Luther had just enough time to consider asking what Aram had meant by not quite when the radio burst into life and drove all in the room to anxious silence. Luther didn't know anything about radio equipment. What he did know was that nothing of the sort had been functioning properly after the advent of the storm, even in places the front hadn't yet reached. The North American continent had been muted, some ripple effect of the freak weather event, Luther supposed. Sparse as authorities had been about the unfolding disaster, that was about as good an answer as he'd been able to muster. Yet here, in this strange house, Amidst these strange people, the old set blared and rumbled with a white noise which didn't seem normal. Eidolon, this is the Western Brotherhood. Aram called out to the static with his fist clenched against the tabletop, his eyes boring into the wall behind the radio setup as if he'd see a face there. Eidolon, this is Aram. Can you hear me? The garbled, grumbling static dragged on a long moment before a voice, distorted and strange, flared in answer. Eidolon is dead, fallen into the dream, had to be killed. All the others are gone. I'm Malorn, all that's left. It's just me and the outsider we brought with us now. Not certain where to go. Aram stayed silent, as did all the others in the room. Luther didn't fully understand what was happening but he felt as if he were suddenly party to something he shouldn't be hearing. He didn't like the feeling. We're lost. No path to the mouth. You were right. Your father was right. Even with everyone we could muster, there weren't enough. The enemy is too many, too strong, too prepared. We are coming, Aram broke in, his voice iron. The wavering tone on the other end trailed off as Aram ordered. We have a plan. You are the Eastern Brotherhood now. Your work is not done. You and the outsider find a place near the mouth to hide if you can. Don't try to find Hatfield on your own, not in the middle of all this. Just hole up. Don't draw attention to yourselves and wait for us. Understood, returned the voice. We will try. Things are... The sentence trailed off into surreal static. Aram drew low over the table, tensed, waiting, but nothing else came. He called Malorn's name, if that's what the strange title was, a few times, but no answer was given. Aram straightened, waving Soraya and Morgan into action. 
The big man hopped to his feet and disappeared into the hall while Morgan slipped back out the front door, making for a large SUV parked at the end of the drive. Soraya returned a moment later with bags, clothing, and rifles slung over shoulders and pinned under arms, following his older comrade out to the driveway. They bustled on like that a while, Morgan preparing the vehicle and Soraya loading it, while Aram sprinted down the rickety stairs to the basement, the clamor shaking the tottering old house as he went. Luther watched, more than a bit confused, as Aram emerged with an overstuffed duffel of his own. He was stuffing mounded papers and several battered books inside as he went, pausing only a moment to shout the name, Sias, at the top of his lungs before tucking out through the front door and making for the vehicle. Weighty boots sounded on the staircase which ended the hall, and before long a stern-looking little man with a sturdy build and a sawed-off shotgun wheeled into the front room at speed. He paused only a moment to glance Luther's way before, seeing Aram and the others at work outside, he pushed unceremoniously past and out into the gathering shadows on the wilted lawn. For a long moment, Luther imagined his presence had been forgotten. But, before he could muster up the courage to step out and ask his brother where the group was headed, Aram returned, eyes wide. It wasn't an expression of strained surprise, however, for the longer Luther stared back at his winded brother, the more evident his excitement became. Aram was positively manic, his eyes those of an explorer who's glimpsed gold through strangling jungle leaves. We are going. You may come or you may stay. I do not think you'll find yourself fortunate enough to continue escaping death should you remain alone. That said, you won't be much safer where we are going. We know much, but not nearly enough. More than you, and more than most, but still not enough. The choice is yours. Where? Aram didn't need further elaboration. Before Luther had even finished the word, he was gesturing with tapering fingers to the eastern horizon through the door. It was grim, blacker than an oceanic storm and gnawing through what daylight remained over St. Louis. We're going in. We're going to stop what's happening. Possibilities were innumerable. Luther considered protesting the decision, considered appealing to rationalism. He considered asking just how Aram knew what was happening when the world around him was mad to find out, and felt the frustration of long-buried years well up in him. How like their paradoxically thuggish and bookish father Aram was, a sage from some long-lost esoteric library in an outdated punk get-up which made him look as if he might have just robbed a liquor store. Staring into those cold, wide eyes, Luther could almost see their father's strange fire rekindled in them. He'd always taken that burning passion for old, dusty books of arcana and lore to be madness, but holding Aram's gaze made him more and more certain that his brother believed every word of it. He truly believed he was about to stop what no one had been able to stop. The sheer hubris of it should have floored him but Luther found it almost infectious. After long days on the run, never sure of his next step and never certain of his safety, it shored some desperate part of his soul up to see someone so electrified with poise and purpose in the face of disaster. The silence dragged a long moment, Luther trying to uncover his memories and Aram watching unblinking as his older brother pondered as if the pressure would hurry him up. We cannot wait long. Luther blinked, glacial and slow, undecided up until the words finally tumbled from his mouth. Almost, he had time to think, by accident. I'll go. Three. Gateway to the East. 
Little as the public beyond the cordons knew of what lurked beneath the clouds and rain which blotted out the sun in their intractable march outward from their core in the eastern mountains, everyone knew the governments of the North American continent were rolling out every possible contingency in a desperate attempt to contain it. Militaries had been hurriedly called home from bases and training excursions abroad, and rushed to defensive positions meant to halt the progress of the things within the storm. Police had been bolstered with deputized civilians familiar with the use of firearms, and retired personnel had been lured back into militias and citizen watch patrols with the promise of exorbitant pay. Though those yet to see the underbelly of the storm didn't fully grasp why, the whole of the new world was on a war footing, and this made the frightened people who cowered in the path of the clouds all the more nervous. Word from the southern border said Mexico had encamped along the Rio Grande and was shooting any who attempted to swim the gap. Coyote smuggling tunnels had been sniffed out using leads which had long gone ignored, and for the first time in many years, the frontier between the two countries was a tightly controlled bulwark against which desperate souls mostly Central American migrants seeking refuge in the countries from which they'd originally hailed, crashed, only to be turned back towards the clouds creeping southward over desert horizons. The thunder-haunted waters of the Great Lakes were being patrolled by Canadian vessels which sank American boats attempting to flee over the water rather than face the storm. Rangers and army personnel were scrambling to patrol the mighty, rugged boundary between the two countries and had been forced to resort to deadly deterrence to make up for their lack in manpower. Tales about families fleeing the shattered cities of lower New England towards the relative safety of the farther north commonly ended with gunfights against Canadian personnel, who'd been ordered to stop the influx of outsiders at all costs. Whether these stories were true or false was debatable. Travel through the storm was all but unheard of, and the chaos outside it prevented reliable lines of contact between one region and another from lasting for long. After a century spent under the blanket of technological progress and interconnection, the vast distances and open spaces of North America's landmass were being reinstated by grim necessity. St. Louis was as alien to Juarez or Ontario now as it would have been a century prior, and with satellite and cellular services shaky at best, the surety of the telegraph seemed stable by comparison. What everyone knew in their bones was that something was happening beyond the wall of the storm, something which consumed the people within. It was common knowledge that those scant few who did slip out beyond the clouds into the wider world were often changed, not quite right. While the brutality of these mobilizations might have been exaggerated, the scale of them had not. The banks of the Mississippi were crawling with patrols and emplacements, and any with ears and eyes had witnessed the procession of armored vehicles and roaring aircraft across the river, from whence they never returned. Thus, all those without the money, resources, capacity, or courage to flee felt like rabbits in a tightening snare. In the face of that formidable firewall of organized defense, Luther's escape into the safe zone across the river had seemed miraculous to him at the time. Only by good fortune and the luck of arriving on a sparsely peopled and densely overgrown section of the riverbank had he escaped notice. Even then, had he lingered long, Luther knew he might have been spotted by drone or boat patrols sweeping the length of the river. Escape had been an imperative for so long, He'd hardly thought about the dangers involved until he'd finished the journey. Now, as their aging SUV bumped over tarnished and time-ravaged pavement on the northern outskirts of town and wove through half-abandoned neighborhoods near the water, he realized the insanity of the agreement he'd made. He hardly knew Aram anymore, and divorced from the powerful chains wrought by his brother's piercing eyes and iron will, he was already second-guessing himself. Eyes boring into the back of his sibling's head where it rested in the passenger's seat. Luther was really seeing shootouts and murders and rapes and lootings he'd passed on the edges of the great storm front on his way here, remembering every horror the chaos and stress and influence of the storm had brought about in vivid detail. 
even if he set aside the unknown of the storm. The known was more than deadly enough. Despite the fact night hadn't truly fallen beyond the wall of slate and darkness which choked the sky overhead, it was black as night beneath the storm now. Trees whipped with sudden wind and thunder shook the ground with its roar. Old homes which might well house cowering families were lashed by the whip of wailing water, and already several trees had fallen on streets, roofs, and power lines. This was only the beginning, the comparative calm before the cataclysm which was to come. That calm was made all the more menacing by the fact that none who huddled in its grasp knew what was out there, past all that bluster and shadow. They knew only that it brought death, and they understood it with the keen surety of wild beasts in the path of a hurricane. Did these men who'd lived their years on the fringe know how bad it was? Did they know how bad it would get? How did they expect to survive a trip over some 400 miles of blood-soaked ground beneath the inexplicable rain? Most salient of all, why had he trusted Aram and his acolytes knew what they were doing? These thoughts crescendoed with the sliding halt Sias, their driver, brought to the vehicle on a gravel ramp through a dense woodline along the banks of the Mississippi. The stout man hadn't spoken at all since they'd piled into the car, and it was he that jumped first from the driver's seat after killing the engine. Soraya and Morgan, who'd sat to either side of Luther in the middle row, dragged their kits from the back seats and slid unceremoniously into the darkening rain outside, for all the world like a group of practiced soldiers going through the motions of a deployment. In a bustle, these three men went about unloading the trunk and wrapping their belongings in tarps against the storm by the harsh light of the car's pale headlights. Luther's eyes bounced to and fro, tracing what motion he could, desperate for an excuse or distraction that might act as an escape route for him. It was only after about half a minute Luther realized Aram had not left the SUV, and that his stern face was staring back at him over the shoulder of his seat up front. "'This is your last chance to leave,' Aram said. "'I know you must be considering it. "'But again, I must warn you that you won't survive long on your own. "'You can't outrun the storm now. "'It's already here. "'The soldiers in the river won't hold back the things it brings with it for long.' We stand a better chance of slipping by unnoticed behind the enemy's lines. How can you really know that? Luther's question seemed to amuse Aram. His brother popped open the door and slid out into a day so darkened by cloud cover it seemed dusk had fallen. Sias tossed him the keys, and Aram dragged the revolver he'd taken from Luther from a pocket before leaning into the vehicle to hold them out as offerings. I don't have time to explain, save to say that we know, Aram said. If that isn't enough, then take these, and good luck. Useful as it might be to have an outsider with us, you're free to go as you please. We are crossing the river now, whether you're with us or not. Luther did take them, but when Aram and the others slid into a small, aging boat crammed taut with their gear which had been hidden amongst the brush to the side of the road... Luther was with them. For all his doubt, his own uncertainty made him balk in the face of Aram's confidence. They took to the water, the sputtering little motor of the boat struggling to give them progress as the rain and thunder grew heavier overhead. Sandwiched between Sias and Saraya on the craft's middle bench like a prisoner under escort, all Luther could do as Morgan fussed over the motor and Aram called orders from the front was squint his eyes against the stinging moisture and focus in on the inky dark amongst the trees along the far shore. As his vision became less and less useful, Luther fell back upon his ears. Over the engine's whine and the thunder's roll, there was little to hear at first, but then, between spasms of chatter amongst Aram's companions, Luther heard the low thrum of helicopters overhead. Occasionally they were soaring east into the depths of the storm. Others went swiftly west, away from the great unknown. Luther could see no lights in these roiling clouds, and upward glances into the driving downpour did little but blind him. 
It was in those moments spent wondering at the onyx hue of the unnaturally dark afternoon sky that he realized the rain had a viscous quality to it, a sort of oily blackness which stained the collar of his already battered shirt where it poked out from beneath his jacket. There was a scent, too, something chemical, almost rusty, as of metal gone to seed. He had just enough time to wonder whether the storm's maddening effects were down to some form of poison when a flash out before them on the shoreline caught his attention, and their boat swung downriver to close in on the position. The light blinked out from that damnable murk in the scrub three more times, ensuring Aram's craft was still on course as they navigated by little more than the light of the sinking sun's ambient light far off west in the distant shred of wholesome sky the clouds had not yet conquered. A figure gradually slid into view as the tottering old boat drew in close, and before long the figure was knee-deep in the shallows, helping Aram to beach the craft and haul gear ashore. The others piled out, all heedless of getting their boots wet after the soak of the ride over, and Luther followed, still feeling as if pulled by an invisible leash. Aram and the man who'd signaled for them shared a scant few words before leading their charges up the hill through the scrub, following a well-worn path Luther imagined must have been cut for just such a blind passage. As he stumbled, the others marched with practiced ease, feeling their way where Luther had to guess. Even the seemingly frail Morgan, less steady than the others, moved with surety, and Luther had to strain to keep pace in the deepening shadow. They had drilled for this, surely. There seemed no other way. When at last they came out from the trees onto an open and partially flooded road, they grouped around Aram in the dark like troops awaiting orders. Luther strained to get a look at the sixth man in the dark, squinting against the rain but it was no use. He was but a silhouette to him, even now. Luther and Soraya, Aram began in tones swollen to match the roar of the storm. This is Brother Traven. He is to be trusted. He has been preparing the way for us east of the river these past few weeks. We follow him. Traven knows the location of the Federals and the enemy. The silhouette, Traven, half bowed in the dark but held his tongue as Aram pressed on, leaning in towards Luther to make certain every syllable rang true. The others know the plan, but Luther, you do not. We must be fast, but we must also be careful. Traven has hidden another vehicle for us ahead, but we go on foot the first twenty miles. We stand in the crossroads between two armies, and neither will hesitate to kill us if they see us. We can't afford to be seen or heard until after we've passed by the main host of the enemy. That means no lights at all. No noises beyond what's necessary. No falling behind. Understood? Luther nodded in the dark before realizing the gesture was probably lost on the others, then managed an unsteady yes. Aram proffered a vague shape Luther realized was a sturdy flashlight, which he took up in shaking hands. Keep that off. Keep your gun in your pocket unless I say otherwise. Move with the dark and beneath the noise. Do not be noticed. With that, Aram slapped Traven on the shoulder, spurring him into motion. Without another word, Traven stepped out of the circle and wove off southward down the roadside. The others fell into step behind him, with Luther bringing up the rear. They moved in a line hugging the trees along the road and often wading through ankle-deep runoff water, always conscious to keep their silhouettes masked by the trees. Still darkness reigned, and there had been no lights or commotion save that of unseen aircraft since they'd left the swollen waters of the Mississippi. But Aram's group clearly felt watched, and the feeling rubbed off upon Luther as they marched on. Soon they left the riverside road, and wound into the tangle of intermingled old buildings and suburbs that dotted the Illinois side of the border. It was then, coming into the presence of so many apartment buildings and dead streetlights, that Luther realized the power must be out. Though the lightning was so sparse as to be almost non-existent, the storm must have been wreaking more havoc than he realized. Like walking a midnight forest, 
the yards and fence lines of the town through which they crept were mere silhouettes through the sheeting rain, and what few glimpses of motion they caught cutting through alleys and crossing vacant lots always seemed to be buckling trees or billowing trash under the assault of the wind. More than a few times, one member or another of the line would stumble over curbs or fallen tree limbs in the blackness, but not once did they disobey the order to turn on no lights. There was a chill in the air which had nothing to do with the wind and the rain which lashed them. Through the premature night beneath the storm, the distant crack of gunfire could be heard now and then, and through all their stumbling, the thrumming of helicopter blades and roaring jet engines ebbed and flowed through the murk. Every one of the men was armed now that Luther had been handed back his gun, and yet they felt naked and helpless to a man, with none needing to hear the complaints of another to know they were vulnerable as rabbits in a wood of wolves. It was these military noises Luther most feared. After all, he'd seen firsthand that the rumors about executions and shoot-on-sight orders weren't just rumors during his flight from Chicago. The powers that be truly were mortified about some pathogen or disorder that affected those beneath the oily rain of that endless storm, and they meant to keep them contained. Given this fear, the path forged by Traven at the front confused Luther. As they went, the group hugged low retaining walls and hopped fences, steered through parking lots and shimmied down tight alleys between outbuildings in industrial parks. They never sought the total cover of the little stands of trees and patches of woodland which dotted the region, nor did they hug creek beds or the dense grass of occasional fields along overgrown roadsides. This seemed impractically risky to Luther, for it was, to his mind, far more preferable to twist an ankle on an unseen tree root in the dark than to be shot dead by military men who ruled the shadow with night vision and precision scopes. Several times the popping chorus of gunfire or the explosive impact of heavy ordnance found them nearby. Other traces of the ongoing fighting were distant, half-glimpsed muzzle flashes through tree lines, or the lights of searching soldiers in battered buildings. Once, Traven waved the others to a clumsy halt at the mouth of an alley, and they watched as the blinding lights of several armored personnel carriers and infantry fighting vehicles roared past down an adjacent road. Roof-mounted guns were firing at things in the shifting skies Luther couldn't see, but as he stared up after tracer rounds which flared red in the searing dark, he caught glimpses of shapes in the swirling cloud cover, vague forms which dove and grasped and slithered like serpents borne aloft on the wind. It was then, insane as it made him feel, that Luther began to take seriously the notion that they might well be hunted by other less natural things out here in the land beneath the storm. He'd always skirted the edge of the storm front, always been one step ahead of the unknown. Thus, he'd never had to truly entertain thoughts about what exactly was hiding behind it. Like most, he had put it down to a pathogen or a lawless uprising on the few occasions he'd been tempted to think on the matter at all. Even some Hollywood-grade zombie epidemic was more comprehensible than whatever this was. As they drew deeper and deeper into the thick of the chaos which unfolded around them, Luther and the others had to regularly stop to wipe grime from their eyes and pull hoods close around their faces as shields from the disgusting downpour. The oily black droplets which fell from the sky were more viscous than ever now and made streets slick and stone treacherous with slippery residue. Everything gleamed wet in the blackness whenever gunfire or strangled lightning lit the ground, and it became more and more difficult to determine direction amidst the confusion. Traven spent almost as much time deliberating and listening to half-heard noises through the gloom as he did leading, and yet all understood his caution was necessary, and moved only when he told them to do so. As the second hour came to a close, they found themselves in the thick of a relatively classy suburb walking streets which looked almost paradoxically calm amidst the thunder and struggle which had erupted elsewhere. Somehow this made Luther's heart race all the faster, for the thick rain was the only source of sound, 
and every noise they made scuffling past fence gates or squeezing through hedgerows grated on his ears. The others felt it, too, and they all scanned the blacked-out windows of stately homes as if expecting to be ambushed, united in wordless paranoia. Eventually, this silence began to weigh on them, for Aram grasped Traven by the shoulder and dragged them off their course. Something is here, Aram hissed through the tumult, just loud enough for Luther to catch the words. Something dangerous. We need to hole up somewhere. As if in sync with his warning, there was a distant, subtle crashing in the woods which ringed this half of the suburb. It was a small thing, nothing more than a startled group of deer might make bustling through bush and branch. But somehow, beneath all that deathly quiet, doom seemed to lurk behind those sounds. Aram took the lead, then, careening away from the fence they'd been hugging and toward the large house whose backyard they'd been creeping through. The building boasted a big wooden deck along the rear of the home, overlooking the woods, and it was for this Aram moved. He ducked under the support beams, crouching behind stored landscaping supplies and old tools tucked up against the struts, and his followers did their best to mimic him. They took up positions close to the ground, letting the deepest shadows of the low space beneath the deck do the work for them. Aram looked around once more, seeming to check the others were well hidden. Then, breath held against searching ears they all imagined must be seeking them out, they waited. Sprawled flat in the mud and muck, Luther could see little. As ever, only the ambient glow of the dead sky behind the clouds gave them light by which to see. The tracer rounds and muffled explosions of combat were heard, but not seen, and suddenly their absence was more cause for fear than their presence had been. In the heat of the obscured firefights through which they'd crept, Luther had jumped at each crack and bang. Now he yearned for them, and his spirit sank a little deeper with each minute that passed without them. Though he gripped the little revolver hard, it did nothing to shore up his courage. If the shrieking missiles of mighty empires didn't phase whatever was out there, he thought it unlikely a twenty-two would fare much better. The others bristled in the dark, making Luther flinch before doing the same. Shotgun and rifle barrels, tucked under arms or slung over shoulders until now, slid forth to point down the yard towards the fence line and the tangled woods beyond. Aram, a feeble shadow puppet in all that grim obscurity, held up a deterring hand like an officer urging restraint. Luther had just enough time to recall that old line about not firing until you'd seen the whites of the enemy's eyes, before something threw itself over the fence and splashed down in the grimy grass of the open yard. It was a shifting shape in ink against the midnight of the grass. Its features were blurred by the dark and the rain, but even through the tenebrous interference of the storm, all could see it was tall, some six feet taller than the six-foot fence over which it leapt. Jagged, asymmetrical horns or antlers swept side to side as it snorted and sniffed the wet air, its great lungs rasping and rumbling with every breath. Towering upon two lean, stilt-like legs, it leaned back with bony arms outstretched, swaying and wavering like a drunk catching his balance. There came a low, threatening groan, almost pained, the braying growl of a starving beast on the hunt. Another shape scaled the fence, then another. Soon a pack of the things cavorted and jostled along the edge of the yard, shoving each other as often as they scoured the air. Some were broad and hefty, and some were lean and spindly as the first. Some towered and some capered low to the ground in the shadows, chittering like rabid animals. Some boasted bent legs like the hooved limbs of equines or ungulates, and others stomped on leathery pads like those of elephants. Their eyes glittered in the dark here and there, catching the gleam of distant flashes through the artificial night, and it was only after nearly a minute of suffering, shaking hands, and straining eyes that Luther realized some of the things had more than one pair of them. 
There was no telling exactly how long the pack lingered there. Perhaps five minutes, by Luther's reckoning, but he'd be the first to admit his own panicked tension probably made the wait seem longer than it was. Their lingering was only broken after a particularly vicious grapple between two of the things, when one of the smaller of their number skittered away in fear up the yard, dangerously close to the shadows beneath the deck. It kept its back to the hidden group of travelers, with its many eyes always locked upon its packmates, ever wary of more treachery. The hunched little creature was a head shorter than a man, and hobbled on its hands like a spindly ape. When it finally stopped fleeing, it stood still only a moment before scenting the air once more, keen now, as it tasted a smell it might well have missed down by the fence line. Barely visible in the dark, the guns around Luther bristled again, ready to react. At that moment, when all seemed still against the onslaught of the rain, a shriek ripped through the clamor of the storm from elsewhere in the neighborhood. The heads of the gathered things from the woods snapped to attention in unison, and the first who'd come over the fence, their leader, perhaps, bounded off with great loping strides towards the source of the sound. The others went with it, scurrying to keep up as it leapt fences and scaled slick walls at speed, moving through backyards further down the road. The little one brought up the rear, not bothering to throw a glance back toward the prey it might well have smelled, whatever mind it possessed entrapped by the promise of a new hunt. Aram made a break for the fence the second the pack was out of sight. Luther and the others scaled the thing, some struggling more than others on the slickened wood, and then bounded down into the woods. Branches grazed and tripped them in the dark, and several of them caught nasty gashes along their faces and hands, crashing through scrub in the blackness. They came upon a swollen creek streaked with the grime of the unnatural rain, and forded it in a tightly packed mob, never once daring to speak amongst themselves. They dodged fallen tree limbs, swept downstream in the flood, navigating mostly by sensation and sound, and held their guns high, scanning the gloom as if their eyes might adjust and make them feel safer in the impenetrable blackness of the wood. Only when they'd slipped and slid up the opposite bank out of the waist-deep stream did they stop to speak, and even then it was only for a moment. I'd guess we're past the government men, Aram panted. It'll all be the dreamers' soldiers now. We'll trace the creek east a little. I think there's a spot where we can bank out of the woods into another neighborhood. We won't want to stay in the trees for long. As if to accentuate his point, a bellowing bray reverberated through the thin strip of forest lining the creek from afar, spurring them into motion again. The noise had likely come up from far downstream, but that did nothing to quell the terror in it. The cry was something like the angry bleeding of a charging ram or bull, but wavered, as if whatever made it were struggling to control its vocal cords. Luther's mind, scattered and jarred as it was by all that had happened, was overcome by the image of the towering hunter from the fence line lurching through the trees, gnarled hands sweeping low in search of prey hiding in the undergrowth. Every snapped twig and disturbed puddle made him jump, and he could tell he was not the sole member of the group who felt hunted beneath the boughs. Only when they finally veered off the banks of the creek and pushed out into the open backyard of another house did he feel somewhat safe again. Traven was back in the lead now, seeming to recognize the area. They fell into line and moved fast, rounding the house and coming to the street, where they all kept low and hugged a row of trees which lined the sidewalk. The rain was so heavy now they might not have needed such precautions, for visibility was so poor each member of the group would be hard-pressed to see the man in front of him. They hugged discernible landmarks in the haze and pushed on, soaked to the bone and desperate for an escape which was still miles away over deadly ground. Sound still welled up to haunt them as they moved, for screams and roars and less describable noises found their ears often muffled as they were by the storm. Glass shattered, metal roofing was torn, 
and heavy strides thrummed upon the wet earth. The street beside which they walked, which was now an ankle-deep stream of oily water, was splashed across by a running form in the murk as they passed. So thick was the mist and the rain that Luther saw nothing of the runner. He merely heard their clumsy sprint through the muck, and counted his blessings as whatever it was moved past without incident down the roadway. Though he could not be certain of anything any more, he had the distinct feeling that clattering creature had been running on far too many legs. Traven soon steered them off the road and across an empty field, and amidst the tall grass their eyes became all but useless. Every tiny animal skittering through the growth made Luther jump, and he kept himself as close to the others as was possible. Soraya, just in front of him in the line, seemed tall enough that he might be able to see over the grass, and yet, with the storm as fierce as it was, Luther wondered whether that would help at all. Getting lost in the tangle would be disastrous, and as the man at the back of the line, Luther had no one bringing up the rear behind him to set him on the right path. Fortunately for him, just as panic began to set in, they spilled from the field onto the tattered asphalt of a parking lot, falling into pursuit as Traven and Arm waved them into a run. They sprinted across the open expanse of the lot, weaving past a couple dumpsters and a few dozen cars which loomed up out of the haze to startle them. They came up against a large brick building and hugged the wall along the side of the lot. As they progressed around the structure, they came upon an aged old playground, and Luther realized the place was a school. The place yawned dark and empty, its broad glass front seeming to open up like a mouth to taunt them as they slipped past beneath the onslaught of the rain. They had slid by in single file at a jogging pace when Luther, winded and lagging behind, caught a glimmer of motion amongst the shadows behind that grimy glass. He stopped in his tracks then, stunned, heedless of the others sloshing away across the drowned lot. Luther couldn't look away. It was the first thing he'd truly seen out here beneath the storm. Everything else had been little more than ghostly sounds caught through the intervening dark, or dancing silhouettes in the glistening damp of the rain. Though it stood in shadow, this was not a silhouette, and the sight of it seemed to grip Luther tight and demand he pause a moment to try and rationalize what he was seeing. It was pressed against the plate glass of the school's lobby, overlooking the concrete stairs to the lot. The thing was huge. Its shivering bulk covered fully half the entryway to the building, and had he not been so taken by the awful form of the thing, Luther might have had cause to wonder how it had even crammed itself indoors. It was a mass of filthy fur and quaking legs, a mammalian centipede without the benefit of a solid torso or thorax to keep it steady. The body contracted and writhed like a serpent, thumping against the windows, and the many-hooved, asymmetrical legs tapped and skittered along the slick tile floor in a desperate attempt to keep pace. Open sores bled black blood which stained the glass and matted the thing's tattered fur. Heads, mostly the deformed skulls of goats or elk or deer, but occasionally the sagging faces of human beings, lolled lifeless from the flanks of the bloated body on tapering necks. Every once in a while, a few of these heads would jolt up as if startled, and even through the glass, he could hear the muffled keening of many distorted voices competing against the rumbling thunder. A particularly loud thump sounded as a fold of the thing's writhing body slammed up against a pane of the sturdy glass, and it buckled and cracked beneath the blow. Through the perforated window, shrieking yowls like the manic vocalizations of foxes rang out across the silent lot. The bleeding of deer and the whining of bull elk were a part of the chorus. Luther strained, lost in his attempt to recognize what he'd been staring at, as he picked up hints of warbled speech in the mix. Hints he could not help but compare to agonized human voices. A big hand clasped hard around his arm, making him jump. 
Luther turned to see Soraya standing over him, eyes on the school's face as he caught sight of what the others had either missed or ignored. He'd been missed, perhaps. Soraya had doubled back to see where he'd gone. Soraya wasn't paralyzed by the thing, though. He tugged, and Luther had no strength but to stumble along after him as he ran off in pursuit of the rest of the line through the mists. Another crackling break in the glass sounded behind them, and any icy uncertainty which might have remained in Luther was dispelled as panic replaced petrified awe. Close on Soraya's heels, Luther fled up a row of cars at a full sprint before almost crashing into the rest of the line as they pushed across a street into another dense patch of woods. Much as the crashing of glass and the swelling of the chorus of pained bleats and screeches far off behind them weighed upon Luther, he needn't have worried. The strip of woods through which they ran lasted only a few minutes. Before long, they had spilled out onto an overgrown gravel path, along which was parked an aged red van. Traven dragged open the driver's side door, and before long, the whole group had tossed in their belongings and piled inside. Aram sat up front beside Traven, while the others crammed into the back rows. Luther, sitting in the middle amidst mounds of packed supplies and equipment, felt almost weightless as the van shuddered into motion and rolled forth down the road through the deepening dark, elated by their escape, but simultaneously aware that they were driving deeper into the storm. Night was likely falling beyond the muffling mask of the storm clouds overhead and the accompanying drop in the already poor visibility made the glare of headlights painful to look on as they tore off the gravel road and sped eastward down a wooded lane. What about the dreamer spawn? Won't we be seen? It was Soraya, leaning forward over Luther's seat to better be heard by Aram up front. His eyes were wide, and his big hand gripped tight to the edge of Luther's seat. Cool and collected as the others were, Luther couldn't help but notice Soraya didn't share their calm. We will be, whether we drive or not, Aram said. Moving on foot was a precaution against soldiers. Around monsters, it's far better to be fast than to be hidden. We were fortunate to escape the hunters today, and it was only by blind luck we lived long enough to flee. Even unseen, you can be heard. Even unheard, you can be tasted on the wind. It doesn't do to rely on stealth in a world which isn't your own anymore. That seemed to quell Soraya, and he sank back into the shadows at the rear of the van with Sias and Morgan. The sage Morgan muttered something to Soraya, something Luther couldn't hear. Words of assurance or comfort, perhaps. Then silence fell, and the hum of the engine and the rumbling of the road were all that remained to comfort him. Luther stared out the window at the half-formed columns of trees rolling past, considered questions he didn't dare yet ask, and waited. Four. Borderland. The next four hours were an exercise in containing panic. Though the van's flight began on small back roads, it soon wound onto relatively trafficked state highways, where the terrain became more open and the headlights shone further ahead through the gloom. This was, perhaps, safer than having trees so tightly flank the sides of the roadway, since any ambush or pursuit through the woods would now be more plain to see. And yet, Luther couldn't bring himself to think of it that way. At least in the thickets he'd been able to ignore the notion they were in danger. 
He could hang his head or tap the door with his anxious fingers and pretend for a few tense moments that they weren't surrounded on all sides by the unknowable. Now, with the trees often fifty or sixty yards back from the van, he was frequently reminded the world beyond the window was not a happy one. Frequently, a mob of vaguely person-shaped figures would shamble from trees or storm-battered buildings and make a loping pursuit of the van as it sped past. They were oblong and asymmetrical things, as the hunters scouring the suburban backyard had been, and they moved with a speed and agility which would have been deadly had they been fleeing on foot. The worst of these was a sighting Luther made about an hour into the drive, when he saw a group of haggard people in filthy clothing burst from the parking lot of an apartment complex in the dark with hands waving and voices raised in desperate fear. They clearly wanted the driver to stop, and yet Aram and Traven up front made no sign that they'd noticed them. As the van sped by and the headlights left the trailing survivors in shadow, Luther caught the flurry of motion as a misshapen hunting pack emerged from the same apartment complex and closed in with the stranded stragglers on the roadside. Though their screams were too distant for Luther to hear them, that didn't mean his imagination didn't create equally horrible noises to score the slaughter he knew must be playing out behind them in the blackness while they fled. Cars left dark and derelict along the roadside, perhaps abandoned when the storm had overtaken them and made visibility difficult, had to be swerved past as they loomed forth from the downpour. Though the rainfall was not quite so dense now as it had been early on, it was still fierce, and the soft red gleam of inactive brake lights were poor security indeed. The oily residue deposited by the spray left the windows and windshields slick and streaked with grime, further throttling their vision. More than a few sharp turns and banks onto the bumpy shoulder of the road nearly ended in crashes. Yet, slowing down was not an option. The frequency with which awful shapes lurched and leapt from the dark to rake at the van with outstretched claws was too much. The woods and towns past which they drove were alive with the braying song of a million mad beasts, and the death that terrible music promised was too much to ignore. Occasionally, other headlights flared out of the dark and passed them down the highway, always headed eastward in the other direction. Every lonely vehicle's passage left Luther more and more certain they were driving into the jaws of something from which there would be no escape. Though the westbound cars didn't have much better chances than they did, at least the occupants felt they were headed away from the danger. Perhaps more terrible than the animalistic shrieking or the loping hunting packs or the writhing shapes of stranger beasts in the murk outside were the things that were occasionally glimpsed in the dull flashes of lightning which struggled to illuminate the black clouds of the night sky overhead. If Luther was particularly unfortunate, he'd find himself looking through the window at the moment of the flash. Several times he spotted vast, confusing shapes rising up to break distant horizons, dwarfing buildings and communications towers in the rolling hills of the countryside. They were mere silhouettes at that distance, of course, as so many of the things glimpsed through the storm had been. And yet those silhouettes moved and walked and bent like mountains strolling the land. Some moved on vast, stilted legs, and others seemed to slide like slugs among the ruins of the world they feasted upon. It was a glimpse of one of these giants that drove Luther to scrunch shut his eyes and wait in silent blindness through the rest of the ride. As he glimpsed it in the sudden flash of the storm's muted heat lightning, he could not help but discern a vast, horned head as it rotated to look back in his direction. Tracing, he knew, a distant set of lonely headlights carving their way across a darkened landscape. None of these giants ever pursued them directly, as the hunting packs had done. Then again, perhaps that was only because they'd all been far away. Perhaps they'd had better targets available to them. Whatever the case might be, the giants were just as wrong as the smaller beasts which haunted and hunted the trees and shattered houses. 
They were all outsiders, things with no place walking the world they walked or seeing the sights they saw. It wouldn't do to dwell on those outsiders now, trapped in the speeding van as it whipped through the center of their newly conquered domain. Hours passed, and at length the night's drive ended long past midnight, if the van's inbuilt clock was to be trusted. Only with the approach of dawn threatening them did Aram and Traven agree to find a spot to bed down. They were, as it turned out, about ten miles west of Louisville, Kentucky. They'd carved across Illinois and most of Indiana in the darkness, and the world around them had grown calm. This was, Aram said, because most of the people here had already been consumed, and the greater portion of the dreamers' servants were moving westward to seek the choicest morsels. There were likely hangers-on in Louisville, though, populous as it was, so it would be best to break here and pass through with cautious speed tomorrow morning. Their gas was dangerously low. Moreover, they'd have to abandon the car soon. The military had, Traven claimed, blown the bridges across the Ohio River before withdrawing into the west. They'd need to sneak through the area and find another ride after they'd gotten some rest and crossed the river into Kentucky, and to risk stopping at all, they would need a place to hide. Traven had many such potential hiding places picked out, and Morgan pitched in with his own options from the back row after they'd worked out exactly where they were on the maps they carried. Morgan, suggesting a long abandoned set of distribution warehouses near Georgetown, Indiana, ended up winning out. Aram said this would be their safest bet, since there had likely been no one present when the storms had swept in. Thus, the hunting packs and other beasts enthralled to the dreamer would have little motivation to linger there. They'd mostly be long gone in search of greener pastures to ravage, leaving their group space in silence to bed down and hide through the dull light of the day. The van wound through two or three miles of industrial park to reach the place. Most of it was aged, and the majority of the tottering factories and shipping facilities had been shuttered long ago. Amplifying the stifling somberness of the decaying industrial sector was the silence, for the rain had slowed to a steady patter, and the cries and bleats of alien voices in the dark were nowhere to be heard. Sirens, shrieks, and gunshots, which had occasionally flared up as they roared past one town or another, were absent. Luther supposed he should find this heartening. After all, if there was nothing to make noises, there was nothing to find them while they rested. Still, he couldn't convince himself the quiet was a good thing. The plants are already starting to warp under the influence of the dreamer's blood, Morgan commented from the rear. Is the area safe? Luther hadn't even thought to look closely upon the trees and shrubs themselves since beginning to look from the windows again. The dark scrub pines and towering weeds which choked old fence lines and ate crumbling walls in the industrial park had been the least of his worries. He'd been scanning for things which might lurk or creep behind them. Now, focusing in on the vegetation, he suddenly knew what had felt so wrong. He knew why no insects chirped in the warm, muggy air outside, and no calm had found him since they came into the forest of derelict buildings. He knew why the place had seemed so hostile. Overgrown is how he'd have dismissed them at first. Now, beneath the van's fleeting headlights, they seemed more than overgrown. The foliage was thick and lush, far thicker than any summer growth could warrant, and the hues of the leaves and vines were all wrong. They were dark and waxen stiff with a gluttonous, lifeless quality Luther wouldn't have believed possible for plants that weren't plastic. And yet, lifeless as they looked, they seemed to sway and ripple in the windless drizzle. We have a while yet before they are fully transformed, Aram answered. When the sky clears, that's when we'll know we're under the dreamer's influence. We can't know where the edge of that influence is but I'd be surprised if it's crept west past Lexington yet. 
The mountain will make the dreamer struggle for every inch of ground. Traven parked the vehicle in a stand of thick grass which had eaten a gravel pull-off hole. The blades twisted and bobbed as the group offloaded their gear, took up their stored fuel, and siphoned the last of the slim tank from the van into the cans. Luther found himself watching it warily as the others covered the van in foliage they ripped up from the roadside. While he shied away from the growth, they seemed to shrug off the strange liveliness it displayed and cut through it with knives to bury their ride. Only when the van was nearly invisible to the tangle did Morgan take the lead and show them along a winding route he'd picked out from satellite images before the trip east had begun. The path was a jungle now, and the soupy black mud which had built up after days of putrid downpour made it slow going, but eventually they stumbled their way to a vast garage door in the dark. It stood half open, a yawning, rusty maw which creaked and groaned with age. Aram was the first in, rifle leading, and the others followed with guns raised and ready. Alien as the revolver still felt in his hand, Luther felt a little less naked creeping through the shadows with it drawn. The dark within gradually formed itself into a towering storage or sorting space as their eyes adjusted. It was floored in concrete, and the rusted roof dripped into stagnant puddles here and there upon the ground, lending the place the damp air of a natural cavern. Rickety walkways of corroded metal hung from the ceiling overhead, groaning as their weight strained against aged bolts and joints. Much as the intrepid group tried to stifle their voices and footsteps, every noise they raised echoed fiercely in the blackness, Submerging all this in the clamor of white noise was the patter of rain against the old roof, which was fortunately amplified by the same vaulted ceilings that carried the voices of the intruders. Luther tried for some time to determine what the purpose of the vast building had been as they patrolled the space, to grasp what exactly had been stored or sorted here. There were two gigantic mounds of what looked to be metal shavings beneath the walkways on either side of the room, and there was a battered old claw bucket hanging from rigging overhead, a massive parody of an arcade crane game. There were also several gaps in the concrete floor where machinery or sorting funnels had been ripped up and hauled away. He supposed it was part of a foundry or steel mill but he didn't know enough about metalwork or manufacture to know anything for certain. Still, wondering about the mundane purpose of this sidelined structure in a forgotten part of a rotting city distracted him from thoughts of the impossible things which awaited him beyond the warehouse's looming doors. Aram eventually settled them up on the walkways, where they spread several bedrolls and ate a modest meal from cold cans. There were doors set into the walls up here, and passing through them brought one out onto mirrored walkways which spanned the spaces between adjacent warehouses. Thus, Aram figured the walkways served two purposes. They gave them a sweeping vantage point from which to watch the warehouse floor, and offered them an escape hatch should they need to flee on short notice. Uncomfortable as the metal mesh of the walkways was, Luther doubted he'd get much rest. The creaking of the old metal beneath him every time he shifted his weight seemed to assure him of that. Besides, the tumult outside and the racing of his troubled mind wouldn't allow such luxuries. So it was that when Aram offered to take the first watch and asked for a volunteer to join him, Luther rose and strode down the walkway in his brother's wake. They moved out to the central walkway that bridged the gap between the two sides of the warehouse, and Aram directed Luther to sit back to back with him, that they might watch both entrances at once. Before they got settled in, Aram passed off an old hunting rifle to Luther, showing him the function of the bolt and demonstrating the use of the sights. Then both sat down opposite each other, the rain drumming at a constant rhythm as the sky faintly brightened with the cloud-strangled dawn outside. I haven't had the occasion to tell you, Aram said in hushed tones, but we're all carrying silver rounds. 
they seem to be better able to injure things the dreamer has corrupted. It still isn't a sure thing, but it's better to have it. The rifle is loaded with silver. You should keep it. Use it when the enemy isn't entirely human. Save your revolver for looters or soldiers. Thanks for the heads up, Luther said. The old sarcasm was there, not lost on Aram, despite the intervening years. We've been with you the whole time, Aram said. If we'd been attacked, you would have had silver shot whether you were carrying it or not. Luther had to grant him that. Besides, unless you've been hunting or sport shooting up in Chicago, you're probably a pretty lousy shot, Aram told him. I would let you shoot a while if we could afford to make the noise. As it is, it's better to stay quiet. They sat in silence for a long moment. Luther was trying to find the words he needed to ask what was happening, to look for answers Aram hadn't had the time or patience to give before. He eventually settled on a roundabout approach, one which felt less direct and dangerous to him. Why silver? I can't say, Aram replied. It's been handed down that it works, and it does. Maybe it has something to do with silver's mythical importance as a lunar metal. The enemy came down from among the stars, if legends are to be believed. Perhaps something from beyond can only be killed by something else from beyond. Another silence, this one less lengthy. What does it want? This dreamer, you've called it. It was Aram's turn to think. Luther was left in thought of his own for half a minute, trying to imagine the look on his brother's unseen face as he weighed what he should say. It's homesick. Aram said at last. It did not come here by choice. The enemy came down in exile. It slept for a long, long time, dreaming of home. It can't go back, though, not yet. So it seeks to replicate the world it remembers here. It will use the material it has to work with. It will bend the life of our world to better resemble what it remembers of home. Silence fell again. Luther was summoning up more questions when Aram spoke, having marshaled his thoughts. That's what most of the things in the storm are. They are people. They are animals and plants. Life the dreamer has won over to its service and changed to suit his vision. The black ichor in the rain is its blood, or that's what it's called, at least. They change when they drink it just as the plants outside are changing. So it's an infection of some kind, spread by this blood? I suppose it is, in a sense, Aram conceded, but the blood only opens one's thoughts to the dreamer. Anything that happens afterwards is voluntary. You must submit to be changed. Luther considered that. Try as he might, he could not square that away with the lopsided, misshapen things which had haunted the outskirts of St. Louis. Though that chaos seemed an age ago now from where they sat hundreds of miles east, it had been mere hours ago, and the image of those twisted organisms writhing and hunting in the murk was fresh. Awful as the sight had been, it was engraved in Luther's mind, vivid as if the things had been glimpsed minutes ago just outside the warehouse. Even summoning up those cruel shapes to the forefront of his thoughts revolted him. How would anything submit to that? Aram sighed. Luther couldn't shake the feeling Aram had anticipated each question, and yet this one seemed to be the one his brother had dreaded most. He couldn't see the lean man's dark expression, but he heard the dire tone of it well enough when at last Aram spoke. There's a reason why certain people stole away money and time to escape from their day-to-day -day lives by base jumping or mountain climbing, why an executive might decide to run marathons and train martial arts in his sorely limited spare time, Aram began, the words coming slow. There's a reason why some soldiers returned from deployment miss it. 
They'll say they miss the camaraderie and the feeling of interconnection they had with the people they served with under such stressful conditions, and that's partially true. But they also miss the intensity of it. Arm stopped a moment to gather his thoughts, and Luther didn't interrupt. Modernity is comfortable. A man can live his entire life within the system we've built and never go without warm baths and warmer meals. He can survive maladies and deformities that would have killed him had he been left to his own devices without modern medicine to heal him. He can slide through his whole existence driving, sitting, and flying without ever knowing the strength of which his body is capable. He can walk, but he is never forced to run. Hardship will find him, true, but it will always be the hardship of loss, Arm continued. He will suffer through long work hours to gain a trinket he wants and lose time. He will suffer a breakup and lose love. He'll experience the death of a friend and lose companionship, but he will never lose comfort, not entirely, not so long as he follows the rules of the world to which he was born, as long as he obeys his betters, shows up on time, and pays his dues to the distant state. He will be left to enjoy the soft glow of his television from his bed each night. He will be allowed enough funds to escape into a game every weekend and imagine he is a character more powerful than he is. He will not freeze in his home. Even the working poor, in our lands at least, have more access to escape from the losses they suffer day to day than those of any age prior to our own and they are mostly happy to bend the knee and live by the rule of others to be given that escape. You're saying comfort corrupts? I'm saying comfort, especially escape, is a drug, Aram replied. Like most, it isn't necessarily an inherent evil. Even a wild wolf basks in the sun on a chill day and enjoys the warmth just as a Mongol nomad probably unwinds with his family by the hot coals within his tent after a brutal day herding on the steppe. It's only in excess that it becomes deadly. As it stands, most in our civilization are addicts in an opium den from which they can't escape. That's why a soldier, if he's particularly vital, might miss a war zone, even if he was desperate to leave the whole time he was stuck there. It's why a bored traveler might save and train for years to attempt the summit of Everest, even though they know they might die in the attempt. There's something real there at the extreme edge of human experience. The little social niceties and obligations and observations that have to be made at work or back home are stripped away. All that's left is you and the people alongside you, and the threat you have to overcome even if that threat is relatively small. Say, with skydiving, the participant still feels danger, and thus overcoming is ecstasy for them. It is a reminder that they are alive, a reminder that they are capable of struggling and winning that struggle. It shows them they are still able to run. I think, given all my options, I'd have preferred not to be forced to run. Most would agree. Arm said. Luther detected no scorn in that. Maybe sadness, but no scorn. Most, even given a taste of struggle, are bred to the new world, Arm went on. They are creatures of comfort. They are not at all upset by the lack of freedom or agency. They are quite happy to play by the rules and enjoy what's been given to them. I might not feel the same, but that's not really the point. Those aren't the people the dreamer speaks to. Those aren't the people it wants. Low thunder rolled overhead. Luther looked up and realized the milky, almost sickly glow beyond the tiny gaps in the roof had grown stronger. It has an easier time with beasts and plants, of course, Arm said. But sickly as humankind has become, there are still more than a few who will hear its call and answer it. Luther brooded on that a while, but the whole of the talk had dredged up more questions from the depths of his mind than it had answers. Of these, the most salient gnawed the deepest, 
and he could not help but ask it in the awful half-light of the dim morning in that dingy warehouse. You agree with the assessment, Luther said. The dreamers, I mean. Our father did, too. Never as openly, but I remember as well as you do the way he talked. I suspect he shared a great deal more with you. You were always closer to him. But why stop the dreamer at all if you feel the same? Because the dreamer's end goal is not mine, Aram said. We, humanity I mean, are merely a tool to the dreamer. It does not want to return our world and the things in it to some harsher, more real age. It merely wishes to go home. Since it cannot, it will bring home here. It will use us to burn down what we've built, and in the process, forge us into things which better fit the image of the Deadlands. Deadlands? It's the place to which the dreamer pulls its followers, the place it will replicate here if it wins. Deadlands is the name my order has given it. It is the mirrored image of wherever it came from. We'll see it for ourselves before long. The light outside means the storm holding back the tide is breaking here. By the time we leave this warehouse, the world beyond these walls will be very different than the one we know. Again, silence fell, and this time Aram seemed to have finished talking. For a full twenty minutes they sat like that, back to back and brooding. Then Luther spoke, mustering one last question amidst the pattering clatter upon the roof. The call of the mountain is what Dad used to call it, Luther said. Your order. What do you serve? Aram thought a while before answering. We serve the earth, the mountain. That's all you need to know. Luther heard Aram turn behind him, the leather of his old coat creaking with the motion. Luther followed suit, and they looked over their shoulders at each other in the gloom for a long time. Aram's eyes almost black in the low light. His expression was not haughty, distant, or agitated, though. It was merely tired. I promise to tell you more, if we survive this. Luther nodded. Deal. The two turned back toward their respective doors and resumed their vigil, but the watch lasted only a minute before Aram spoke again. You should go sleep, he said. We will reach the mouth sometime tonight, assuming everything goes according to plan. This is the last chance we'll have to rest before we get there. Luther almost protested. He almost asked what this mouth they kept referencing was. But the weight of the day had crashed down upon him in those last few moments, and despite the nervous tension he felt, his eyes struggled to remain open. He rose, the metal creaking as he went. You sure you don't need a little sleep yourself? I can't, Aram answered, shifting around on the walkway so he could more easily glance back and forth between the two entryways along the ground floor. He never looked up, and Luther never pushed it by asking further. He simply crossed to the platform where the others had bedded down, laid out the rifle Aram had given him beside his bedroll, and slipped quickly into sleep. Five. Enter the Deadlands. Luther's sleep was dark and dreamless. Thus, when he was jolted from his slumber by a light kick to the arm, he jerked upright almost wholly awake, unburdened by the evaporating wisps of troublesome nightmares or visions. He was entirely in the moment, and he saw the others were standing alert with weapons readied looking toward the side door to the warehouse along the raised walkway. As Luther himself rose upon shaky legs, 
he silently corrected himself. It wasn't the others. Not all of them, at least. They were short a man. It took him a moment in the shadows, but within a few seconds he'd puzzled it out. Where's Morgan? Luther asked the question of Aram, who stood right beside him, likely the one who'd given him the kick. Aram didn't give voice to an answer, though. He just pointed towards the door set into the warehouse's grungy wall. It hung open, the world having grown darker outside. There was no rain, though, no gale or storm to speak of which could have eaten away the meager daylight. Had he slept all through the day? Then the distant echo of voices came back to him. Luther could make out several, and all seemed shrill and raised in fearful anger. He couldn't quite catch what was being said, something about sneaking and stealing. He's only been on his own a few minutes, Soraya whispered, his own eyes cast towards Aram. The warehouse next door was empty when I stepped in with him. How? Aram held up a hand to silence him. He motioned to Sias, who sidled over to better hear Aram's hushed murmur. Get the rifle ready. You'll need to be quick. It sounds like there's more than one. Sias nodded, grim face almost eager in the shifting shade. He fixed a bulky cylinder to the end of the rifle he snatched up. A home-board silencer, Luther thought, and then took up a position next to the doorway. We'll need to be quick, Arm whispered, facing each of the others in turn. Whoever's got Morgan has already made too much noise. The dreamers' kind hunt in the dark. We can't afford to linger after we've killed them. The second the shots are fired, we wind back through this warehouse and make for the river through the woods across the road. Morgan will have to catch up. Understood? Everyone nodded. Luther, suddenly stricken with a clarity he wouldn't have thought possible, quickly crouched to bundle up his bedroll and toss on his pack. Taking care not to make noise, he followed Sias and the others as they pushed through the door onto the exterior walkway that connected to the neighboring warehouse. The door to this one was open, too, and it came into view just in time for Luther to see Sias, crouching low and moving with a soft steadiness that belied his stout build, push into the opposite warehouse. Aram was with him, shoulder to shoulder. Luther like the others who just kept silent and watched from the bridge between the buildings, hands clenched around the unfamiliar rifle as he observed. Luther couldn't see what was happening on the ground floor very well. After all, Traven stood beside him, and Soraya's towering form crowded the bridge before him. Luther had to lean out over the rail to see past him through the doorway. Even then, Luther's eyes struggled to make out shapes through the metal mesh of the walkways and the miring shadow of the building's interior. What he could see was that a group of vague figures gesticulated and shouted down there. There were three and one, three strangers surrounding Morgan, Luther assumed. The shouting continued, clearer to him now. Luther made out that one of the strangers was demanding Morgan tell him how he'd found them, Another cut in, saying something about taking him back to the others. Morgan, speaking softly, was inaudible, but whatever he said in response was not to the liking of the strangers. They sounded scattered and frayed, shaken as most would be under the circumstances. So shaken, in fact, that they seemed not to realize just how loud they'd gotten. Sias was now laying upon the walkway in there, looking down his barrel at the strangers as the shouting below grew more and more combative. The surrounded figure was shoved by one of the men, but shrank back defensively with an arm outstretched to his side. Morgan was armed, perhaps, brandishing a pistol without aiming it at the others, desperate to avoid noise. They too were armed, though. They'd been pointing weapons Morgan's way all this time, now the situation seemed disastrous, and time slowed to a cruel and perfidious crawl as Luther anticipated shots ringing out. Why had Sias not taken the shot? Was he worried he'd spur the strangers to start shooting? Was he not confident he could hit them all in quick succession? 
So keenly was Luther staring at the half-visible altercation on the floor of the building that Sias and Aram had become little more than outlines in the foreground to him. It was only as panic began to rear its ugly head that Luther looked down to see what they were doing, desperately hoping he'd see Sias twitching as he pulled the trigger. He had a split second to realize just how mad that was that he'd be longing to see a killing shot delivered so soon after being afraid of the noise of a gun going off. The rabid destruction and looming unknowns of the world behind the wall of the storm would do that, he supposed. Then, Aram's slow and steady motion caught his eyes, and his mind had to race to piece together what was happening. Sias was no longer looking down his barrel at the strangers. His gaze seemed to be following Aram's outstretched hand toward the ceiling, invisible to Luther and the others from where they lurked outside the doorway. Aram hissed something, a thing Luther saw more than heard, and the pair began a sluggish and immeasurably cautious crawl back through the door. Soraya, Traven, and Luther made way for them, but the other two were as confused as Luther had been. The shouts still crescendoed on the floor of the adjoining warehouse, making Luther desperate that someone do something, that someone intervene. Then, slow and purposeful as a spring thaw, he saw them, the things coming down from the ceiling. In the half-light, glimpsed through that open doorway, they seemed almost like vines or serpents, waving and shivering as they slid down into view from on high. Noiseless and glistening with a slick mucus or ichor, slender spines and bony ridges crept out and sank back into the shifting flesh as the things moved, making it impossible to discern their true outline. In a surreal moment of clarity, Luther recalled watching a slug extend itself with slow, methodical purpose over a gap in a sidewalk as a child how its strange, squamous body shuddered and rippled as it reached for the opposite edge. These things moved just the same, and as Aram wordlessly pushed past and rallied the others towards the door back into their own building, Luther couldn't take his eyes from them. Methodical as they were, though, they revealed they were more than capable of speed when the shouting became panicked and frenzied down below and the first shot rang out. He never saw what happened. Luther had backed too far down the walkway to see the floor of the neighboring warehouse from where he stood. He had been too transfixed by the alien things which hung from the ceiling to think about Morgan and the strangers again until the shots were fired. Luther would later come to think they'd spotted the things clinging unseen to the shadows of the roof above them and tried to shoot them. Perhaps Morgan had gotten a shot off. Luther would never know. From where he stood, all he saw was the snapping strike of the bony slug things down towards the unseen floor. The whole thing was unbelievably quiet. All Luther heard after those first three cracks and the initial cries of alarm was the omnipresent roll of far distant thunder and the faint sound of the stifled wind. Whatever they had done, the things had done it fast. He started at the weight of Aram's hand against his arm, but prevented himself from shouting or speaking. The touch snapped him out of it, and he turned to realize the others had all disappeared back into the other warehouse. The only ones left were he and Aram. Their eyes never met, for Aram was already on the move. Luther, suddenly painfully aware of the soft creaking every step made upon the rusty walkway, followed suit. They emerged into the interior to find the others snapping up what supplies they had left and descending to the floor, ready to make a getaway. Soraya was the sole man among their number who wasn't set on leaving. He lingered a while at Aram's side, whispering something Luther could not hear. Aram was not to be disturbed, though. He is gone, Luther heard Aram hiss. They're all dead. We will be too if we don't move quickly. We can't all afford to die just yet. They joined the others on the ground and made for one of the end doors. Traven was so loaded with material he couldn't brandish a weapon, but otherwise guns were kept at the ready. 
Luther couldn't help but notice more than a few glances at the shadowy ramparts of their own warehouse as they went. He'd done much the same, relieved to see those shadows were still empty. At the building's threshold, Aram halted them with outstretched hand and murmured orders in the dark. The dreamer's influences crept in on us far faster than anticipated. I should have let us out earlier rather than wait for the cover of darkness, but it's too late to worry now. We have to go. The longer we stay, the more warped the land around us will become. Keep moving. Be absolutely silent. Use no lights. And mind the plants. Aram slid up the door with Soraya's help, wincing at the groan of the old metal. They shimmied under the moment the gap was large enough to pass at a crouch, and began their flight into a landscape which looked even more alien than the one through which they'd walked that morning. The growth which had sprung up to devour the rusting industry of the region had swollen now to even greater proportions. Though they hurried, and the dark masked the worst of the repulsive vegetation, Luther could see the thick ferns and scrub briars bob and writhe with the slow grace of a dancing snake. Pods or flowers which looked crimson even through the pall of shadow yawned like waiting mouths and bloated, chittering things not unlike malformed locusts or grasshoppers, droned past in the blackness while they tumbled through the shoulder-high grass. Around it all wafted that strange, metallic scent, like blood upon a chemical spill. It stung to inhale, and yet it was somehow bittersweet. So great was the influence of that aroma as Aram led them out on foot onto the broken road and through a gap in a wire fence towards the distant river that Luther actually slowed to smell a dense row of drooping flowers which lined the roadside. He didn't think about the danger, or about the unknowns. He didn't think about what had just happened, what had sent them running into the night. All he thought about for several long seconds was the sweetness of the smell, and his need to experience it again. A shuddering groan so deep it rattled the ground beneath him issued from the row of warehouses they'd abandoned then, and snapped him out of it. Luther was the last through the fence gap and into the fields beyond. Here, they were truly blind. The red-tinted grass had grown up above their heads, and they navigated by sound, all hoping Arm could keep them steadily moving eastward through the tangle. It was sharp, somehow its edges tearing small fissures in their cheeks and hands as they ran. None dared slow or stop, however, for the groaning at their backs had risen to a rasping wail as some unseen giant cried and roared its agitation. The tearing of metal and the thunderous collapse of walls reached their ears, and not one among them could shake the feeling that something monstrous had just crashed out of the warehouse and into the scrub in pursuit. There was no time to worry about blood or blindness, as had become so common in the wake of the storm. There was only the adrenaline-fueled animal need for escape. What followed was sightless, wordless electricity. Every moment was made vivid by the thrum of Luther's heart in the proximity of the shambling mass shifting through the weeds behind them. It could not move fast, whatever it was but its prospective prey were tripping and weaving in the confusing jungle which had crept in around them, and the thing had ample time to close gaps as Aram and the winded Traven found them passage over fence lines or picked out paths through outcrops of trees in eyeless murk. Through it all, they heeded Aram's warning, and they were as soundless as the environment allowed them to be. Yet still the thing came, and still they ran. They came onto what had likely been a firmly paved two-lane road, which was now being chewed into by vigorous, fleshy red vines. The plants looked almost like entrails scattered upon the damp asphalt in the shadow of the trees which bent low overhead. The leaves hung fat and bloated, and Luther thought he caught a hint of the same bloody red creeping into the color of them though he could be certain of nothing in the dark save that crashing pursuit of a strange something through the plants at their back. They wheeled along the road and burst into a sprint, now able to chew through the distance in the open. 
The whole group found themselves stumbling into a fog bank thick as smoke, likely spilled over from the nearby river, but it never slowed them. Every second, Luther expected the pursuit to draw others forth from the forest. Yet, Aram's belief that most of the dreamer's kin would be pushing west seemed to have been correct, for no other sounds joined the lumbering beast which struggled to keep pace with them. For nearly forty minutes they ran, weaving along the route of the road and rounding abandoned cars and fallen trees when they reared up out of the fog. Though each moment dampened the sounds of their wheezing and groaning pursuer as it fell further and further behind, Luther never once took solace in the fact. The image of those strange, wriggling, silent limbs or appendages hanging from the warehouse roof was still too fresh in his mind to allow such luxuries and his legs thumped steadily along as if he weighed nothing. It was an effortless flight while it lasted, made numb and mechanical by the desperate need to get away. Luther only realized how badly his lungs burned when they finally slowed and banked right off the road into the long parking lot of a single-story strip of stores. By that time, any noise of their pursuer was limited to remote and fading echoes which taunted their ears from the fog. It was an awful gurgling, a wet, glottal noise which rumbled with the malign strength of gigantic, strange vocal cords. As he caught his breath, and the group died down to a brisk walk rounding the strip of stores, Luther couldn't help but be reminded of sobbing. He tried not to dwell on those sounds. They had died away to nothing by the time the group had passed the parking lot and wound into a stand of trees, and had wholly departed by the time they stumbled out through fog-haunted trunks onto a muddy hill, which tumbled down to the banks of what could only be the Ohio River. It was here, where the fog hung low over the water and their vantage point atop the hill gave them a view of the horizon across the river, that Luther laid eyes upon the sky for the first time since leaving St. Louis. Not the living clouds or the deadly storm, but the true sky, for the clouds broke far out in the distance, and a thin strip of what had to be daylight shone through. That seemed impossible, for the world around them and the clouds above them were so very dark. Yet, the longer he looked, the surer he was his eyes did not deceive him. There was something off about it, though, just as there had been something wrong with the pallid, sickly light which had crept through the cloud cover when they'd taken up residence in the warehouse. It brought no comfort to Luther, for it was cold and foreign, even at that distance. But if it were not sunlight, what on earth could it be? South, Aram murmured to the others. We are above the little skiff, I think. Traven and Soraya seemed to know what Aram was hinting at, and agreed. As one, they all strode off down the bank, hugging close the shoreline and maintaining their silence. Ever afterward, Luther found himself glancing eastward at that blinding strip of sour light upon the horizon, and wondering after answers he almost didn't want to know. That light played off the swollen surface of the river, and as they went, Luther realized just how swollen by the days and days of rain the Ohio had become. Indeed, the shoreline they wandered had likely been pushed at least a quarter mile inland at places as the blackened husks of trees jutted up like tombstones from the current in the gloom. Though the cloud-borne night kept the detail from him, he couldn't help but notice the water seemed thick, oily, and dark, just as the rain which had pelted their windows and stained their skin along the trip east. The dreamer's blood he couldn't help but remember. They walked for perhaps an hour. The trek was damp, for the slick rain pattered down on them at times, but aside from alien shrieks and wails which rolled low out of the distance over the water, they were alone. Never did they break their silence, though. Now, with the adrenaline subsiding and the frantic pace of their travels having been reined in, Luther was able to dwell on the fact that one of their number had died. He had seen or heard of many who'd died, of course, the coming of the storm had familiarized everyone with that, but to count their number as five rather than six was somehow jarring. Luther hadn't known Morgan, 
Not really. But the others had, and he saw it writ large on the faces of Sias and Traven. Soraya was the worst off, by his expression and ambling pace along the route, but he did not allow it to slow him down. Physically imposing as he was, Soraya seemed to ask the most questions among Aram's band of acolytes. He seemed less certain, equally brave but not quite so sure of his direction. Luther imagined Morgan had tried to remedy that, for he had heard the two of them murmur amongst themselves here and there during the long night ride across two states to the river. He wouldn't describe how he felt as wounded or sad. He was still too shaken for that, and the bond had not been deep enough. Rather, Luther felt like a voyeur watching a group he wasn't part of suffer a loss he couldn't understand. Though he knew their silence was a measure meant to secure them all against unwanted attention from the things which might lurk nearby, he couldn't help but imagine part of that silence reigned due to his presence there, looking over the shoulders of men he did not know. Only Aram, as ever, seemed entirely collected, and he led with the surety of a casual runner out for a Sunday jog around the park. After the hour's walk, they found themselves at the rear of an aged row of leaning apartments, only half visible in the shadow. The lot sprawled off to either side of them, and its lowest reaches had been swallowed up by the filthy river's bloated banks. Car roofs rose like islands from the murky shallows, and tepid water lapped languidly at the asphalt around their feet. Aram and Traven began scanning for something, and the others soon learned what they'd gambled on finding here. There had been several cheap little boats fitted out with equally cheap engines atop trailers in this lot, the province of solitary escapes onto the river in saner days. Several had been chained to trailers low enough in the lot that their interiors had filled up with water, but one, a particularly battered old metal hull with dents that made it look like it had suffered axe strokes and gunshots in its time, was potentially still river-worthy. Aram had Sias produce a rusted pair of bolt cutters and struggle through the chains to free the decrepit thing. The cutters were dull and too small to be suited for the job, so it took several straining minutes to make the break and slide free the chains. The whole while, as the clanking of metal bounced off the sodden walls of the distant apartments and echoed back to their ears over the drowned cars, Luther watched their surroundings with wide eyes. His vigil only ended when the boat at last slipped free, and they piled in their gear before crawling into the pathetic little craft to attempt the crossing. Luther felt real dread before they even started the puttering engine and motored out onto the overgrown corpse of what had once been the Ohio River. The Kentucky bank was not wholly visible across the way through the mist, and the boat tottered beneath weight it had not been designed to hold aloft. It was not the misty shore beneath that ashen white strip of distant sky, or the unsteady juddering of the boat below that troubled him, though, for despite their breadth, the oily waters were calm, and no sounds issued from the opposite bank to challenge them. Rather, it was the water itself, and the things which swirled and twitched beneath it. Luther first noticed the forest of tapering growth which swayed in the slow current of the blackened water. It grew so dense as to be hardly noticeable through the thickened water. Only the glints of the distant gap in the clouds upon the rippling river brought it to light. It was like a seaweed, but darker, perhaps reddish in hue, like so many of the plants had become. Out from its depths, much more visible against the dark backdrop, came darting crawfish and swarming darters which gleamed with a soft, slimy luminescence. These ghost lights swimming in the currents were not normal, he saw, for most sported more fins and legs than they should have, and saw through black eyes which had grown far too large for their heads. All this was merely glimpsed in fits and starts through the oily mess which had corrupted the water. As their old engine whined its protests into the dampening fog, Luther saw Sias and Soraya perk up in their seats with guns readied. They scanned the water downriver, as if they'd spotted something, but all that reached Luther's senses when he looked down the way was the muted slosh of something large as it slipped beneath the water. Upturned trees floated past now and then, 
as did the bloated corpses of livestock picked over by the pale carrion from the riverbed. So Luther initially told himself this noise was just another hunk of refuse bobbing along its final ride. Yet, the more keen the others seemed about distant noises in the mists, the less consoled Luther was by that comforting mantra. They were, by then, just over halfway across the inflated body of water. Aram, from his post at the tip of the craft, turned back to look at Traven where he manned the motor and asked him if he could go any faster. There was no worry in Aram's voice, but that request, given after so long spent in silent tension, sent chills down Luther's spine. Traven shook his head, waving a hand at the waterlogged air around them as if to conduct the strained groan of the dying engine. Luther couldn't help but notice that Aram brought his own rifle up to his shoulder after that, and waited in silence with the others as they scanned the babbling surface of the dark river. The bottom had fallen away now, and the massive forest of riverweed was deep enough that its slothful swaying was invisible to the eye. The darting, glowing scavengers and hunters that dwelt there were nothing but pinpricks of dull light down in all the haze of mud and oil, and the waters were stirred by no wind. Thus, when a great, misshapen, blubbery thing broke the water ahead of the boat, it could not be written off as a strange ripple in the water playing tricks upon their tired eyes. They all saw it, and they all realized how massive it must be, for the pale flesh of its sodden back which peaked above the water was a full four times the length of their little boat. Traven banked to the side as much as the puttering motor allowed, but by the time they reached the stretch of the river where the thing had emerged, it had sunk back out of sight beneath the murky water. This was, if anything, more frightening, for now every shadow in the shadowy water and every splash along the surface of the river seemed laden with the threat of ambush. Luther raised his own rifle to scan the water then, still not convinced he could even hit anything with the weapon. Still, he felt less hopeless when holding it, even if the strength it granted was likely an illusion. A sudden crack of gunfire made Luther jolt, his head swung to find Sias had shot at a shape off to his side of the boat, and his turn brought him around just in time to see Aram put a bullet of his own into the flesh of a pallid creature which writhed towards them upstream. It lingered just long enough for Luther to see it gout black blood from its greasy, sickly hide before it, too, sunk out of view. "'We will need to run once we hit the shore,' Aram said, all pretense of stealth wiped away. Even if nothing on the banks hears us, we shouldn't trust the shallows. His last words were swept up in another round of shots from Sias and Soraya as another back broke the surface in front of them. Again the white-skinned, serpentine beast wriggled in their direction, and again it fled to the bottom as silver shot ripped into its slick hide. There were half a dozen of the things that Luther could see, weaving up into view at the fringes of his vision only to submerge seconds later like eels driven into a frenzy by the promise of blood. Luther found himself hoping it was the injured beasts they'd shot whose gore was driving the others wild, but as Evermore made the charge at the hull of their little craft and were shot in turn, he couldn't shake the feeling their boat was the sole target of the ravenous throng. Luther struggled with the question of whether or not he too should fire into the thrashing waters around them for a long while. The others seemed to be fending the things off, and yet he felt vulnerable, his reeling emotions urging him to take the shots, to fire blindly into the water and make his resistance known. Yet the rational part of him held this gnawing voice at bay, knowing his aim would be miserable and his shots mostly wasted. Just as he resigned himself to this realization, a jolt ripped through the boat, staggering all but Traven as they continued their volleys into the river. Grounded, Traven called, rising to his own feet as he snatched up what gear he could from the floor of the boat around him. Into the water, Aram ordered, over the front of the boat and into the shallows. Follow me. With that, Aram leapt down into the almost knee-deep soup along the banks and shifted off to the side of the boat. The pale beasts from the river's depths were still following, now thrashing like stranded snakes as they drove their tapering bodies up into the mud and weed of the shore. Sias and Soraya went next with their gear upon their shoulders, almost at once, and joined Aram in his barrage, 
snapping in fresh magazines with practiced ease as they ran their weapons dry. Luther went next, forgoing shooting to carry more supplies alongside the rifle which felt so unfamiliar to him. Next was Traven, or next should have been Traven. Even as the group backed up towards dry land under the press of dozens of pale and serpentine pursuers through the obscuring dark, they all realized Traven had fallen behind, crouched low and straining near the center of the boat they'd abandoned. When Aram called to him, Traven merely stood up and tossed two full bags their way. Luther snatched up the straps of them as they landed unceremoniously in the oily water, preparing to drag them to shore, figuring Traven had simply stalled to offload several vital bits of gear. Yet, Traven deflated that notion when he drew a pistol from his waistband and fired three times in quick succession down into the bottom of the boat, alongside where his booted foot must have been. None of them could see the thing for several frantic seconds, not until it hoisted Traven up off the boat like a doll to dangle in the fog overhead. It was a tendril or tentacle, Luther thought at first, an arm like one would see on a cephalopod, and yet, when it flexed in silent pain under an onslaught of precisely placed rounds from arm, it seemed segmented and angular in places, like a great centipede draped in the slimy, translucent skin of a slug, with the flesh buckling and bulging as the armored plates beneath shifted with its motion. Small snails and mites, gleaming with the bioluminescence of the bottom dwellers, flashed and glimmered as it moved, making the creature seem paradoxically ethereal as it writhed. It was only when it began vibrating with strain to hold the man aloft under gunfire that Luther realized the end of the thing had engulfed Traven's right foot. It was a mouth, toothy and ridged, akin to the spiny maw of a lamprey or leech, and flanked by a forest of mandibles not unlike a crab's. Traven was bleeding profusely from the place where it gripped him along the calf, and as he watched in stunned horror, Luther realized that the thing was working its way further and further up the leg as its prey strained and thrashed against the hold. More of the things some eight or nine inches thick like the first, and others a full two or three feet wide, rose like charmed snakes from the murk around the abandoned boat. More silver rounds found these, but it did little to slow them. Some took chunks from the captive's stomach as he hung helpless in the air, long ago having lost his meager pistol in the tumult. Others closed round his waving limbs, and joined the first in its race to swallow Traven whole. Just as Piranha cut up in a feeding frenzy, the wriggling beasts had become blind to the rest of the world the second the promise of fresh food offered itself up to them. Luther had a single moment of crystal clarity to again wonder at how quiet the whole thing was. Traven had made no sound save grunts and strained wheezes as he tried to contort his way out of the clutches of his devourers. The worms, for he could think of no better descriptor for the alien fauna, were entirely silent save for the dripping slosh and splatter of their slick bodies leaving the river. Amidst all that gunfire, there had come no screams or roars or hissing screeches driven by bloodlust and predatory fear. There was only the steady trickle of blood and water back into the swollen Ohio, or whatever the twisted body of water now represented, and the echoing thunder of their massed gunfire. A hand closed around the collar of his coat and pulled him shoreward. He turned just enough to realize it was Soraya, and fell into step on shivering legs as the big man led him up onto the overgrown slush of land. Aram and Sias awaited them there, and they stopped just long enough to watch Aram put a shot through Traven's chest to spare him the agony he must be facing, silent or not. Even Luther, jarred as he was to the brutal realities that had enveloped him over the past few days, did not question the mercy in that. Then, in Aram's wake, they pressed on through the reddish weeds towards the pestilential light of the eastern horizon, and listened for movement in the misty woods alongside the river. They didn't hear rustling or pursuit in the gloom until they'd spent twenty harried minutes lunging and tumbling their way across sparse roads and overgrown lots. By then, they were ducked low amidst rows of parked cars left to sit in the grass-eaten parking lot of a cheap strip mall, 
and simply kept quiet until the distant grunting shamble in the trees passed them by. This faceless searcher was, so far as they could tell, the only creature upon the shore which had taken notice of their noise along the Ohio. Luther supposed it had bigger fish to fry, for it didn't return. Sias made quick work of an old white sedan they found unlocked, and the second they'd tossed all the gear in the trunk and gotten themselves inside, he finished his hurried hotwire job and slid into place behind the wheel. Arms' insistence they stopped to pour all the excess fuel they'd carried over from the van into the tank beforehand meant they wouldn't have to stop until they neared the mouth in a few hours' time. With Aram navigating for Sias as he drove, they turned off the lot onto a road made prematurely bumpy by the dense thickets of crimson briar and weed, which had sprung up from cracks in its surface, and began the trip eastward once more. They navigated by the use of an old-school road atlas, as had been done before, but the routes were even less reliable now than they had been west of the Ohio. Blood-tinted forests had sprung wide to block lanes on woodside roads, and abandoned cars filmy with the dried residue of the storm's oily rains were often toppled and skewed across the uneven pavement. They hung north to avoid the thickest of the remnants of Louisville, and saw traces of the ravages left by the dreamers' advance in all directions as they rode. With the lighting a bit better during this leg of the trip, and the rain having fallen away to nothing, the outlines of shattered skeletal remains in the ransacked remnants of home stood clear before them. Avid red fungus jetted from the eye sockets and blackened rib cages of corpses piled high along the roadside, and great fires burned their rumbling roots through the distant suburbs, apparently undaunted by the elder rains. Luther could not focus wholly on these mundane horrors, though, for past it all was that waxen, sickly pallor which colored the skies beyond the clouds, looming as a mocking invitation to the intruders who so reluctantly forged their path towards it. Six. Unfathomed. Luther couldn't correlate what he saw with daytime, but Aram assured him it was. Bright as the sky was, there was no solar warmth to it, no reassuring charge to the air which invigorated and rejuvenated and healed. In fact, the world grew colder once they'd sped out from beneath the clouds and donned dry gear in their seats to fight off the chill of the lingering damp they'd dragged in from the river. The sky was a panoply of streaked, aging ivory and milky white. This was drilled through with what Luther couldn't help but think of as holes, blacker than black flecks against the pale canvas which radiated streaks of liquescent shadow into the blank heavens. They were arranged like stars, these dark holes in the sky, and among them soared a black mass far larger than any other, a cruel parody of the sun, as Luther saw it, which glared down upon the malformed landscape like an empty and covetous eye. That landscape was a horror in itself, for the reddish hue which had seeped into the foliage beneath the clouds seemed almost to pain the beholder here. The plants were bloated with it, fat and slow to bend in the low wind which haunted the hills. The trunks and limbs of the trees were a bone white, and seemed run through with veins of black that bulged and twitched in the light of the sunless sky. The drainage ditches along the road and the one-time cattle ponds which dotted the distant landscape were oil slicks upon a Martian surface of blood-tinted grasses, and they did not stand empty beneath the cold sky. There were beasts in the derelict pastures and flooded lowlands between Louisville and Lexington. The lowlands of Kentucky had been stripped clean of horses and cows, and in their place, 
many-legged furry grazers bumbled through the tall grasses and chewed over the red growth. They were woolen and lumbering, far larger than any buffalo or steer. Yet their legs seemed segmented beneath their sheeting hair, and their mouths were forests of blunt mandibles which made Luther think of caterpillars or ants. They strode the plains and valleys in vast herds, and though they lazily hoisted their heads to watch the group's car roll past through bulbous clusters of mirrored eyes, they did not pursue. Even more uncanny were the equine-looking creatures which bedded down in the shadows of many old barns upon the hills. They stood tall on limbs which seemed far too long, legs like bony spines which seemed to wobble like stilts when the beasts walked, elongated necks which bulged with each mouthful allowed skeletal heads wreathed in coarse black hair to pluck leaves from the top of altered trees. The eldest were the size of giraffes. As huge as they were, Luther could not help but believe they had once been horses, and yet every ounce of grace and poise had been stripped from them. Now they seemed like undead wraiths haunting the edges of fields in the meadows of reddish woodland. Slender, six-hooved creatures with the sleek builds of large tigers sported thick manes of brown fur. Their heads were antlered and cervid, like the largest buck or bull moose in saner parts of the world, and yet their fearsome jaws were more like the broad and jagged teeth of crocodiles. These hunted the grazers in packs, and occasionally were seen to scamper across the roadway before the car in pursuit of prey. As with the herbivores they slew, these misshapen predators seemed too wrapped up in their lounging and chasing to pursue the alien trespassers in this cruel expanse of dreamscape. Mighty flocks of something akin to dragonflies roamed the skies, and several of their larger specimens, perhaps the length of a man, made vain attempts to strafe the car as it passed through their silent dominion. Loud as these attempts to snatch away the car were, they didn't slow the group's progress, and the overgrown bugs would return to harassing the native fauna of the dreamer's strange new world. Their buzzing hordes came and went, and the creatures of the ground made for the cover of trees and ruined buildings when they darkened the pale canvas overhead. Even more tension was breathed into the icy atmosphere by Sias when he joked that, as he put it, the enemy was growing desperate. Aram agreed, saying that the whispers had grown particularly frequent. He said he was thankful the sleeping god wasn't entirely awake, for he wasn't sure he could hold up in the face of a real onslaught from the thing. When he asked Soraya whether he'd been bothered by these whispers, Soraya flatly dismissed them as annoyances. Luther, seemingly the only one in the vehicle put on edge by this conversation, was the sole rider who wasn't consulted, and he was happy for it. All this severely darkened Luther's thoughts. Soraya seemed nearly as nervous as he, and asked several times whether they should wait until true night fell over the dreamscape before continuing on. Luther felt naked and exposed in the loud car rolling through so placid and stealthy a landscape, and he sensed Soraya felt that tension just as keenly as he did. Perhaps these whispers of the enemy also played a role. Aram wouldn't have it, though, for the longer they waited, the more danger would slip back from the front lines of the apocalyptic struggle out west to find them in the hinterlands of the Dreamer. Aram had already underestimated the pace of expansion once, and he was not prepared to allow himself the same mistake again. They were to go straight to the mouth and allow nothing to slow their progress. As time marched on and the outskirts of Lexington neared, though, Luther came to believe Soraya was nervous for a different reason. The big man beside him didn't look out the windows or flinch at the strafing insects which taunted the car now and again. He didn't linger on the weak old corpses left over from the civilization which had died here, being devoured by the oblong hordes of the dreamer's paradise in the shadows of the ruins they passed by. Rather, Soraya seemed to be mouthing strange words to himself, 
building himself up for some unknown struggle he was uncertain could be won. Luther almost asked him about it, but with the steely forms of Aram and Sias so silent up front, he didn't dare break the quiet with his probing, and kept his own worries locked away unspoken inside his skull. Lexington itself had been leveled. Luther was unfamiliar with the little city, and yet even without a knowledge of what it had looked like prior to the fall, its outskirts looked bombed out and blasted. Though the walls were not twisted by bombs, and the husks of strip malls and neighborhoods weren't pockmarked with the scars of gunfire, fires from the destroyed industrial parks and factories had swept the outskirts and left them blackened with ash. In the skeletal remains of these structures, fleshy red vines and fungal blooms clung to walls like scuttling insects, and the yawning roofs vomited gnarled albino trees which grew skyward at an impossible pace. Overturned cars and the shattered glass of storefronts and windshields made the roads an obstacle course through which they had to weave and wind, and yet there were no corpses. Luther wondered just how thorough the gnawing hordes of the dreamer were, how long it took them to strip clean the cities they raised and scamper west into the distance, in search of the next conquest and the feasts which followed. The rolling hills and open greenery which had once surrounded the city were now run through with the fetid crimson, and the snapped remnants of bones from men, dogs, and even horses stood white against the wards and pasturage of stately southern homes. These were singular relics, though, for lonely skulls and femurs and ribs lay isolated from the rest of the bones which had accompanied them in life, forgotten in the frenzied rush of some devourer to slip off in search of another glut. As they passed the sprawling corpse of a car dealership pushing east out of town, a black mass rose up to look upon them from the shorn roof of the building. Luther had thought it was piled earth or a massive, stories-high mound of ash right up until it moved. It was hunched, with two tapering arms and a misshapen head, almost human in shape, just like many of the distant giants Luther had glimpsed in silhouette during their first night in the car. In the red and white haze of the cold daylight which reigned here, the Stygian dark of its shimmering skin seemed to waver and shift like heat haze against the shine. Sheets of reddish moss hung like streamers from a forest of dagger-sharp spines and horns which burst from its body. Set in a skull bleak as the black holes in the waxen sky overhead, its many eyes had the filmy, yellowish shade of spoiled milk. It watched them with slothful disinterest as they went along their way and sank back down into a slouched ball in the dealership's innards after they'd gotten a few hundred yards down the road. This was just one among many such surreal encounters they slid past due to the gluttonous apathy of the things which lulled in the wreckage about the roads. Countless glistening, pulsating pupae had been gestating in the abandoned cars along I-64 East and the wet folds of these oversized cocoons spilled from cracked windows and open sunroofs like biscuit dough, rupturing a can. A hairy, winged creature so large its silhouette blotted out the light upon the road passed over several times observing them, only to bank languidly off towards the west, as if deciding the outsiders weren't worth its trouble. The shade of an overpass along the interstate played host to a sleeping group of two dozen of the same misshapen hunters they'd seen fighting and killing along the outskirts of the storm. The hunters slumbered so deeply that the passing of the car only woke a couple, and they didn't bother to pursue. Luther knew little about what the Kentucky Hill Country had looked like prior to this but he imagined it had been similar to pasturage and young forest land in lower Illinois and Missouri. Seeing the blackberry briars that lined the forests along the roadside swell thick as a human arm, and witnessing the branches of ancient oaks along pasture fences wave and buckle like upturned spiders trying to right themselves, he couldn't help but imagine what was happening in the lands they'd left behind them. 
The black blood which fell in that constant rain had bled an unnatural life into everything which consumed it, from the smallest blades of grass to the ornery bulls which fed upon them. How far had the change gone, and how fast did it take hold? How many days had this artificial sky shown that cool, arctic light onto these twisted remnants of a landscape which had once been verdant with wholesome life? The deadlands grew yet more lively as the car chewed through the miles, making the questions hang all the heavier upon Luther's thoughts. By the time they'd passed the embers which had once been the suburban city of Winchester, the pillared porches of plantation-style homes had been wholly consumed by red growth, and the signs of the human inhabitants which had been so recently driven from the land became all but invisible. The road grew rougher as the flora grew thicker, and as they turned southeast onto the mountain parkway at Aram's eager direction, Luther couldn't shake the feeling they were flinging themselves off a cliff. More so than ever before, he felt they were wholly alone, swallowed up by the barbarian nothingness which reigned in the lands of the dreamer. No straggling survivors, helpful or otherwise, would stumble upon them here, he thought nor would some military breakthrough see planes rupture the awful alien skyscape to set fire to the ugly manse of foreign foliage upon the earth. This was a conquered land, and he couldn't help but think no amount of purging, burning, or replanting could ever fully cure it of the sickness which had taken hold here. For Luther, this was a frightening glimpse into the yawning mouth of the unknown. For Aram and Sias up front, it seemed almost to breathe new life into them. They broke their silence and murmured about the prospect for survival in the gamble they were taking as each mangled mile marker sped by, about how brilliantly terrible and novel the sights and metallic smells of this new world were. For them, they felt like explorers freshly crashed upon a distant world, thrilled by each and every new sensation. Luther, who had always felt left out within their company, still felt like a stowaway whose accidental presence only cruel happenstance could explain. Soraya was still sullen, though. His eyes blazed at the sights which welled up and dominated the landscape around them, but he did not speak, and he certainly didn't crane his head to drink in every detail. In fact, Luther had grown fairly certain Soraya was staring at Sias in the seat before him, eyes drilling into the back of the stout man's shaven head as he drove them along. What this meant, he didn't know, but he wouldn't have to brood over it for long. Forty minutes they spent on the mountain parkway, watching sheer rock faces and tight valley corridors replace the open hills of the lowlands. The thick woods here made the Amazon look tame, for the confusing reddish maze and its bony clusters of pallid trunks were painful to look upon. Even the stone had been altered, for the clean, light cliffs and boulders which once would have decorated the mountain walls were shot through with fleshy vines, or veins, vile as the thought was to Luther, of deepest black and ivory, which pulsed and shimmered with an unnatural vibrance. The road here was all but clear, with only a few tattered vehicles to slow them and the floodwaters having long ago subsided down the creek bottoms which littered the Appalachian foothills. Progress was good, but signs of life grew more and more troublesome as the hills around them pressed in closer and closer. Though occasional movement haunted the trees, the real life was in the air, for the forested region resounded with a low rumble which it took Luther some time to realize was the rhythmic thumping of drums. Even through the windows, over the engine of the car, the chanting which accompanied it could be grasped at, the syllables low and growled, almost vibrating the chest like the bass rumble of a massive speaker. Countless voices were imprisoned in that tonal jumble. Sias rolled down his window to better listen to the sounds drifting down from the windless mountain tops, and the symphony was almost mechanical like an audio sample forced through one too many filters. Luther strained to see any sign of the masses who must be singing up there as they wound along riversides, but the notorious low-slung mountains of Appalachia were even more thick with trees now than they'd ever been, 
and the ancient mountaintops were not about to surrender their secrets to him. They turned off at a barely legible, vine-buried sign for a place called Campton. The town had been little, Luther guessed, mostly an outpost for tourists visiting the nearby geological sites in the gorge which had been so heavily advertised along the parkway. It was impossible to tell, though, for like a jungle creeping back in on a derelict farm, the whole place had been devoured totally by the alien growth which had dominated the mountain. The lone gas station near the exit was where they stopped, but it was only recognizable as a gas station because of the shape of the awning over the place where the pumps had once been. Every inch of the building was blanketed by needle-leaf creepers which grew thick as kudzu, and the lot was fast becoming a scarlet meadow. They rolled to a halt before the entrance, and Aram led them in, unloading what supplies remained from the car. Everything feasible was stuffed into packs while Sias took a machete to the growth which blocked the shattered station doors. Not a word was spoken. With the engine silenced, the chanting and drumming and animalistic bleeding on the mountaintops was all but deafening. Cheap as the protection of the gas station shell was, Luther desperately wanted to get in there, to be out of sight of the tree line, whose shadows he found himself glancing for again and again as they offloaded. Only when they'd slid into the looted, barren innards of the station and moved into the back did Luther feel slightly secure, and even then he found it hard to believe their position wasn't known by every woodland thing within a mile of Campton's ruins. Luther was too caught up in worry over the things outside to realize the others were etching designs with knives into the drywall at the rear of the building until they'd already finished. Aram worked with practiced hands, and the designs, strange and illegible as they were to Luther, seemed graceful, despite the method. They were intermittently curving and angular, a confusing tangle of interlocking sigils and lines which formed a dark circle amidst the murky white at the wall. The lights were off, of course, and the low light trickling in past the foliage along the storefront steeped the scene in dirty shadows, lending the whole display a sinister air. It could still be me, you know, Aram said as he stood to inspect his own work. I would do it gladly. You were needed to lead. Sias replied with a brisk shake of his head. "'I don't know any more than you about what we'll find near the mouth,' Aram told him. "'You're just as capable as I am of completing the last leg of the journey.' Sias shook his head. There had been a hollow sadness in Aram's words, the first time Luther had ever heard such an emotion color his brother's speech. Soraya stood numb and vacant to the side, eyes boring fruitlessly into the carving upon the wall as if searching for escape. Aram maintained eye contact with Sias for a while, nodding to himself. A smile, pained but genuine, broke his dour features. You've always been perfectly aware what it was all about, Aram told him, always focused on the struggle and never the trappings. Most of the others that hear the mountain's call have to be coached to realize all the orgiastic ritual and excess in the induction cults is just set dressing, degeneracy to drive out those with morals too civilized to fit into the order. Never you, though. Sias let a slight grin creep into his own features, but the quiet man seemed at a loss for what to say. You know, I read a passage from a book once during a misguided plumbing of social media that someone had reposted, Aram said. It began with a Thoreau quote about the mass of men living lives of quiet desperation. I've always liked Thoreau, even if he is a bit soft at times. So I read the commentary that had been laid out to accompany it, and I found I quite liked that, too. Aram paced as he talked, and Luther knew he was about to quote from memory. If there was such a thing as eidetic, photographic recall, Luther knew enough from years of childhood company that Aram was one who possessed it. How many men stand on a balcony and wonder what happened? He wanted adventure and got two weeks' vacation. He wanted a mission and got a lawn that needed mowing. 
He wanted purpose and got a cubicle. He wanted a mighty steed and got a minivan. He wanted a castle and got a mortgage. He wanted a battle to fight, and he got televised sports instead. Aram finished with a smile that would have spoken to humor in any situation which wasn't so dire. Even Luther, blind to what exactly was about to happen, understood the gravity of it. As it was, the smile seemed sorrowful. I read that and felt I needed to know who wrote those words. I needed to seek out whatever cure he was preaching to the pointless monotony of daily life, Aram said with a snort. Do you know what I found? Sias, grinning more broadly now, said, I've got a few minutes, brother. Lay it on me. It was from a fucking dating guru's self-insert interview novel, Aram laughed. All of that astute diagnosis just for the author to suggest that a young man who yearns for conquest should just get more pussy. Sias joined Aram in his laugh. Even Soraya brightened a bit at that. The guy looked like a yoga instructor as well, Aram went on. Never had a tooth knocked loose or heard shots fired in anger. Never watched a brother bleed his last or walked the ruins of a city he conquered. And yet, fat on the nectar of wine and women, he figured he'd weigh in and write a thesis on what it means to be a man. The laughter died, and Aram ceased his pacing. Aram was dead serious now, and Sias seemed to hang on the words he spoke as did all of the men present in the room. You never had that problem, Sias. I've known you for years, and for you the draw of the call of the mountain has always been the struggle. It isn't the pomp and ceremony and company. It isn't the hallucinogenic trips or the flirtation with danger or the excitement of working outside the bounds of the law. It's not even the cause, though the cause is a noble one. It's always been the challenge for you and you've never once backed down from that challenge. What can I say? Saya said after a long exhale. Dad raised me right. Soraya chuckled at that, despite the tension. You're a good man, Aram told him. Strong. In a better, wilder age, you'd have been a bandit lord burning castles or a raider spilling in from the wilds. You should have been with us in the end. It's good enough for me that I'll get you to the end, even if I don't make the end of the road myself, Sias said. Morgan and Traven would have said the same thing. Now have the kid do the deed. We don't know how much time we've got. Aram nodded. He dipped a hand into his bag and produced a long, remarkably thin knife, almost an oversized needle. It glistened so sharply Luther couldn't help but believe that it, like their ammunition, was a thing forged of pure silver. He placed the thing in Soraya's shaking hand, then motioned for the big man to wait as he walked over to Luther. The mountains are crawling with the enemy, he explained, fishing for something else in his bag as he spoke. There are too few of us to fight our way to the mouth. We're going to walk through the world beyond the veil, the world of the mountain. We'll reemerge onto this plane right at the edge of the dreamer's maw, and from there we'll be descending into it. Aram produced a small iron cross on a dull chain of equally heavy iron and hung it around Luther's neck. The world beyond the veil is almost as hostile as the Deadlands, Aram told him, but Soraya is somehow in sync with that world, and though we don't know exactly why, the things in it are pliable around him. Even if we didn't have Soraya, it's still the better option compared to climbing the slopes here. Aram planted a finger on the cross upon Luther's chest as he said, The things beyond the veil are like the Fey of old. Perhaps they are the Fey of old. For us, the distinction's unimportant. Whatever the case, they, like the Fey, aren't fond of iron. If you are separated from us, then this might deter anything there from taking you. Aram then returned to Soraya, grasping the man by the shoulders and reminding him they all had roles to fill. Much as Soraya seemed to grasp that, it didn't seem to shore up his nerves. The gesture was given, 
and the big man went forward to meet Sias along the wall. Sias stood against the pattern Aram had carved there, and the center of his back was pressed to the circle. Sias slid off his shirt, and Saraya lined up the needle like knife he held, ensuring he'd slip past any ribs and directly into the heart. He stood still a long moment, hand gripped tight against the handle to ward off the jitters. You'll kill it for me, won't you? Sias asked the question of Saraya. The big man hesitated a moment, seeming lost for words, before managing a surprisingly forceful yes. Only when Sias ordered him to did Saraya finally make the thrust. The needle struck true, and for a moment Sias was pinned to the drywall behind him by the blade. His breath left him almost immediately, and he was gone within seconds. Once the dead weight of the sturdy man fell upon the knife, it ripped free of the wall and Saraya eased the man to the floor, where he bled his last onto the dirty tile. Though Luther had fully realized what was about to happen during Aram's reminiscence with Sias, that realization didn't steal any of the shock from him when it happened. Even more startling was Aram making for the tiny, reddish hole left by the piercing knife in the wall. The savage music which haunted the hills was swelling now, and though Luther's racing thoughts didn't quantify it at the time, the voices in the chants were drawing nearer. Aram ripped at the drywall with his fingers, and the stuff sloughed away like dead skin. The space beyond that wall was not the open air outside or some back room in the station, but something else entirely. The circle sigil soon resembled a ragged mirror, and yet, hazy and warbled as it was, the reflection on the other side was no reflection at all, not as Luther understood it. Saraya, still catching his breath and throwing guilty glances at the comrade he'd stricken down, had to be ushered in first by Aram. Once he'd crawled through the gap into that world beyond the veil, as Aram had put it, it was Luther's turn to go. It should be dark and dead, Aram told him. We can afford to use the lights. We may have to. Just stick close to Soraya and keep quiet, in case there's still fighting going on. I'll be right behind you. With a last, shaken look at the silent corpse upon the floor, Luther crawled through the little gap in the wall like a man straddling a waist-high fence, cautious not to disturb the blood which pooled beneath the portal. Seven. Beyond the Veil The distant chanting ceased. The drumming halted. The air was dense, for even Luther's breaths seemed hushed and muffled as he looked around a crumpled gas station not unlike the one they'd left behind them. As Soraya readjusted the gear he hauled, and Aram climbed in after them, Luther saw the outlines of a sagging ceiling rife with age's rot, and a tile floor broken through with old stumps and mounded moss. The click of a flashlight bathed the fetid room with cold light, and confirmed the impressions Luther had gained through the dark. Where the station they'd sheltered in so briefly was looted and recently stripped, this place had been left to go to seed over the course of decades. Great masses of what might have been ants and roaches scurried the sodden floors. The paint on the walls sloughed off like wet bark from walls bloated with mold and moisture. The stink that hung about the place was thick. The scent of a century-dead tree trunk mixed with the electric miasma that accompanies thunderstorms. Rain fell outside, the sole solid sound in a dead and decomposing world. 
but the sickly gleam of the deadland sky beyond the windows was gone. Aram, flicking on his own light, led the way to the exit, Soraya and Luther trailing him as they fought the retching the smell of the station dredged up in them. The door was rusted shut, but they stepped out through the shattered panes of glass amidst great fronds of withered ivy that seemed to shudder at their touch. Outside, the world around them was one of faint objects which stood black against the darker darkness of a towering, ancient forest whose floor had never seen true daylight, and whose primordial trees dwarfed any structure ever built by humankind. The lot disappeared amidst the forms of half-visible roots and brambles, and the road along which they'd traveled in the Deadlands was long gone beneath the fecund dirt and mud of the world beyond the veil. The sole light beyond their own intrepid beams was distant, flowing in magenta and turquoise rivers overhead beneath a canopy which soared hundreds of yards into the air. Great flocks of swollen lightning bugs they seemed to be, twisting and turning in angry swarms like bats as they navigated the manse of trees. These muted tones, alien and vibrant as they were, soared so far above that they would have been little help navigating the subterranean dark of the forest floor. Aram stepped off the stoop of the station and led them upward onto an overgrown slope beneath the trees with his light always careful to keep the beam towards the ground as he watched every twitch and tremor amidst the looming woodland. Keep moving and keep silent, Aram reiterated. The words were so low and so monotone, Luther couldn't help but think Aram had said them to himself as much as to the two he led. The soaring trees thick as houses whose tightened roots they wound around roused a strange feeling in Luther one he had first confused with the isolation he'd felt on the silent expanses of the Deadlands. But here, the cruelly sloped hills and the impossibly thick growth roused none of the distaste and revulsion he'd so often felt in the midst of the dreamer's conquered lands. Instead, he felt the more pronounced rendition of the sensation he might have had gazing over a high mountain peak or upon an ancient redwood in his normal life, before all this madness had begun. It was awe, the startling impact of humbling beauty, that sunk its talon into him here, not the sour sepsis of the dreamer's waking nightmare. And yet, there was something somber and sad in it. The trees which scraped the atmosphere seemed to have died standing up, and their mighty trunks and limbs played host only to the silent ravages of large insects feeding upon the rot. The dens and arches beneath the roots upon the forest floor which seemed once to have hosted nesting animals and furry predators sheltering from the woods around them, were empty and still. The half-visible glowing insects which buzzed above in gleaming streams through the canopy flickered as if their bearers were ill, and occasionally one of their number would drift down to the forest floor like a falling star to flicker its last in the strangling bush before dying out for good. They stumbled on several great animal corpses in the trek, all curled in death like wasps doused in poison. Some were insectile, like the tapering flies which cast their lights overhead, and the great millipedes which they saw upturned in the mud beneath the roots. Others were not unlike the hunting mammals of their own world, for there were the worm-eaten carcasses of saucer-eyed, black-furred panthers hanging upon the lower branches of trees. Some, however, were not quite dead. Aram led them around a sharp corner between two trunks during a grueling switchback ascent of the nearby mountain ridge, and brought them face to face with a pale, furry bulk the size of a small truck sprawled in the coming clearing. It shuddered as it pulled in a grating, agonized gasp of the heavy, rotten air. They rounded it cautiously, but none pointed their guns at it. Such a thing seemed almost unthinkable, almost insulting. When they finished their maneuver, they saw the beast was not unlike a sloth. In fact, it reminded Luther of exhibitions he'd seen back home in Chicago's museums, of the gigantic prehistoric specimens which were supposed to have lived not terribly long ago in the forests of South America. 
It had taken a great gash to its abdomen, and its innards were pooled around it in a slick crimson pond which glistened beneath the electric lights. Still it breathed its shallow and waning breaths, like an angry grizzly refusing to shuffle off the mortal coil. Black vines which plunged in and out of the ground struck Luther first as yet another type of tree root. After he'd seen several of these black vines burrow into the flanks of the titan trees and plant themselves in the corpses of the animals scattered about the forest floor around them, he began to notice they pulsed, not unlike massive, dark veins sprung up from the earth. The dreamer's blood... That's when the whole horrible picture knit itself together for Luther. That's when he realized why it had taken him a long while to ever realize he was in a beautiful place, to recognize the awe with which he should be filled. It would have been awe-inspiring, dangerous as the place likely was, had it not been so sick. From the rotten wood to the stinking morass of mud upon the ground, the place reeked not just of decay, but of poison. Though he couldn't be logically certain, Luther was sure in the deepest depths of his heart that the world around them was in the process of dying, which had only just been completed in their own world. Soon this once wild and teeming temperate jungle of rain-haunted night would be stripped of its ancient life, and cast beneath the same cold and distant gleam which hung above the deadlands which had devoured their own home. All this he thought, but did not say. Though they had seen only the dead and dying in this world beyond the veil thus far, the darkness which reigned between the boughs and the menace which seemed to lurk behind each and every gnarled old hulk of decayed wood kept Luther from asking questions about the place. Instead, he let his eyes write a speculative history for him about how brutal the struggle had been and how hard the denizens of this savage yet unsoiled wilderness had fought to keep it. The deep scars in the sodden tree bark and the healthy reds of spilled blood which pooled with the mud beneath their feet told him that every knoll and crag had been worn only by great effort. And yet, for all the strange and undeserved pride this breathed into him, Luther hadn't spotted a single enemy corpse among them. No horned hunters, no misshapen giants, no fleshy, segmented slugs, just the black veins of the dreamer and the broken suns of the endless forest. So they went for several hours, legs aching and hearts sullen as they wallowed in the weary devastation that engulfed them. Every now and then they rested as Aram consulted an aged manuscript he kept in his pack and scanned maps of Powell County to compare the warped terrain of the world which surrounded them. Aram and Soraya would chant together, something meditative which Luther didn't dare interrupt, before squirreling the papers away and getting to their feet once more. Then they would wind off into the dark. It was near an upland vale in the mountains that the forest and the rain suddenly died away. Like a clear-cut stand of lumber, the space beyond the woodline seemed to have been accosted by saws and scouring axes. A two- or three-mile-wide swathe of the titans of this impossibly large forest had been felled, and their wet corpses lay gray and pathetic despite their size and vast heaps at the edges of the artificial clearing. The black veins of dreamers' blood were thick as spiders webbing here, and the luminescent bugs which lit the canopy dared not venture into the cool light of the open air. The sky was a gorgeous, cloudy midnight blue run through with streaks of an awful, familiar white, one which Luther could immediately guess the source of. We're here. With that proclamation, Aram led them into the wreckage without hesitation, surmounting dead trunks as climbers might scale rough-hewn cliffs. Tough as the going was, the light was better here and the fact that the wanderers had to stow their lights and put both hands to work scrabbling up bark inclines and swatting at fist-sized mites in the soggy wood didn't blind them to their surroundings. Great pools of black blood welled up like tar in the lower reaches of the clearing, making the spans between trees treacherous. The mire below the wreckage had become swampy, and it was hard not to lose boots slogging through it towards the center. 
It was as they crested a particularly large trunk that Luther realized some of the titanic trees which surrounded them had a peculiar shape to them. The great chunk of jagged growth over which they clambered looked so like a human hand that he forced himself to stop and examine the full length of the obstacle he stood upon. Hundreds of feet in length, he couldn't be certain of what he thought he saw from his spot along the midriff, but he could have sworn in that moment that the dead tree had two gnarled arms and a great shaggy head, stripped of its cloth of leaves and left bald to the dead light of the new and alien dawn which was being birthed in the sky above. Though the thing lay lifeless, Luther moved more quickly, and he chanced a word to Aram to make sure they were safe among the countless other titanic forms laid out amidst the more mundane giants in the wreckage. Aram didn't answer him, though. The man seemed speechless. He merely waved the notion away with a dismissive hand. Soraya, too, was dumbstruck, staring around with the wide eyes of a stranger in a mortuary. Since neither halted, and no answer was forthcoming, Luther set aside his wonder and worry. Can it be regrown? It was Soraya who spoke into the quiet void now. The big man's own question was a whisper but it seemed thunderous in the yawning silence. This Aram did answer. Appalachia is one of our Earth's oldest ranges, Aram said, his eyes never leaving the corpse of the great tree thing beneath them. The Rockies, Alps, and Himalayas are children beside it. It's been worn low by its untold span of years, but its forests grow dense as jungles. Even when foreign blight wiped out the giant chestnut tree in the eastern mountains, the forest still filled the canopy and thrived. It was much the same here, beyond the veil. The thickest and most ageless expanse of this forest was right here. Aram scanned the blasted heath again, surveying the aftermath which littered the battlefield like a general mourning his legions. It will come back in time, once the enemy is dead. I only lament I didn't get to see it before this started. Aram moved again, dragging his companions along in his shadow. The center of the awful expanse took a long time to reach, but when at last the clear ground in the middle crept into view, Luther could see it surrounded a rocky fissure in the damp earth, which grinned skyward with an expression he couldn't help but assign malice to. Aram motioned for them to stop, and clambered down to the ground with knife in hand to carve another set of sigils and symbols into the bark of a mammoth tree. For a moment, Luther worried over what was to come next, speculated on whose blood would be needed to open the gate. But when Aram knelt and pressed his palm to the core of his intricate design, the wood flaked away and left yet another doorway yawning open before them. Through it, that pallid light of the Deadlands gleamed, burning their eyes after so long spent in the placid gloom. Are the mountain's army still fighting? Has it already lost? Soraya addressed Aram with a voice not far from breaking. He had still not broken his gaze from the arboreal titans which scattered the grounds of the clearing. The slaughter that had taken place here had been cruel, and Luther needed no lore or explanations to feel the weight of the loss. A sound came, almost an answer, from far off westward over the towering trees. It rolled and rippled like rumbling thunder, but was of a high pitch, like the squealing scream of a vast sheet of metal being cut or torn. It would have hurt to perceive the noise, had its source not been so remote. Yes, Aram said, but they have been pushed back, just as ours are still being pushed back. We have to hurry. He went through first this time. Soraya went after, with Luther on his heels. They came out into a crimson upland valley nestled in the mountains which had once been called Appalachia, far higher up the range than they'd been when they slipped into the world beyond the veil. Their climb in the terminally ill dream world they'd traversed had been mirrored here, in the newborn deadlands. Much like the clearing they'd left behind them, this one was a holdfast of open ground amidst a sea of tightly woven trees, 
letting the waxen sky cast its terrible light upon them. But where the world beyond the veil had been wilting, the cruel reds and bone whites of this forest were vibrant. No trunks or debris littered the scarlet grasses and fleshy lichen which blanketed the ground. The black blood which had so sickened that world beyond the veil was the very essence of the nascent deadlands, and the life of the landscape which would devour the earth thrummed with youthful vigor. Drums and chants still echoed to their ears, just as they had on the approach to the station. But they were distant now. The trees cracked and bent with the movement of great unseen leviathans in the forest. Their boughs sang with the chittering of bug song that mined the lilting screams and pained moans of dying men. The hunters here will realize we've slipped past them and come for us soon, Aram said, beginning his walk for the middle of the clearing. We'll need to begin the climb down now before they start to panic. As Luther and Soraya trailed him toward the center, they spotted several half-collapsed stone foundations amidst the still grass. Aram knelt to feel the aged rocks of a fireplace hearth as they passed one of the larger structures, but he did not stop. He just threw his absent gaze around. Suddenly a child, confronted with a place he'd dreamed of visiting, but never expected to see. Hatfield, Soraya muttered, almost as breathless as Aram. Aram nodded a wordless confirmation. He pointed towards a dip in the terrain, waving them all forward, jogging the last fifty yards or so to the precipice. Luther made to follow, but reeled back as the fissure, the living canyon, came fully into view through the waist-high growth of the malign meadow. At once, Luther knew this was the mouth. The dark dirt of the glade gave way to pale, slick flesh at the lip of the canyon. The sides pulsed and wriggled with the faintest of movements as hot, tepid breaths surged up from the depths of the pit. Countless rows of mismatched, yellowed teeth, some sharp like fangs and some dull like grinding molars, dripped with the thick spittle of a living being and glistened in the milky daylight. Its length wound off for almost half a mile in either direction, but the opposing jaws of the maw were only fifteen or twenty feet apart. Small stone totems the height of a man topped by glowering little cervid heads watched over the pit in vast concentric rings within the grass. A groan so low it made the earth beneath their feet tremble slightly, issued up from the bowels of the deadlands from those jagged lips, bringing with it a fog which burned their nostrils. I'll sink a line for us, Aram began. Soraya, you... That's when the grass to the side of the group erupted. A sleek, giant, quadrupedal shape hurled itself from the grass and crashed into Aram from the side. So fast was the movement that Luther only saw the jet-black sheen of its fur and the ravening snap of its mini jaws before both the hunter and its prey rolled into the obscurity of the tangled field. Soraya was shooting in an instant, first at the bulk which thrashed atop Aram in the grass, and then at a second shape which sprinted for them from the right. Luther turned, fumbling with his own gun, just in time to drink in the morbid details of it. It was slender but huge, and loped on shortened hind legs like an emaciated gorilla. Its necklace head was structured like a bull's, but its huge black eyes boasted no sclera, and its toothy vertical mouth spread from its snout to its chest. He had just enough time to see that it had seven fingers on the dark, clawed hand it thrust up to grasp at him, enough time to register that its rippling maw was already red with blood. He had enough peripheral awareness to hear Soraya shout something to him, probably a warning though his heart thudded so loud that his racing thoughts refused to settle long enough to decipher the words. He had enough humility to know he'd never get the weapon off his shoulder in time for a shot, and enough good sense to know even his silver rounds wouldn't stop it before it hit him. It was coming for him, and there was nothing he could do. Then the heavy rounds rang out. 
The thing's skull ruptured in two places, and several fist-sized holes were blasted from its bony chest. It crumpled in a heap, its final few staggered steps taking it down to the ground off to Luther's side, where Soraya stepped in to put another shot into the ruined skull. The gunfire hadn't been Soraya's, though. It was too loud, too precise. Luther glimpsed a figure in red which blended with the alien grasses. A drum-fed shotgun clutched to his chest as a low sprint brought the stranger over the intervening eighty yards towards them. Then, stricken by another gunshot from the grass nearby, both he and Soraya shook off their shock at the sight of their savior and ran for the place where Aram and the first hunter had fallen. Aram was pinned beneath it, firing rounds awkwardly up through its bulky midriff as its many heads tore flesh from his ragged shoulder. Soraya came in close to shoot the heads, fumbling to reload as he emptied the weapon. Luther, worried he might hit Aram, unloaded his own rifle into the hairy flank of the beast, making sure all his shots were thrown towards the empty field across the span of the mouth. A frenzied second later, the hunter fell still, allowing Aram to roll the wretched creature's sputtering carcass off him and struggle in vain to rise from the bloody earth. Aram's left arm was so mangled that without the remnants of his jacket's sleeve to hold it in place, Luther imagined it might fall off entirely. It hung by corded threads of sinew, and the bones of the arm had been visibly snapped by the ravening mouths of the hunter. Though it had never gotten a clean grip on his neck, Aram held his head at an awkward angle, giving Luther the impression something had been torn or raked in the struggle. There was so much blood, both red and black, that it was hard to distinguish the wounds from the untarnished skin. Soraya knelt to attempt to see to the gruesome wounds, but Aram waved him away, demanding only that he help him up. I'm not going to die up here, not yet, Aram said. We've got a few minutes till I bleed out. Aram's voice betrayed no pain or fear. It was surreal to see one so battered speak so calmly. If Luther had heard those words in a vacuum, divorced from the scene around them, he'd have sworn they were spoken in Aram's living room over drinks. Who are you? Aram was calling to the stranger now, who had almost reached them in the center of the clearing. He was attempting to hoist his gun one-handed to ward the man off, but Soraya held him back. He's helped us was all Soraya managed in the confused chaos of the moment, but it didn't help. Were you with Eidolon's group? The stranger, a sturdy older man with a slate beard and a scarred face, bounded up beside them, gun held low despite Aram's threatening stance. It seemed impossible to Luther that a battered and bleeding arm could be threatening to the heavily armed stranger who'd saved them all, but that's how it was. I was the man explained, his eyes widening as he came to grips with how badly Aram was hurt. The outsider, Stan. Where is Malorn, the last survivor? We spoke before we set out east. The dreamer got to him, Stan said. He listened to the whispers. He started to change. I had to get rid of him. Aram motioned to the organic wreckage at their feet, asking, Was he one of these? No, Stan told him. I killed him in the lowlands where we went to hide. Then I moved back up here to wait for you. I lived near here before all this, just over the next ridge. Used to hunt out here when it was a resort. I know the terrain, even now. I've been keeping quiet, being cautious. I think I knew these two, though. Sink a piton in the flesh just past the edge, Aram ordered wasting no more of his limited time. Hook up one sturdy line and make sure the connections are good, then get all the things you'll need for the trip to the heart condensed into one bag. We don't have the time to set up a bunch of independent descents. We need to move now while it's still not entirely awake. We'll go down one after another on the same rope. Soraya did as he'd been told, and Luther made to help him unpack the bags and gather what they needed. Aram grunting with an agony which never slowed him, aided them as best he could with one hand. Stan, the newcomer, 
knelt above the many-headed quadrupedal hunter which had mauled Aram, toying with something in the forest of intertwined necks before rising to his feet again. He held a collar, warped and half-torn by the pulsating throat around which it had been tightened. It was slick and dirtied, but the tags on it still glistened in the cold light of the Deadlands. Stan held the thing up, reading the name inscribed there. He shook his head, placing the collar back down at the feet of the dead hunter. With that, he joined the others in preparing the lines as the drums grew louder, and the bellowing chants of the braying hunters of the wood drew nearer. Eight. Descent. The line seemed sturdy enough, even if it was loose and writhed beneath the climbers which descended it. It was the jaws through which they slunk that worried Luther. Still, he had come this far, and to his amazement, he was able to go through the motions of preparing for the climb down as if they weren't about to drop into the gullet of a malign god. Aram went first, the only one to truly hook himself into the line via his belt. It wasn't a secure connection, but he knew full well he'd only be able to slow his slide down so much using his one good hand. Moreover, if he fell, he didn't wish to drag anyone else along with him. He would skid down, letting gravity do the work, gloved hand hugging the line and legs grating the slick wall of the throat to keep the fall under control. The others, with the noises of pursuit from the clearing's edge looming over them, would have to shimmy down the rope like climbers in a school gym. Aram moved fast, likely more due to difficulty controlling the descent than any desire for speed. The mouth grew wider and the oblong, gigantic teeth more sparse as the first few rows passed and Aram went deeper, bringing him away from the fleshy wall of the canyon and leaving him to dangle and drop in midair as he slid along the rope, his gloved hand and bloodied pants crying out like brakes on a roadway as he went. In just moments he was out of view, and for a panicked moment, Luther, who had always been so distant among his family, Worried Aram would bleed out and fall into unconsciousness before they reached the bottom in the deep darkness below. Then, as one of the upper rows of teeth flexed lazily before his eyes, the full gravity, the full insanity, of what he was about to do came crashing down upon him. Soraya went next, waiting only half a minute or so before adding his weight to the line. Agile despite his size and clearly trained for the task at hand, Soraya descended with both his and Aram's weapons upon his back, in addition to most of the gear they felt they'd need in the bowels of the wakening god below their feet. It had been condensed into one bulging backpack, mostly food, water, ammunition, small climbing picks, knives, and a strange four-foot metal spike whose purpose Luther could only guess at, but it was still woefully heavy. Luther was amazed at the steady progress the big man made, placing one huge hand beneath the other as if the weight was negligible. Then, as shrieks which were somehow both pained and ecstatic echoed up the slopes into the clearing from the woods behind them, Stan stepped forward and motioned for Luther to begin the climb. I'll watch our backs, Stan said. You go on ahead. I'm slow, Luther told him. I haven't trained. 
I'm not sure how well I'll do climbing down. You go. I'll bring up the rear. Stan didn't argue. They didn't have time to argue. He just fixed his shotgun to his back with the bandolier he had and started the wobbly climb down. Nothing Luther had said had been a lie, but he also didn't want Stan watching the line alone. Whether because of the shock of his injury, some insight about the character of the stranger, or the nearness of his goal, Aram seemed to have accepted the newcomer without question. But Luther, ever paranoid, was not so sure. Stan had saved them, of course, but like Aram and Soraya, he was apparently aware of a whispering done by the dreamer. The grizzled man had been on his own out here for over a day. Who could say what the stirring god had breathed into the mind of this newcomer? Stan's readiness to descend in the sympathetic expression he gave dispelled some of that suspicion, but Luther couldn't set it aside entirely. Not yet. Luther had struggled to rationalize why he'd felt the loss of the near strangers who he'd traveled east with so keenly, why he'd silently lamented their deaths as he might have mourned the deaths of old friends. Though he still couldn't put words to every reason, the main drive, to his mind, was the stress of the situation, and the closeness that demanded of everyone who'd followed Aram on his quest to kill a god. Luther recalled reading a passage in a First World War memoir he'd picked up in college, Storm of Steel, or something to that effect, about how a man who would drive you mad in the streets back home became a brother to you in the trenches. Perhaps this was something similar. Even as a relative outsider to the group, who had never been initiated into their call of the mountain, the hunters and arcane abominations which had scuttled and stalked the shadows beneath the storm and the crimson expanses of the Deadlands were so alien, so hateful, that Aram and his band of New World barbarians seemed tender and familial by comparison. The family he'd lost when he'd rejected the mysticism and strange spirituality of his father and left home at the cusp of adulthood had been regained in a way he'd never have expected, or even desired, in the confines of the world which had existed before the storms. Much as he still felt like an office drone from Chicago masquerading with Viking raiders, he wasn't about to allow the last of their number to be stabbed in the back while they faced down their final awful obstacle. But Stan, to his credit, made steady progress down the line without any sign of ulterior motive, gritting his teeth against the strain wrought by his bulk and his age. Sinking out of clear view into the misty blackness which reigned a short distance below, he left Luther alone for a moment on the brink, exhausted, afraid, and struggling to gather courage for the trip down. It was then, isolated and in the depths of self-doubt, that he heard it, felt it grate along the surface of his mind like a briar upon tender skin. The vibration of it shook him, though he knew it was no more than a sensation dropped with cautious care into his thoughts. It was whispering. It came with the sensation of thought. It was not so much heard as understood, but there was no doubt in Luther's mind it had come from beyond his consciousness. Though it had no sound, he would have described it as low, powerful, threatening, but paradoxically soothing. It was the tone of one who has never known fear, and wishes to impart that bravery to the listener. At first, the whispers told him he was not strong enough to descend the line. The unseen speaker who spoke without speaking sold this as concern, told him the forest would be a safer place for him to be. Grappling with how to interpret what he was experiencing, Luther looked towards the otherworldly woodland at the clearing's edge. The churning masses of black-furred beasts which spilled from the shadows beneath the boughs drove him over the lip and into the mouth, trying his best to tune out the invasive thoughts. As he began his long climb down, hand below hand, counting every sliding motion he made along the line, the whispers changed tact. They told him Aram was all but dead and that Stan couldn't be trusted. Could he really even be certain about Soraya? What would Luther do when Aram was gone, and the stranger was alone with the two of them? 
Did he think he could kill him if it came to that? He focused on the rope alone. The burning in his shoulders and arms steadily increased as he moved farther down, and the clinching of his legs around the rope for momentary rests was only ever fleeting. He couldn't afford to rest. The shrieking brays of hunting packs above told him all he needed to know about what approached the mouth from above. Shrill and powerful as the whispers were, the bleeding horde which closed in behind them was a far more immediate threat, and it was that which drove him on as he summoned the will to keep moving. So focused was he on the physicality of the descent that he didn't truly observe his surroundings until well after he'd passed through the largest rows of teeth and the fleshy walls of the mouth sprawled away to either side, leaving him dangling in the open air. The smell had been awful before, but here it grew all but unbearable. While it had the chemical tang of the dreamer's blood in it, the stench was doubtless that of rot. Great slick swathes of a thick and clotted mucus coated the incarnadine meat of the canyon-turned maw's walls. As more rows of smaller, vestigial teeth came into view, Luther saw that the broken forms of corpses were often lodged in the tightest groupings of the yellowed, gently swaying fangs. Some were men, and others were animals. Many fit neither category. Perhaps they were offerings, thrown by rapturous worshippers into the mouth as food for the hungry god as it stirred from its ancient sleep. Perhaps they were pulled into the mouth by some ensnarement wrought by the dreamer itself, convinced by hopelessness and the damnable whispers to fling themselves into the dark below. Whatever the case, they had been there long enough for the gelatinous mucus, likely mildly acidic, like a sort of saliva, to collect on their bodies and begin the process of breaking them down. The flesh of the dead sloughed off moist bone and collected in liquescent drifts along the roots of the teeth, building up there until the mass grew heavy enough to send it tumbling into the shadows of the unseen throat somewhere below. The falling, pre-digested corpses, combined with the dripping mucus and the hot mist of the dreamer's inconsistent breaths, made the place feel like a putrescent jungle in the rainy season and the miasma of rot which surrounded Luther was so strong it left him lightheaded. As his vision wavered, he had a moment to wonder how the already injured Aram was faring in the murk below him on the juddering, unsteady line before the barbed whispers about treachery and danger forced him to focus on the physical once more. The line bucked and shuddered beneath the weight of the four men using it. The rifle over his shoulder jostled awkwardly each time he moved. What should have been a simple, if physically demanding, descent was made deadly by the lack of tethers and the freefall feeling each climber had dangling in the open. Luther didn't even have time to worry that the line might break or be cut by the closing hunters above, or that the piton overhead might be improperly secured. He was too busy catching his weight each time the line shifted as he slid slowly and steadily down it, catching his breath as his sleep-deprived, scattered mind raced to subjugate his screaming muscles and force them to continue struggling ever downward. Minutes passed like that, feeling like hours as the light grew fainter and the teeth died away. The smell never abated, but the walls of the mouth drew in close again, now far softer and dotted with waxy yellow pools that looked like weeping abscesses. Lights flicked on somewhere below, and a call came up to him after a long and hushed moment to tell the men still on the line they didn't have far to go. It was Soraya rather than Aram who spoke, Luther had time to realize through the blinding strain. The whispers died with the words, as if chased off by the intrusion of company. Only when Luther was beginning to feel he might be literally unable to continue, that his raw hands might actually slip away as his body gave out, did his feet squelch onto an unsteady, wet floor. Luther caught his balance and snatched up his flashlight. The floor of the mouth was studded with pools and piles of pus and rotten runoff from above, and the mucus along the floor made it treacherous to take steps across it. 
the cavernous space they now stood in was flanked by a sloped, ridged tunnel of rippling, living tissue which led off at an angle from the bottom of the yawning mouth, letting the pooled filth drain into it down deep grooves set into its edges. It was perhaps thirty feet in diameter, and Stan was already at the cusp of it, scouting the way further down. Aram lay against the remnants of a broken tooth not far off, pale far beyond his usual hue, with Soraya kneeling over him and placing his gun back into his functional hand. Yowls and the clatter of hooves sounded far away, echoing down into the mouth from the lip. Luther did his best to ignore these, pressing slowly and steadily across the slippery basin to look over Aram with Soraya. Hazy as he seemed, his older brother recognized him there, and though his breathing was shallow and his voice was anything but strong, Luther heard no tremor in it when he managed to speak. I am staying here while you all press on, Aram said. If I can stay awake long enough, maybe I can slow a few of the things from above down, assuming they climb in after us. How will we get where we need to go without you steering? Luther demanded. You've been the one calling the shots till now. We wouldn't have made it this far without you. I'd be guessing as much as any of you at this point, Aram answered with a dismissive shake of his tired head. Your gambles are as good as mine now. No initiate has ever been inside the enemy. Prior generations tried, of course, but it was always buried too deep in the mountains, with too many of its children minding the tunnels. Now... A loud smack sounded as a heavy body thundered through the tepid air to splatter amidst the rock pools off to the side, cutting Aram off. It was horned, hooved, the warped spawn of the dreamer. The line down which they'd climbed snapped, and in several moments it too crashed to the fleshy floor alongside seven or eight twisted hunters, some of whom writhed and twitched in the morass of god saliva, not quite dead. Stan sloshed over to begin shooting the things up close, dispatching them with the cold efficiency of a butcher as the chorus of wrathful baying surged overhead. They'll find the way down, Aram called, doing his best to fight the frailty of his voice. Take the stake to the heart. Drive it in with the hammer I kept in the pack. Don't stop until you're certain the thing's dead, and don't assume anything about the layout of the body. This is just one of many mouths and it likely leads to one of many stomachs. There's no telling where exactly the heart will be. Find the veins if you can. Follow the current. Dig through the meat with your knives if you must. Don't rest until the job is done. Aram slumped back, his energy already ebbing. Luther doubted as he watched the man that he'd survived to see any of the horde at the mouth's precipice reach the bottom alive and ready to hunt. As Soraya said his solemn goodbyes and moved off to join Stan, Luther leaned in close. I've heard the whispers, Aram, he said. Like the others. Like you said I wouldn't. The whole way down it talked to me. It's something we've all had to put up with, Aram muttered. You're stronger than I took you to be, Luther. Just grit your teeth and move fast. It can only tell you so much before the three of you get to the heart. Aram grunted, hoisting the rifle he awkwardly grasped so the butt sat in the crook of his arm at an angle. It wouldn't be accurate, but assuming he lasted long enough to see the many glinting eyes of their pursuers, he might put a few rounds into them before the end. It's a shame I couldn't make it, Aram said, almost scolding himself. I would have liked to kill a god. Luther lingered scrabbling to think of something to say which wouldn't seem cheap and artificial in the plastic glow of the meager flashlight at the cusp of the impossible. He found nothing. Go, Aram ordered. Luther obeyed.
9. Belly of the Beast. The remnants of the haggard expedition navigated what had to be an esophagus with ice picks and knives. So slick and steep was the flesh of the angled tunnel that walking down it upright was impossible. Hence, hugging the sides, they would hook the wall with their small, sharp picks, then hang their weight from the handle as they leaned forward and planted a knife further down. The pick would then be slid free, and the process would begin again with the weight being bolstered by the knife as they swung. These tears in the soft tissue bled black when the blades left them, and sealed themselves shut like folding flower petals as the god hunters progressed ever downward. When the tunnel itself buckled and contracted as the tissue drove great streams of half-liquefied runoff from the mouth down the furrows on the floor, they halted only progressing when the tremors ceased and their already shaky footing was more certain in the gloom. This made for slow going, but there was no telling what waited at the bottom of the sloped tunnel, and descending it like children on a grotesque slide seemed suicidal. Stan had a headlight to use, as did Soraya, but there was no spare for Luther, leaving him to grip a flashlight in his mouth as he went. All the while, he kept keen for the ring of gunfire down the passage after them, but it never came. Agonizing as the pace was, ragged as his upper body felt after the descent through the mouth, he forced himself to keep going, reminding himself that there were pursuers at their backs, even if they couldn't see or hear them. The whispers inched back into the corners of his consciousness now and then, biting deep when they chose to make themselves known. They told him he was in danger, that he wasn't cut out for the journey he'd undertaken. They told Luther he'd already transgressed too heavily to be let go for free. There had to be a price, and that price was his two remaining companions. If he could kill them, then perhaps the dreamer would tell its children to stand down. Perhaps it would allow him to clamber back up out of its maw unopposed. Luther buried these poisoned notions beneath his material concerns about the stinging air and the burning sensation which teased his weary eyes. The stench which had filled the mouth waxed and waned here, occasionally being overridden by a paint-thinner reek which seemed to make his nostrils itch. He heard Stan speculate they were poisoning themselves by so totally drinking in the toxic air that a return journey would be impossible and heard Soraya tell him there would be no return journey, something they all knew on some level. Luther squinted against the faint fumes, grit his teeth against the whispers, and followed as closely as he could. The esophagus, or throat, or whatever it was, was strange in that it often curved and banked off to one side or the other, making the declining floor even more difficult to predict since one could only see so far along the route before a great misshapen wall of soft, jiggling meat cut off one's vision. In time, the tunnel began to widen, and the slope became much more pronounced. They were beginning to emerge into a dark, vast chamber, and though it took a moment for their eyes to adjust to the clouds of burning gas and the dim openness of the space after the confines of the throat, they soon noticed distant lights bobbing in the toxic mist. Luther could only guess that what he was seeing was a stomach. They stood upon the treacherous shore of a venomous lake of gurgling, yellow-brown liquid, which steamed in the meager beams of their flashlights. Organic shoots or chimneys of a cartilaginous sort of flesh belched clouds of acrid smoke and spouted geysers of sizzling liquid, the air was hot and heavy, and the place vibrated every few seconds with rippling tremors that rattled the waxy tissue that made up the walls. The dim, flickering lights seemed to be floating like buoys in the acid lake, though Luther internally revised the word floating to swimming after witnessing one flit across his field of view using a thick tail like a tadpole's. Vast mounds of slop, likely once the remains of creatures from the surface, 
had formed gelatinous islands which jutted like towers from the mist. Amidst it all buzzed airborne hordes of what sounded like gnats, tiny and near invisible, which had a habit of diving into the eyes of the struggling observers. How are we going to get across that? It took Luther a moment to realize it was Stan who spoke. His lightheadedness, both from lack of sleep and the assault of the fumes upon his hazy mind, left him slow to register what was happening around him. The dreamer's hushed speech competing with the question made it difficult to assign the words to a single person, especially when his watering eyes made it difficult to see Stan speak. Stan seemed to be feeling much the same, his words coming slow and sluggish through the murky air. Only Soraya seemed to be forcing himself by some uncanny will to keep himself keen. We won't, Soraya answered. We go around. Follow me. Soraya, taking Aram's accustomed place at the front, tread on cautious feet over the damp and fluid ground to the edge of the flesh island upon which they stood. The walls of the cavernous digestive organ banked up out of view above them in the fumes, but at the lake's edge, the arc of those walls left a small lip of space between the shoreline and the upward slope of the stomach lining. It was a thin, three-foot-wide, treacherously steep beach of sorts. One wrong move, and they would slide into the slurry with the rest of the dreamer's fodder. Again they took to using their knives and picks to bolster themselves as they slipped and slid along the rim of the pool. The blinking lights of the things which swam the acid and the buzzing drone of the parasitic insects which taunted their ears melded with the grumbling bass of the organ's slow contractions to lull each of them into a stupor. They moved ever forward around the lake, but they did not register the passage of time or the danger which lay so close to them. This was, perhaps, a blessing, for in the confusion of the stomach the group had no presence of mind to dwell upon the horrible nature of the environment, or the acrid burn in their lungs. They had no conscious care for the tumbles that brought their feet so close to that slow-burning fluid in the seemingly endless pool. They focused only on the way forward. Luther could only imagine the others were hearing the dreamer's voice as steadily as he was, but none among their number risked showing it. The searing eyes, the rasping breaths, the pounding heart, it could all end right there. If only he listened to the whispers. If only he did as he was asked. I think it's afraid. Soraya spoke the words from up front loud enough for the others to hear, though again it took both Stan and Luther a few seconds to even register them. Neither asked Soraya to elaborate, to delineate what he meant. They all knew, and the words rang true. The whispers had become pleading. Though Luther had not heard them until reaching the mouth, the others had seemed to believe the whispers were things of barbarous rapture, promises of strength and power and bloodshed. Until that moment, Luther had merely thought the enemy was taking a different tact with him, that he was, as Aram had hinted, not vulnerable to the dreamer's crimson promises. As Soraya spoke that speculation aloud, he realized that he wasn't alone. Luther wasn't the only one being bargained with, rather than proselytized to. The whispers died out soon after that. It made Luther uneasy, for he couldn't help but assume the dreamer had taken notice of their newfound resolve. The nervous anticipation of that silence forced his mind to clear a little in the haze, to shove aside the pain and the weariness and the demoniac vileness which engulfed him, and wait for whatever came next. The others shared the cautious vigilance, scanning the disgusting expanse about them. Surely it was plotting something. Whether it was or not, there was something in the pool which had plans for them and their vigilance was rewarded. Soraya, the furthest forward in line, was the first to see and alert the others, dark masses of half-digested flotsam shifting like waste in a drain. Great gobs of the liquefying flesh and refuse were slithering like living things from the banks of the nearest islands in the lake, navigating the bile towards the shore. They would submerge soon before the shallows, 
depriving the three survivors on the banks of the comfort of knowing where they were. The three picked up their pace, but it was not enough to deter the stalkers in the pool. When next the things emerged from the steaming liquid, they had amassed themselves into the rough outlines of misshapen, featureless, swollen human beings. The snot consistency of them meant they held no permanent form, that they shifted and jiggled and shuddered as they moved. Extra appendages would burst from their shiny mass only to be sucked back in like withdrawn tongues. Chunks of bone or sinew not fully rendered down into the acid studded their half-solid bodies like armored exoskeletons and shot forth in barbs from their limbs as retractable claws. All this movement and metamorphosis was conducted in dead silence as the things rose from the shallows of the acid lake and stumbled on shaky legs towards them. There were no cries of alert or roars of savage hunger. There was only the drip of acid from the damp and half-formed flesh of the things as they closed in with the survivors against the wall. No one thought to shoot the things. They were so liquescent and formless that it seemed mad to believe physical force could hurt them. All the three could do was scramble and hope they could find an exit before the things reached them. For all their horrible, silent menace, the stalkers in the pool were wading through the shadows towards them from about twenty yards off, and they were moving slow. Luther clumsily sheathed his knife and continued on with only his pick to bolster him, meaning he moved in unsteady lunges which were ended with a swing into the fleshy stomach wall, and a breathless moment of balancing on the edge of a stumble before the next lunge could be undertaken. The others fled in much the same way, panting and coughing as their lungs struggled to power their more rapid motion in the miasma of chemical rot which surrounded them. Every leap was a gamble that they'd catch themselves before sliding down the slope into the shallows just a few feet to the side, a gamble made all the more tense by the fact that their pursuers didn't ever seem thrilled or ravenous at the sight of struggling prey. They merely shambled on in silent, steady, unrelenting pursuit. As they rounded a small inlet in the organic shoreline, Luther traced the outline of a large outcrop of swollen tissue ahead. It bordered a dark opening in the stomach wall, an inlet just like the one through which they'd entered. A similar shallow creek of fetid runoff slid down into the lake from its mouth. This one was much smaller, and wove off from the digestive organ at a level with the ground there. As they drew nearer, Luther began to allow himself to believe that they were about to escape, that they could slip from the stomach unscathed and try to plot another route of attack. He was mistaken. Just a few scant yards from the edge of the bank upon which the tunnel opened, Stan overshot his mark in the jump. His lurch saved his footing, but he bumped Soraya from behind in the process. Only the towering man's weight saved him from being knocked fully from his feet. Still, he slid on the slickened bank and splayed towards the lake. Though he scrambled free of the hissing liquid in a matter of seconds, his left boot was soaked, and as the three of them stumbled up onto the wider bank before the tunnel mouth, Soraya writhed to slip his steaming shoe free from his foot. With Stan's frenzied aid, they managed to get the thing off in a matter of moments, but the skin beneath was already swollen and red with the onset of a bad burn, and the lurkers behind them were beginning to heave themselves up from the lake onto the fleshy, not-so-dry ground. They had to run, no time to gather their wits. They barreled into the tighter mirror of the throat they'd traversed before, momentarily relieved the slope was almost non-existent, and their flight wasn't a thing of half-stumbles and tottering balance. Their pursuers were apparently slower upon the meaty land than in the searing sea of acid, for after several frenzied minutes of running up the passage, they could no longer see their shadows in the awful yellow light of the gleaming stomach chamber they'd abandoned. The haze of the burning mists lifted, and though the stench remained, clarity crept back into the edges of Luther's vision, and he found he could breathe without pain once more. It was only as they drew the lights again and went about orientating themselves 
that Luther realized Soraya had made the whole of the blasted escape on one bare foot. The sole of the big man's left foot was blistered and peeling beneath the stark light of the electric beams. Worse still, it was streaked with a black, dusty grime, a sort of mold or fungus which took root in the textured flesh of the slumbering god's many throats. He shook off Stan and Luther's concern, said he couldn't really feel his foot anyhow, so it wasn't important, but they all sensed it was anything but fine. There's no use worrying about it now, he said. We have one goal, anything else is a distraction. Can you walk on that? Soraya shook off Stan's question. Like I said, I can't feel it. So long as that lasts and the leg is intact, I can keep going. Luther and Stan let it rest at that. Soraya had been galvanized by Aram's loss in the mouth, and some small measure of the other man's fire had been breathed into the younger initiate. It was easy to see as much as he took the lead once more, and led them on long, confident strides up the path and away from the lake. Though Stan insisted he'd take the load of the heavy, condensed pack Soraya had carried thus far, Soraya asked for no more favors, and seemingly needed none. They spoke among themselves, all seeming to agree another passage through the stomach might mean death, but all equally convinced the throat along which they walked might well lead them right back to the mouth, even if it took them to a different maw somewhere else in the warped mountains. That was only going to shift them further from the heart. Though they looked for openings or breaks in the alien esophagus they traveled, there were no obvious gaps. It was during a surreal rest to eat a small measure of their light rations and catch their ragged breath that Luther began to notice that the two black streaks along either side of the fleshy walls bulged almost imperceptibly every few seconds. This motion was independent of the lazy rippling of the rest of the tissue, and the color in the dark line seemed to deepen with each hint of movement. They were large, about five feet in width, but their hue was tinted by the meat which enclosed them, making them seem far smaller than they were at a glance. The now familiar tone of the murmuring dreamer brushed against his skull the moment he laid eyes upon those streaks. Something about riches and position in the new order which was being built above. Luther didn't listen. That intrusion was all he needed to hear to believe he might be on to something. Luther walked to the wall and put the knife he'd been using to navigate the flesh passages to the soft, pulsing skin along the dark streak. With some effort, he plunged the tip in, slow and cautious, stepping aside as he made the motions. Black blood spouted from the raw gap as he slid through the blade. Stan reeled, stumbling back and away from the tunnel wall, asking, What is that? A map to the heart, maybe, Zoraya said, understanding immediately and drawing up next to Luther to better inspect the steady stream of the dreamer's blood now draining down the esophagus channel behind them. It's a vein. I've been too focused on moving to pay attention to whether we were moving the right way. It might be better than a map, Luther said. It might be a road. He turned out to be right. After fifteen or twenty minutes spent monitoring the flow of blood, the stream seemed to die down. Though it never truly abated, the black dyed vein into which Luther had sliced seemed to have lost a great deal of the lifeblood it transported. What was left was a claustrophobic, winding tunnel adjacent to the esophagus, low ceiling, and filled with a slow-moving tide of ebon blood which would reach roughly to a man's knee. The strange walls seemed almost hard, not bone, but perhaps a sort of sturdy cartilage. Luther was the first to climb up into the newly opened tunnel, finding his boots and pants soaked with the viscous, lukewarm liquid as he sloshed up the way to ensure the thing was traversable. Only when he'd given the all-clear did he help Soraya up into the vein, both of them grimacing to think the peeling skin of his acid-eaten foot would be immersed in the stuff. Stan brought up the rear, gun in hand, still having caught no sight of the things from the stomach in pursuit. 
with a little jostling to get the big pack stand and taken up, situated low enough on his back that it didn't graze the low ceiling as he moved along in a slouch. They began to discuss which direction they should move. The safest bet seemed to be downward, against the lazy current of the distant pulses stirring the fluid at their feet. For Luther reasoned the vein in which they stood must be one taking blood up to the mouth, or some other appendage of the wakening god. Soraya pointed out, rightly enough, that they had no way of knowing how close the dreamer's biology mirrored that of life with which they were familiar. But in the end it was decided that they'd move down toward the depths against the flow. Luther, being judged most nimble, would lead through the confined darkness. The others would follow. Your brother was right about you, Soraya half-joked as they got moving, his tired voice echoing down the path before them. The same spark of cunning is in you, even if it took a long time to dig it up. Luther realized as he forged on in silence beneath the assault of the dreamer's constant hissing promises that Soraya was right, and that revelation surprised him far more than it could ever have surprised the big initiate trotting along unsteadily in his wake. Ten. The Final Sleep If traversing the stomach had been a test in fortitude, traversing the vein was an exercise in sanity. Though the exact height of the ceiling varied, it never grew much taller than five feet, forcing them all to move along with backs bent and legs straining. Soraya, tall as he was and injured as he must have felt, seemed particularly strained, though he never once broke down and mentioned it to his companions. The close walls made it near impossible for Stan or Soraya to see around Luther from the rear, and thus they would constantly ask him for reports of what awaited them ahead. Other than slight dips in the incline or little mineral clots that jutted up from the bed of the vein, there was never much to report. The tightness of the passage Alongside its frequent bends and plunges, meant Luther's visibility was only slightly better than their own. No matter how many times it happened in the pallid, black-streaked walls of the damp passage, the light of his beam playing off the reflective surfaces of the low blood underfoot always made Luther jolt. He kept expecting a mirror of the things from the digestive lake, some shambling horror of wavering gore, perhaps to surge up from the low slush they wandered to take them. Though nothing had ever revealed itself, that didn't mean he could allow himself to let down his guard. The dips in the floor were often 45-degree slopes upon which clean descent was impossible. This meant they occasionally had to roll and slide down these spans of the vein network like children wandering some malefic water park. No matter how deeply one gouged the walls with a knife to slow the descent, it was never enough, and the tumbling prospective godslayers were constantly faced with the sensation of falling into endless nothingness as they prayed the passage would come to a reasonable level and allow them to stand once more. Even if only one man had to make these gambles for the others to learn from his shouted go-ahead from below that the drop was safe, it didn't ever lighten the mental load of the man chosen to risk the next slide for the good of the group. They frequently found themselves at intersections in the circulatory tunnel network as one vein came into contact with another, forcing them to choose between two or four or seven branching routes. At first, whichever looked to be going lower was the favored choice, but as time wore on, another deciding factor emerged. Though the splashing of their feet in the constant mire of dreamers' blood made it difficult to hear when moving, a noise emerged when the group stood still and silent. 
faint as whispers echoing down a hallway, they could just make out the distant thrum of what they took to be a heartbeat in the lightless depths. A steady rhythm, so slow as to be easily missed. The blood itself trembled in time with its sonorous call, shivering against their feet in the gloom. Once they had noticed this noise, they tended to decide on the tunnel down which the echoed beating seemed loudest. The dreamer's pleading always grew louder and more fervent then, Luther noticed. Perhaps it knew why they had come to a stop and grown quiet at such crossroads, and was attempting to drown out what they took to be the thrum of its ancient onyx heart. Whatever the case, its internal speech was nauseating and made Luther's head throb as if stricken with migraines each time the tone grew louder. Worse than all these hardships by far were the spans of vein which were still thick with blood. These needed to be drained to be safely passed by, and the process of cutting exit wounds for the blood to seep slowly out of was a blind process of groping and gashing around in the pooled ichor, searching for purchase with the knives. This task always fell to Luther, for he was the smallest and most maneuverable. The stuff somehow felt thicker and warmer when he was beneath its surface, thrashing to carve a drain in the floor of the vein, and more than once he felt tiny, wriggling organisms brush up against him in the black tangle of the surging liquid. Fortunately, as they were moving downward against the current, the languid pulses of the heart didn't pull him further into the depths to be drowned. It was there, in the blind chaos of those dives into the sludge, that the whispers were loudest. When he felt most alone, most vulnerable, the dreamer, even through the throes of its dying slumber, seemed to sense this as a shark senses blood upon the current. That is when it came with its promises of safety and forgiveness, interspersed with threats of what awaited Luther should he ignore these generous offers. Exhaustion made him pliable, he suspected, for the longer they dragged themselves through those cramped halls and the sloshing arteries of the dreamer, the less disgusted he was by the scratching of the dreamer upon the walls of his mind. As a traveler waylaid during the final steps of a long trek, he was silently and secretly desperate for it all to end, to kill or be killed, so that he might know some semblance of rest. Perhaps the long exposure to the blood itself played a role, feeding his nascent susceptibility. And yet, he could not believe the dreamer was anything but desperate, and the moment he rejoined his companions, he always found the memories of the pleading, bartering god slightly pathetic. After the drain was cut, they always needed to wait for the blood to slip from the downward tunnel below them. Once or twice during their long hours on the move, they cut wet paths with picks and knives through the soft tissue beside the veins to circumnavigate particularly deep pools which Luther didn't dare to swim. But for the most part, the flooded spans of vein would lower on their own before a half hour had slipped away from them. It was during one of these breathless rests, while the group stared daggers at the slowly draining pool before them, that Luther realized just how bad Soraya's foot had gotten. The thing was bare, of course, and just as coated with the blood as all their feet must be within their sodden shoes. But his skin seemed to rupture and tremble with the growth of great hairy blisters, and his leg was pale as newly fallen snow where it met the ankle. Bulging black tendrils laced their way up his limb beneath the skin, and the more Luther watched them, the more he began to believe they pulsed in time with the awful soup of black lifeblood beneath them. I'm impressed you're still walking on that, Luther managed, hiding the worry the thrumming veins dredged up from the depths to haunt him. Like I said, I can't feel it anymore, Soraya said, waving the words away. It's pure, aimless stubbornness more than any grit or strength. I don't have the energy for strength. His speech was the speech of a battered man on the verge of collapse. It was the first time either Luther or Stan had heard Soraya speak more than one or two words in a row for a long while, and the big man could hardly catch his breath after forming them. Still, slow as it was, he did catch his breath and give voice to another protest. I could barely bring myself to end Sias and sacrifice way back at the station before the climb. 
The enemy's been jeering about it in my head ever since we made it back into the Deadlands. Says it was all for nothing. Chants so loud I can't hear myself think. It's either that or the bargaining. Frankly, the bargaining is the only thing keeping me up at the moment. The only reminder it's vulnerable. Stan interjected to ask whether Sias had been one of their brotherhood on the trip east, and when Soraya confirmed he had been, Stan shook his head. It's a far different thing to kill someone you fought with than to kill an enemy, Stan told him. Feeling that difference isn't weakness, it's what makes you more than a rabid animal. From what I've heard, the dreamer doesn't really understand the difference. Soraya managed a small nod of grateful agreement at that, but stayed silent. They all sat like that a moment, counting the inches as the flooded span of vein before them slowly lost its depth, before Luther asked Stan the question he'd been quietly yearning to ask since meeting him upon the cusp of the mouth. And the dreamer's voice hasn't bothered you at all? It's loud, Stan answered, insistent, but bothered, tempted, no, not at all. Stan went on to tell how he'd killed before, how he'd seen war and come home changed by it. Luther tried to work out which conflict the older man might have seen, for he looked a bit too young to have fought Vietnam and too old to have fought in the Gulf, but he supposed it didn't matter. The man's eyes grazing the reflective sheen of the pool before them with an electric focus which hadn't been there before told him the man spoke the truth. He didn't wish to interrupt him and let him speak into the yawning dark. Men who've never seen or heard or smelled it write that there's no glory in war, but there is, even if it's just in what your buddies are doing to keep each other safe when things get hard. That tried-and-true professor's line about glory is actually true where the dreamer's concerned, though. There's none to be found there. Thrills, maybe, but no glory. You give up your ability to have brothers and friends and comrades at the door. There's no family to defend or win spoils for. Just the dreamer down here beneath the rock, waiting to be fed. The way I see it, I'd have to be a fool to accept any hand out it through my way, no matter how loud it screams. Luther almost cut in, almost apologized to Stan for questioning him after so frank an answer. But Stan pressed on, suddenly dropping his quiet demeanor and expounding there in the labyrinth as all of them stared down death. It doesn't compare to what living in an earlier age would have been, though, Stan said. Eidolon and the others talked about the aimlessness of the modern age, and I couldn't agree more, though I'd never had the words to speak the feeling. Six generations of my family lived in these hills before I came along, and the early comers fought every tribal war and feud and land dispute life served up to them. They survived every winter and killed every predator. Their fights weren't anything like mine, because all the world was the enemy, potentially at least. There wasn't a safe, secure base to slink back to except the homestead and the family. Every day was war, and they never flinched. That's strong, Stan finished, a grim grin sweeping his face as he did. They'd have been stout enough to kill it. I don't know if the same can be said to apply to me. Even after days in the Deadlands, what's that even weigh when you set it next to a lifetime's uncertainty? I don't even know why I came along, Luther said, his half-chuckle sounding almost exasperated. If you're too soft to kill it, I should have been too soft to even see it. Maybe it only took the Deadlands to drag it out of the both of you, Soraya chimed in, his heavy lids drooping as he fought sleep from his damp perch beside them. Maybe strength was buried in there all along, waiting to be set loose. What do I know, though? I'm still an initiate. Stan rallied them to their feet soon after, the moment the blood had sunk low enough for them to pass with only their waists beneath the surface. They shimmied along uncomfortably, often holding aloft the drooping ceiling of the newly drained tunnel to pass without having to submerge in the vile murk. The chemical stink feeling their nostrils and the dreamers' malicious echoes filling their skulls, they steeled themselves for another long stint of stumbling in the depths. But they didn't move for long. After a brief descent down a slight incline, they came into a short span of vein which broadened and seemed to give way up ahead. 
A black chamber loomed beyond the tunnel, and their lights threw wild beams off the slick surfaces of the stained organic walls within. It was high ceilinged, so much so they could not see its peak from within their hiding place in the adjoining tunnel, and its walls swept wide for twenty or thirty yards, giving the place the dimensions of a small arena in the labyrinth. Many other arteries opened up on this larger chamber across the way, and the whole place reverberated with the pumping bass of the heartbeat shaking the beast which enveloped them. I don't like anything about that, Stan muttered, so low the others hardly heard him over the noise. The others all agreed, their nervous apprehension not needing to be uttered aloud. They all froze on the brink, internally debating what to do, wishing to remain silent until one or the other settled on a plan of action for the crossing. All the while, their eyes scanned the rippling surface of the chamber in front of them, each second investing the deep dark of the pooled blood there with yet more danger. It was due to that silence that Luther heard the swishing in the liquid behind them in the tunnel. Almost simultaneously, he felt something unseen flit past his ankle in the wet bleak of the blood beneath him, just like the sensations he'd so often felt when cutting drains farther up the labyrinth, but larger. He spun, as did Soraya and Stan, all of them cursing the waist-deep swamp and the blindness it burdened them with as they did so. What they saw in the beams they cast that way were tiny, mostly bottle-cap-sized crustaceans or arthropods scuttling from the bloodline up the walls of the vein. Some were larger, around the size of a bald fist. There were thousands already, dripping ichor into the pool they'd left. They were seemingly eyeless and flat as pill bugs on the move and yet flexed two needles or stingers in place of forward claws that glistened with an obscene clarity to Luther's wide eyes. Just as he realized their peril, he felt something scuttle up his pant leg beneath the surface, climbing its way up the soaked, bare flesh of his calf on sharp, cool legs. No words or warnings were needed in the moment. Their guns couldn't do much against so many and though Stan fired several deafening blasts at the ceiling as they wheeled and made for the large chamber, it made little impact on the horde. Worse still, there was no telling how thick the swarm was upon the floor of the veins. There was no time to cut an escape hatch out of the cartilage wall and into the open flesh of the dreamer beyond, nor was there time to double back up the vein and hope the hive of silent skitterers did not follow. All they could do was press forward, and hope against hope they survived the run. Running was a generous word to use for it, though. The thick, viscous nature of the waist-deep gore made retreat even more difficult than it would have been in water, and in places, the floor of the great chamber through which they ran fell away and forced them to struggle and swim in the blackness. Stan, laden as he was with the pack, lost his shotgun in the sightless depths during one of their plunges into the pools, and could not afford the luxury of diving back in to retrieve it. Abscesses and swollen pores in the fleshy ceiling were vomiting the things from above now, and not one of them had made it this far without having tiny chunks torn from their legs by unseen mouths below the bloodline. They were needled and prodded, and with each thrashing motion towards the exits across the way, Luther felt more and more lightheaded. It was as the pools shallowed out again and they neared the cluster of opposing tunnels into the deeper circulatory network that Soraya called to Stan and tossed him his own rifle as a replacement for the lost weapon. The whispers were too loud, he said, and he didn't think he could last much longer. He waved the two of them on, wordlessly indicating he'd stay behind when he wheeled and plunged back into the liquid behind them. The big man's neck and face were swollen, and several of the mites tumbled from his scalp as he went. Luther started to protest, to double back and attempt to pull the man out, but Stan dragged him on. He'll slow him down the only way he can, Stan called over the roar of the heart and the thrashing of Soraya in the water. Don't waste the time he buys us. They stumbled back into the tunnel network, brushing mites from them in a clumsy tornado of wheeling limbs and scraping hands. 
Once the blood was only ankle deep, they fished the remainders out from under their clothes, never fully coming to a halt as they struggled to put more distance between themselves and the hive. Every once in a while, a fissure in the sturdy meat of the wall would vomit forth another line of mites, and they would sprint through the muck into the depths without heed for the effort and time they spent. Luther's stomach should be aflame, and his mind should be slumped beneath the weight of so many days without proper sleep, but he had lost track of time in the meat prison which encircled him. Notions like hunger and exhaustion were only filters through which the path ahead was seen. He couldn't tell if his lightheadedness was because of malnutrition, sleeplessness, or the venom of the mite's stingers, but it was inconsequential. Praying bellows stalked the halls with them, and Luther became convinced over time there were hunters in the tunnels as well, finally arrived to mop up the non-believers who had slipped into this hallowed maze. As they sloshed deeper and deeper into the labyrinth, and wheeled down forks in the veins on instinct alone to avoid the ravenous sounds, all he could focus on was the ever-louder thump of what had to be the heart, and the shrieking of the god through whom they ran. They were in the height of a run down a sloping passage when something moved far off down the tunnel before them, breaking the flow of their flashlight beams. It was horned, jagged, writhing, many-limbed and shrieking a thousand echoing wails up the vein toward them. In the seconds they watched it before the shock died, it seemed almost like the thing Luther had spotted in the battered school way back on the outskirts of St. Louis, what seemed like a lifetime ago. Stan was better able to tolerate the soul-searing awfulness of the thing than he had been, for the older man dragged Luther by the arm down a steep fork in the path before them. They made it only forty or fifty yards at a stumble before the ground gave way beneath the ichor, and they slid without purchase down a long chute, which widened and deepened beneath them all the while. They fell. As Luther lost his grip on his rifle, and his flashlight was abandoned in favor of the knife he sank into the meat beneath him in vain attempts to slow his descent. He found himself truly blind and helpless, wholly at the mercy of the dreamer's voice. Luther lost track of how far or how long the fall was. He only knew in those moments that the dreamer was keening in his thoughts, shrill and forceful as it told him what he would do when he reached the end of the drop. He must find Stan in the dark and kill him, it said. He must relinquish himself, lest he lose all freedom to survive the foolish trip he'd so carelessly embarked upon. It would take great effort to find forgiveness, it said. But perhaps, with Herculean force, he could earn his keep. The words had to be spoken between the thunder of the heart, for it was so very loud now. Louder than thought. Louder than life. Luther splashed into what felt like open water. He sloshed to the surface and gasped, thrashing as he realized the pool in which he bobbed was far too deep to stand in. He had to spit great gobs of congealed god blood from his mouth and wipe streams of the stuff from his eyes as he surfaced. But it was all in vain, for all he found beyond the thin shields of his clinched eyelids was blackness. Until the thud of the heartbeat sounded and a dull, barely perceptible light hit the chamber. He swam towards it, gasping and squirming, expecting at each moment some unseen tendril or beast to grab him from below. Luther pulled himself onto a slick beach of stinking flesh. Again the pulse sounded, and again a dull light lit the titanic chamber in which he found himself, but he did not have time to truly orient himself. All he knew for certain in that second was that the room was massive even beyond the stomach above them, many miles across at least, and its core was a vast, flat island astride an ocean of trembling black blood. A call reached his ears, strained and distant. He rose upon shaking legs, trying desperately to focus on the cries for aid through the dreamer's thumping and shrieking. It took a few long and agonized minutes but at last he found the source. Stan was laying further up the beach, having apparently fallen upon the flesh rather than in the liquid. His leg was badly broken, 
and he bled badly from the compound fracture he'd taken in the fall. His breaths were shallow, and it occurred to Luther he might well have broken ribs in the impact. He didn't speculate aloud, though. He merely removed Stan's pack at his request, and made the man comfortable as he could upon the alien ground. Take the stake and the hammer from him there, Stan told him. Take him and go. Just leave me here. I can't move the way I am. Luther scrambled to obey, the motions made all the more desperate by the shrill dives of several shrieking shapes into the black sea beyond the shore. He felt more than saw as the heavy stake found his hand, and the hefty sledge his other. He rose on shaky legs, preparing to run, waiting for the pulse to bring light to the chamber once more. You're not so soft now, Stan called after him as he ran. Kill it. It knows you're coming. It's scared. God Slayer! Stan almost laughed the final words, but they were wholly serious. Luther did him the courtesy of not pausing to say goodbye, of not lingering on the brink of the island to put his thoughts in order. There was no time to think. He grabbed hold of Stan's final calls after him in the dark and acted on them. Luther's run was blind and treacherous, lit only every eight or ten seconds by the sluggish thumps of the heart. At first he thought he must be near the thing, but as he chewed tripping and panting through a mile of alien terrain towards what had to be the center of the vast chamber about him, he realized he was on it. It simply looked nothing like any heart he'd ever seen before. He fled across a great membrane or pad of pale meat which squished and sank under his boots. It was studded with a webbed network of black blood vessels that thrummed with each titan beat, and the flesh juddered beneath him like ground under bombardment with each titan pump. Mighty rings of rough, ridged nodes with the hard consistency of bone jutted up out of the membrane in equally spaced rows, and they gleamed with a dull, cold glow each time the heart loosed its flow of wicked blood. They grew taller as he went farther from the shore, and before long, Luther was running through a veritable forest of the spiny protrusions, his eyes aching each time the glow surrounded him, and his progress slowing each time the dark closed back in upon him in the osseous copse of awful growths. Pursuers were on the membrane now, but they all sounded distant. Perhaps they were. Luther chose to think it was the dreamer's volume that made them seem far away and he flew as if the bleeding of unseen hunters was right upon his heels. Every step brought the dreamer's shrill calls to a more fevered desperation, and made Luther more certain he was at the edge of finding what he, what all of them, had sought for so long. It was as the voice grew loudest, as he teetered on the cusp of sanity beneath the berating blows of that eternal voice which pounded in his skull, that he saw it. There was a clearing in the center of the forest of growths, and in its center, at the core of a web of veins so thick they colored the ground a deep onyx, was a massive, writhing, jet-black organ in the shape of a mushroom's head. It rumbled like the head of a drum, and the capillary web which surrounded it surged in time with the deafening beats it loosed upon them. Luther approached, stake out before him like a spear. It glimmered in the low light brought forth by the pumping blood. Silver, he knew, likely a solid spine of it. Heavy as iron, but far more pliable. Still, soft as the metal was, it was more than enough to pierce the gelatinous thing which pulsed at his feet. Luther planted the razor-sharp spine in the center of the strange heart's stranger core and watched as the tender skin of the organ flinched and writhed at its touch like a slug beneath a rain of salt. He grit his teeth as the speech of the thing from beyond the stars which had fancied itself a god lost track of words and waxed into screaming. For a long second, he thought maybe that was enough, that his ears would bleed and he might collapse in a heap upon the peak of the thing he'd sought to kill. But Stan's last call came back to him, joining the words of Aram as he pried his lids open and forced himself to look down upon his prey, in spite of the agony the screams birthed in him. He gripped tight at the stake with one hand, 
slid it into the softest layers of skin upon the heart's wretched core, and took up the sledge in his trembling free hand. He would give it a few strikes to plant it, then go two-handed until he could drive it no deeper. It was over. Luther hoisted his hammer up above him, blind to any pain save that which he was about to inflict. In sync with the last raucous thump of the heart beneath him, he brought it crashing down, the clang of the impact lost amidst the chorus of a million screaming mouths. Godslayer, he repeated aloud to himself, and to the thing which shrieked beneath his feet. 